Jonah. A warm good morning to one and all present here. Today, we are moving on to the seventh day of 10 days online research methodology course sponsored by ICSSR. The resource person for the session is Dr. Bala GP, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, Central University of Tamil Nadu. Sir holds master's degree in applied economics, econometrics, MPhil, PhD, and PDF degrees in economics from Pondicherry University. Sir's area of interest includes macroeconomics, monetary economics, and applied econometrics. I wholeheartedly welcome Balaji Sir to the session on parametric and non-parametric tests. Sir, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, am I audible? Sir. Yeah, am I audible to all, right? Clear? <laughs> Are you able to hear me properly, guys? Yes, yes, sir. sir. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, very good morning to all. Actually, uh, I have some problem in my uh, camera. So I don't think I can uh, switch on my cam. I will try my best to keep it on because uh, there are some technical issues. So, uh, so probably in this session, I may not switch on your cam. So just kindly bear with me. So anybody here to join? How many participants are there? I think only very less, right? Only 27 or there. Shall we proceed or we have to wait for people? Okay, okay. Organizer? Sir, you can carry on. Yeah, fine. Right. So <clears throat> today uh, I'm going to discuss uh, something on uh, parametric and non-parametric test. Okay. Um, 
so for that i have a presentation uh, generally uh, sorry for this today's session is was scheduled in two sessions one is uh, for parametric test another one is for non parametric test uh, the first session is about parametric the second session is about non parametric so what i planned is uh, i have only one slide so i include both the things because i am going to handle both parametric and non parametric so i include uh, i have only one slide okay one presentation which it covers both the parts so what is my plan is i will try to uh, cover the theoretical part in the morning for the first session maybe the practical part depends upon the availability of time and uh, the data structures i will tell you how to estimate uh, those parametric and non parametric test in spsl this is my schedule okay so we are not going by uh, parametric separately and non parametric separately i am going to discuss both parametric and non parametric together right is it clear yeah meantime uh, i don't know the practice how uh, what practice uh, the organization is following here uh, suppose if you have any questions in between just uh, put it in the chat box i will try to answer by that time itself because sometimes what happen is you might have uh, forgot the question to ask or uh, maybe uh, the question may be not relevant when you ask at the end of the session so if you have any questions just stop that moment then you can uh, Raise the question, ask the question, right? Organizer, up to what time I have to proceed? So it is till eleven thirty. Okay. Uh, so question session is in between or uh, after that? Sir, by eleven twenty onwards, we can go for questions. Okay. If it is the case, I will try to finish it by eleven fifteen. Then uh, we'll have uh, the question and session. Right. Let okay. me present my uh, PPT. <laughs> Is my screen is visible to all? Yes, sir. It's visible. Sir, can you enlarge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'm checking whether it is working properly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's working. Okay. Uh, uh, the very beginning itself, I told this is this lecture. Today's lecture is all about uh, the parametric and non-parametric test. Uh, before proceeding uh, the lecture, I just want to give you a quick revision of. Uh, uh, basic ideas about uh, the research then only you can understand what is uh, the use of these tools so what is the purpose of any research the basic question is what is the purpose of research why we have to conduct research uh, generally uh, whether it may be a the protocol science or social science or whatever branch of knowledge it is the basic idea of the research is to prove an idea the basic crux the basic motto okay the basic purpose of any research is to prove an idea prove or disprove or justifying an idea <clears throat> which may be obtained from pure observations or by simply uh, an intuition or simply based on uh, the already documented literature or by reading or uh, based on anything it may be anything the idea may be uh, derived from any factors it may be based on intuition it may be based on observations like what uh, newton's found uh, while sitting in the uh, branches of apple tree he found apple is falling from the tree uh, to the ground not the sky then he have an intuition he tried to prove something why the apple is falling down so the idea you can obtain the idea from anywhere it may be purely based on your own intuitions or anything uh, some people may have a question how can we get a research idea based on intuitions if you know the story about uh, uh, the Ramanujan, of the great mathematician, uh, you may come across how intuitions play an important idea in research things. He used to say that all his mathematical questions is solved by a goddess in his dream. Okay, so intuitions always intuitions and our curiosity plays a very important role in identifying the research questions. So, what is the purpose? We have a question. What we trying to do? We are going to justify it. We are going to prove it. We are going to sometimes. We may also push to disprove it also. Right. So the basic purpose of any research is proving or disproving or justifying the claim or an idea obtained through any intuitions 
or by the existing literature or by the existing knowledge uh, or based on uh, the empirical research or whatever it may be. So when we talk about uh, proving or disproving uh, an idea, a research question, it is associated with a term called hypothesis. Okay. Uh, I think most of you know about hypothesis because I think we are in the seventh day of uh, our lecture. So you people may very well aware of what is the hypothesis, but still I can uh, try to explain what is hypothesis all about. <coughs> What is hypothesis? There may be a lot of technical definitions are available with this for this uh, terminology, but in very simple language, in a plain English or to a layman understanding, we can call a hypothesis is nothing but a simple statement. Okay. What is hypothesis then? The hypothesis is nothing but a simple statement. To be very particular, we can call it as a hypothesis is nothing but a purely a research question or a research statement which a researcher want to verify okay so when we talk about hypothesis uh, i can't conclude myself by saying it's a very simple statement because this hypothesis uh, the modified version of this hypothesis will get you a uh, lot of developments in any area of research so uh, in addition to discussing about the hypothesis, I just want to add a few more things. See, if that is a hypothesis, what is hypothesis? As I said earlier, hypothesis is nothing but a simple statement. If we test the statement and we prove the statement, then the hypothesis becomes theory. Okay? Right? Or you will understand what I'm trying to say. If you have a statement, we are testing the test statement, we prove it without uh, any uh, discrimination, without any uh, problem with uh, in the in, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the hypothesis is proved, the statement is proved, the claim is proved invariant of geospace, time and people or ethnical or region, then it becomes theory. So in a technical term, in a technical terminology, I can call it as all theories are tested hypothesis. Okay. Whatever theory you are having, it is nothing but a tested hypothesis, a proved hypothesis, okay, which is ju justifiable, which is uh, applicable to every space without any constraint regarding uh, geospace or people or anybody, anything, okay. So, what I want to, what I'm trying to say here is all theories are tested hypothesis, right. So, on the other side, we can call it as all hypotheses are untested theories, right. That is a statement. If you test the statement, if it is proved, then it will become theory. Okay. Um, I think all of you know about uh, law of demand theory. Most of you from social science background, right? Otherwise, let us uh, go for a plain uh, theory, Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equivalent opposite reaction. There is a Newton's third law, right? This is a statement. Newton's have this statement. He he just simply created a hypothesis. He trying to prove it. He proved it. It is universally accepted. Okay that Newton's third law will apply to uh, uh, to any situation uh, uh, what is it? Uh, in any situation or any geospace without any problem. For example, the Newton's third law may apply to US also. If you are a citizen uh, uh, or uh, American is testing the law, it may be proved. If the Indian testing the law, it may be also proved. So there is no any problem in proving the thing. So any statement, any hypothesis which is tested and proved then it is called as theory. Okay. So uh, there are uh, some gimmicks on there. So when we talk about a statement, it, it becomes hypothesis. When it is uh, when it is proved, then it becomes uh, theory. But I said Newton's third law. Then what is law? What is the difference between law, theory, and uh, hypothesis? A law is nothing but universally accepted thing. Okay. It is not Newton's third theory. It is third law. Why is law? Law means it is universally accepted. Something like the sun rises in the east. It's a universal law, right? Wherever you go, which country you are in, okay? Even though you are not coming out of your house also, the sun will rise only in the east. It is universally accepted law, okay? So, uh, a law and statement and the theories are all interlinked, okay? A statement which is proved and justified, it has become theory. When it is accepted, the universally, without any discrimination, without any geospace constraints, 
then it become log okay is it clear guys any questions i'm just try to cover the very basics of uh, the research methodology then only we can uh, uh, get into the core uh, idea right so all together even though we have hypothesis we have an intuition we have an idea what we try to do is we just want to prove it or disprove it so for that purpose what we supposed to do we have to test the hypothesis we have to test the claim we have to test the test statement then once we tested the statement we can come out with some conclusions maybe we can we may prove the hypothesis we may disprove the hypothesis so uh, su suppose let us assume we prove a hypothesis but how can we accept the validation of the hypothesis how can you accept whether it is valid or not i can claim that uh, india's oil price is depends upon uh, uh, number of children born in uh, india per day even i can have an hypothesis okay i can test it but if i proved it how can you accept whether it is true or what sometimes i can come i may come out with uh, a possible results also how can you accept it you have to validate the hypothesis so the idea is we have an hypothesis we have to test it and we have to validation the hypothesis whether it is right or wrong so how can we check how can we check the hypothesis and how can we validate it it depends upon two factors we can classify this into two heads one is uh, the hypothesis can be uh, validated based on the data the other side the hypothesis may be justified based on the appropriate statistical tools how data plays an important role because uh, for this let me go to the fourth point uh see you all know data is not yes hello hello any questions you can continue because somebody is interpreting it seems okay what about data see if you talk about data data is nothing but uh, an information whatever information uh, documented in respect to a metric form then it is called as data so how can we test the hypothesis how can we justify the hypothesis from the data side see the data collection includes lot of process uh, the hypothesis may be justified based on the method of data collection the uh, in simple terms i can say how you compute your data the data may be computed based on uh, primary survey method or secondary method and uh, the frequency in which you are using the data the period of data collection all things matter for the hypothesis suppose you are saying that uh, 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 can i conclude suppose you just you are saying that a pandemic plays an important role okay a pandemic has an important role in the uh, output of a nation or production of a nation if you collect the data before uh, 2020 you may not prove the hypothesis because you never come across any pandemic right but if you collect the data after 2020 then there may be difference i'm not very sure whether it may be affected your output or not but you can test it so uh, the factors associated with how you collect the data how you compute the data the frequency of the data and uh, the reliability of the data whether uh, it's a first hand data or second hand data all matters in proving hypothesis because what you are going to do is you are going to test a statement purely based on the informations what you are having in your hand purely based on the informations content you obtain from the various methods if the information content is not reliable if the information content is not correct then you are going to end up with the problem of uh, proving a wrong hypothesis as correct or disproving a right hypothesis as a, as a wrong also okay so the second thing is how can you justify the validation of the hypothesis based on the tools what you are using right uh, the statistical tools is nothing but a proper uh, mechanism to check the correctness of the data suppose if somebody is coming from chinese if i ask them to write uh, their exams in tamil then that is not the proper mechanism right if i want to measure their ability i have to give the question paper in chinese i can't give the same uh, chinese question paper to tamil speaking guy or uh, telugu speaking guy or hindi speaking guy so the appropriate selection of statistical tools plays a very important role in determining your validation and testing of your hypothesis 
so if not if you are not choosing a correct data if you are not choosing uh, appropriate statistical tool then what will happen so we are end up with the problem of right data in the wrong body that is a famous uh, statement you might have know right man in the wrong body somebody is asking for permission can i give it or what first organize sir somebody is asking for some annotation request uh, no sir you don't have to hello they can join actually without annoying also okay they are asking so i i don't want to give anything right i can decline it right yes sir you can kindly yeah thank you so uh, there is a statement uh, it, uh, you might have come across this a right man in the wrong party a wrong man in the right party kind of thing right so if you are choosing a wrong statistical tool okay then what will happen you have a correct data but you are choosing the wrong model what will happen obviously you end up with uh, obviously you end up with uh, claiming a wrong justification okay you are end up with poor results not poor results maybe uh, <clears throat> a bad results maybe uh, uh, incorrect results the exact term is incorrect results there may be a true relationship but because of choosing a wrong model you are uh, claiming uh, inappropriate results so if your statistical tools are not correct the model selection uh, the tools what you are trying to estimate the the model what you are trying to test the validation of hypothesis is not correct then you will end up with the problem of right data and wrong model things so the tool what you are choosing matters here it plays an important role so what will happen if you are uh, without no, if you are not aware of the right model but you have a right data but if you apply these things with those model and come with a policy conclusion what will happen it is going to be a really harmful sort of for the policy making as well as the researcher and yeah so what determines the appropriate statistical tools we are talking about appropriate statistical tools i am saying that you have to choose a right model a right tool for estimating your data okay let us assume we have a right data but the point is we have to choose an appropriate statistical tool what determines it on what basis i can choose my data is correct uh, correct fit for a particular statistical tool on what basis i can decide this if you want to answer this i can tell this with the famous statement let the data speak for itself you have to choose the tool the statistical tool depends upon the nature of the data it is also a famous statement made by irving fish in the year 1952 when he talks about data he uh, generally what we researchers at the initial stage what we used to do is we have a model in our mind okay we have some model in our mind we have a data which both of them may not be synchronized the data have a different nature the model what we have in our mind is a different in nature but we want to estimate the model we try to fit the data what we are having to that model which may not be an appropriate uh, method of doing so but still we are doing it without knowing the pros and cons of uh, uh, such estimations so what will happen we have a right data we have a right model but that right model is not right for the data so if you are uh, fitting those kind of associations you end up with a spurious or harmful or uh, completely incorrect results so what you decide is the data what you are having must speak for itself it will tell you what type of model what type of statistical tool you have to apply to obtain the results or you have to apply to justify the hypothesis or justify the claim so how to obtain how we decide whether the statistical the available statistical i think that's a typo yeah it's correct how the uh, uh, how so sorry what i'm trying to say is that how do we know whether the available statistical tools are fit for the data what we are having on what basis we can decide this uh, it's all based on an assumption what we made on the nature of the data each and every data set has its own assumption okay so don't worry even though if you have uh, any difficulties in uh, talk, uh, following about this assumption on data don't worry this is a very preliminary thing 
we are going to discuss these things in a very detail. As a researcher, as a social science researcher, what we do is we always make some assumptions about the data. Okay, it follows a certain pattern. So, what type of statistical tool we are supposed to use? It depends upon what type of assumptions we put upon, what type of assumptions we assume on the nature of the data, how the data structure is cooked, how the data structure is assumed to be. It determines what type of data tool you are supposed to use. Generally, when we talk about uh, the parametric and non-parametric tests, you can easily classify this those tests is purely based on these two assumptions. Sorry, this assumption, the assumption of normality. What is the assumption of normality? We are going to discuss that in the upcoming slides. So what we do is generally we assume the data what we are going to do, what we are going to use for estimation purpose, follows a set of assumptions. Uh, I can say that it is nothing but the distributional assumptions of any data structure. You, whatever data you have, it follows different distribution assumptions. Okay, it may be Poisson distribution, it may be normal distribution, it may be uh, uh, what to say, it may be uh, Poisson distribution, normal distribution, binomial distribution also. So, as a researcher, what we assume is that we always make some assumptions about the distributive nature of the data. Okay, uh, from the underlying population. I will come to this point. What is population and uh, what is data and all? Let me give some time. Second thing is uh, the data, the statistical tool which we are supposed to use, not only based on the normality assumption, that is uh, the, distri the distributive nature of the data, what we assume, it is also based on some of the further, further assumptions like scale of measurement. It is also depends upon uh, the characters of the data. What is scale of measurement? I will come to that in the next slide. So what happened is if let us assume the normality assumption is satisfied, then the scale of measurement assumption is also satisfied, then we can decide whether we can go for parametric test or otherwise we can go for non-parametric test. In simple terms, I can say if the normality assumption, which means that we are assuming that the data, what we obtain from the population follows uh, a normally distributed nature or normally distributed curve then we can go for a parametric test okay if the data is not following the uh, uh, if the data is not following uh, the distributive assumption of normality assumption then we can use non parametric test is it clear so the idea is what type of test we are supposed to use whether the parametric test or non parametric test it depends upon the basic assumption of normality of the data structure. What is normality assumption? That is what we are going to see, right? So, some before uh, proceeding with the uh, basic structures of our uh, presentation today, I just want to share certain film narratives. Uh, most of you may know about this, but still, uh, there is nothing wrong in uh, have a quick revision of all those things. The population and sample. Uh, I don't think there is a there, there is no need uh, a definition for this, but still I can tell you. Then what is scale of measurement? Then what is the probability distributions? Before uh, discussing about this uh, parametric and non-parametric test, we have to understand we are supposed to have the basic knowledge of what is meant by population and sample, what is meant by scale of measurements, and what is meant by the probability distributions. These are the basic things. There are a few more things is there those things you can learn once you started estimating uh, this parametric and non-parametric test depends upon your research objective and your uh, motivation of research so what is population and what is the sample so in statistics when we talk about population it is nothing but uh, the entire set of individuals or objects which may be finite or infinite right so suppose uh, you are going to study about uh, 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 you are going to study about the IQ of uh, students from CUTN. What is the population size? The total number of students in CUTN is your population size. Is it clear? Guys, are you able to follow any questions? So population is nothing but 
the uh, the entire set of individuals the point is the entire set of your uh, object of interest suppose you want to check uh, uh, the driving capacity of uh, no i can say that you can check uh, if you want to know uh, the iq of uh, iq test of uh, phd scholars in cutn then uh, the number of phd scholars in cutn is your uh, uh, population right so if you have a population if you are obtaining the estimates of the population those estimates are called as parameters okay you have a population what you can do you have a population from that you may obtain certain descriptive statistics like mean median mode or uh, something like uh, quartile deviation or uh, standard deviation or variance whatever it may be so you obtain some some estimates or parameters from if you, if you obtain some numbers some descriptives okay from the parameter sorry from the population those parameters those estimates those numbers those descriptives are called as parameter right so what is sample a sample is nothing but a subset of an individual or object from a larger population that you collect or analyze to make inferences the idea is you as i said uh, if you want to know the iq of phd scholars in cutn then it is possible maybe some 200 phd scholars are there you can collect the entire information of phd scholars that's the first point suppose if you want to collect the iq of phd scholars in tamil nadu university then it is also possible maybe some uh, around some 30 or 40 universities are there if you put some time and effort if you uh, have some mon sound monetary uh, attachments then you can you can do it with some kind of manpower you can do it if you want to understand the iq of uh, phd scholars the entire south india then as a researcher as an individual researcher as a student it may be quite complicated in south india we have four states so i'm not very sure how many universities we are having then it is going to be quite complicated okay let us expand our problem to further a national level we want to study uh, uh, the iq of phd scholars in india then i think we have almost some 56 central universities some state universities some institutes the numbers may be close to 700 or 800 so in that situation you can't get the entire population you can't get uh, the, all the phd scholars information so what you can do instead of collecting the entire sample what you can do is you can pick a subset from the sample subset from the individuals it is called a sample so what you can do you can pick one one student from one one institute so what happens is this student whom you are picking which is called a sample will replicate the true nature of the population in simple terms i can say if you pick one piece is called from cutn that sample will replicate the true nature of all the pages scholars in cutn that is what we that is what the assumption we used to generally assume so what is population population is the entire set of individuals of interest uh, what is sample sample is a subset of population or a subset of individuals which we can obtain to make inferences about the population so whatever uh, uh, parameters whatever coefficients we are obtaining from sample is called as statistic that is what i put an hyphen so whatever parameters is obtained from para, population is called as parameter whatever uh, statistics we obtain from uh, sample is called as static okay so what is parameter parameter is nothing but it may be anything it may be descriptive statistics something like uh, a mean or standard deviation or mode or median something like that which is nothing but an aspect of the population which will replicate the nature of the population what is static static is also a kind of mean or standard deviation or variance which uh, which is replicating the nature of the sample which replicates the nature of the population in simple terms i can say that from statistic we can estimate the parameter okay is it clear these are all very basic idea of research methodology so we have a static with the help of the static we are going to 
of time we are going to derive the nature of the population how we are going to do so we are assuming while uh, framing the sample while designing the sample sample design we assume that the sample have the same distribution like the parameters and it has the same shape of the population so what we assume is that the sample static what we are deriving is have the same distributional pattern as well as the same shape of the parameter this is what our assumption is all about so generally what we assume is that we assume the population is following a normal distribution so what is scale of measurement as i told you the reliability of your uh, test statistic depends upon the assumptions you are make what type of assumption you are making it may be based on uh, 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 what is that it may be based on uh, the population sample then or it may be based on the scale of measurements so uh, i think all of you know about this there are four types of scales generally we used to use one is nominal let me show everything then i can discuss one by one another one is ratio uh, first one is nominal another one is ordinal third one is interval and fourth one is ratios so let me start from ordinal actually generally we used to start from uh, okay let me start from uh, nominal scale in nominal scale we have simply we have the labels simply to express indexing purpose it is not mean for any ordering the best example for this nominal data is gender okay we can ask whether uh, the gender is male or female or transgender we have three options one two or three okay here that is we can't say that one is superior than two two is superior than three or three is lesser than one or even understand what i'm trying to say the, when the data is called as nominal data it is purely based on indexing purpose we are using arithmetic purely based on indexing purpose not to explain any natural ordering right suppose if you are talking about ranks okay first rank second rank and third rank what it means the first rank is superior to the second rank right the second rank is superior to the third rank that is what we generally use for rankings but in the nominal data if we call the data as nominal there is no any ordering it is use arithmetic simply for indexing purpose if i say one that means that replicates the male if i say two means that replicate female if i say three then that replicate transgender okay it's purely replicating a simple indexing purpose the labels are simple in nature there is no any ordering right is it clear guys the best example other example is you can take with the eye color okay you have having one and two if your eye color is blue you can call it as one if your eye color is black you can call it as two if your eye color is brown then you call it as three here doesn't mean that one is superior than two or two is superior than three there is no such ordering okay it's purely labeling right third thing is third example is you can think about the uh, religion you can ask what type of religion you belongs to what type of eth ethnicity you belongs to what type of languages you know tamil means one english means two french means three hindi means four telugu means five you can rank it it doesn't mean that the first rank first thing is superior than the last there is no such ordering just keep in mind if you are having the nominal data there is no any arithmetical operations you can't go for a mean you can't go for subtractions or any arithmetical operation because here the arithmetic does not have any meaning it's just pure an indexing it's just an label guys is it clear any questions okay so then that is the first scale of measurement is nominal data you if you want to have a clear picture of nominal data better you can have gender male and female male or female if it is male then you cannot as call it as one if it is female then you can call it as two or zero whatever it may be okay here there is no any superiority of the data it is purely indexing purpose we are using the arithmetic what is ordinal data in ordinal data we have a natural ordering okay one is greater than two two is greater than three something like that suppose if i want to give you a preference 
suppose i give you a choice of foods ice creams uh pulao okay then pizza and burger if i want to order you uh, if you I, if i ask you order the preferences somebody can give uh, ice cream as a first choice somebody may give uh, pizza and burger as a second choice somebody can go for vegetable pulao or uh, whatever it may be as a third choice suppose if i ask the same question to someone else he may have a different choice here there is a natural ordering okay one means one the preference of one is higher than the two right is it clear so here also we don't have any arithmetic operation you we can't sum we can't go for any descriptive analysis in uh, ordinal data also but the main uh, uh, the major difference the major point you have to take here is suppose uh, let me tell you i want to measure your happiness okay i will give you five choice one is exactly perfectly happy five is uh, perfectly unhappy in between you have uh, okay normal fine bad okay you have five options I, otherwise i can call it as very good good normal bad very bad five options i'm, I'm asking how you are feeling now you can say very good is for five uh, good for four you know literal scaling with that right one two three four five one means uh, very good two means uh, good three means bad sorry three means normal four means uh, bad and five means very bad in this we have an ordering if you say very good means that is superior over the rest of the four but the point here is that is you don't know what is the real difference between one and two you can't differentiate it okay if that is the case then it is called as ordinal data so then let us talk about uh, interval data interval data is a data which can be measured only the distance even it may be an ordinal data okay interval data may be on ordinal data but the point here is uh we know the difference between the orders okay suppose i am saying uh, suppose i am measuring the temperature okay if i am measuring the temperature if it say 2 degrees celsius uh, tomorrow it's going to be 1 degree celsius day after tomorrow it's going to be 0 degree then it is going to be again minus 5 something like that here we know the exact difference the difference between 1 and 2 right we know the difference between first degree and second degree we know the difference between 0 and 1 we know the difference between minus 5 and 0 okay but even though we are mentioning zero here, it doesn't mean zero. There is a point to take it up. Okay. So we can measure the difference. When we talk about ratio data, uh, it is uh, usually used to explain the identity or magnitude or equal intervals where we can go for all the arithmetic operations. Uh, the ratio data is nothing but a data, uh, a kind of uh, data which is uh, ordinal in nature where we have uh, uh, we know the difference between the numbers right the probability distribution the third thing uh, which describes what what is the appropriate tool for choosing uh, uh, your uh, data estimations is probability distribution actually we are not going to see everything as i told you from the very beginning the validation of any hypothesis depends upon uh, to validate any hypothesis as a researcher we always make some assumptions about the about how the data is distributed is it right is it clear so as a researcher we always make some assumptions about how the data is distributed why we are talking about data distribution because sir, excuse a, me sir yes can you give an example for interval and ratio like uh, norm, nominal and ordinal what you are giving? Yeah, yeah, I'll give. Yes, I'll take this point. Let me finish this. I'll give you that uh, example for okay, this. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, as a researcher, what we used to do is generally uh, we always make assumption how the data is distributed. Why? Because uh, most of the cases we never have population data. We are supposed to pick uh, a sample from the population. Okay, so if you want to do such analysis, we have to make certain assumptions, certain conditions, because 
here we are dealing with uh, social sciences the data may not be accurate so we are always assuming that uh, the sample size the sample data is always follows the same pattern of like uh, uh, same pattern or uh, already told you not the same pattern or uh, uh, same shape of uh, distribution what uh, uh, the population is having so it is necessary to assume a distribution type for any hypothesis the other important point is the distribution may be discrete or continuous in nature so if you want to understand uh, this thing you have to understand what is my disc discrete data and what is my continuous data discrete data is the data where the options are very limited suppose you are tossing a coin what are the options you can get only one and two you can measure it okay but at the same time uh, the continuous data is the data where you can't uh, measure the thing in what uh, at one particular point of time the options are very high suppose you are measuring the speed of the wind it is not one and two it may be anything any number right it may be keep on changing so uh, the distribution what we are going to assume is based on whether it is a discrete distribution or continuous distribution most commonly uh, these are the distributions are available uh, in, this, in the statistics it is not only the distribution there are other distributions also there but in common generally what we do is we go for binomial distribution or Poisson distribution and normal distribution so binomial distribution is the distribution where it is discrete in nature the Poisson distribution is continuous as well as normal distribution is also continuous in nature okay i'm not i don't want to go much deeper on this thing because it, it is for a kind of uh, sharing the knowledge okay uh, if you if you have a separate discussion on uh, distribution of distributions probability distributions then we can uh, have a serious discussion on this but i just want you to touch this point so our concern is only normal distribution it's not normal distribution it is normal distribution so uh, whether we are going for parametric test or non parametric test it's all depends upon this one whether uh, uh, the distribution of the sample the distribution of the data is normally distributed or not right any questions uh, somebody asked about uh, the difference between ordinal and normal data i will keep that do you have any questions on this guys no questions so good morning sir yes so this is one clarification regarding the central limit theorem sir Yes. It says uh, if the sample size is more than 30, it is or higher the sample size, it's usually normally distributed. So okay. If, if the sample is say 100, uh, 200, should we still check for normality or can we go by uh, central limit theorem saying it's normally distributed? Yeah, actually, uh, that's an interesting question. When mm -hmm. if you want to apply parametric and non-parametric test, uh, mm -hmm. there are four types of things are possible you may assume that your data is normality but it may not be normally distributed it is assumed that if the data is uh, the sample size is very high then uh, it is assumed that uh, your data is moving towards normality but the question is what is large sample size right if it's 100 means why what about 99 what about 101 are able to understand what i'm trying to say instead of arbitrarily assuming that better you can check the normality and then proceed because sometimes uh we may end up with uh, uh, a misunderstanding of the normality then uh, the results are uh, also uh, misinterpreted there may be a problem of committing errors so if you want to do a uh, uh, what to say a flawless research better you can check the properties then you can proceed that's the best best choice right okay sir Any more questions? So ratio data and all I will show you with the numbers also. Don't worry because uh, yeah, so normal distribution. So in this analysis, our entire analysis, entire uh, thing is all about normal distribution. What is normal distribution? What are the properties of normal distribution? What are the characters of normal distribution? Uh, generally, it is assumes that uh, if you plot the normally distributed uh, data if the data what we are using for estimations 
is uh, having uh, it satisfying the assumption of normality then it has a bell shaped cow it has one single peak and a unimodal unimodal curve in nature what is unimodal unimodal is nothing but it has only one mode why because it has a single peak so i think you people may know about the statistical properties of normally distributed thing it is symmetric in nature and means always lies in the center then uh, this is another third property not only the mean the median and are also lies on the center so maybe the mean median and mode are all the same value this is how your normality normally distributed curves are uh, visualized right is it clear so parametric and non parametric example so let us assume if you want to check you have a data you have an idea you have to uh, frame a hypothesis you have to prove or disprove the hypothesis your idea suppose you have an idea you want to test it so what are you supposed to do you have to frame a hypothesis and you have to test it and based on the test results uh, you can justify or you can prove or disprove your idea right so uh, so to for the testing purpose we have to decide what type of test we are supposed to use whether it's a parametric test or non parametric test so let us start with an example uh, as an, uh, an economist who wants to prove that the welfare schemes helps the students to consume more calories in per day for example the welfare schemes like mid day meal scheme provide uh, school going children to consume more calories per day it uh, in other ways i can say that it will avoid the malnutrition among the children uh, researcher want to check the welfare schemes uh, uh, diminishes reduce the malnutrition among the children this is let us assume this is his hypothesis he want to check whether this welfare schemes is operating in reducing the malnutrition among the school going children so if that is the case what is supposed to do is he is supposed to frame the null hypothesis i think all of you know about null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis if you want to test something you have to declare uh, there is no difference between uh, uh, your null and uh, you, you are supposed to frame a null hypothesis in such a way you want to reject it okay so you, our null hypothesis is check whether uh, uh, the welfare schemes are reducing uh, the malnutrition among the children so i am framing uh, such a null hypothesis here that there is no difference in the intake of calories between children who receive welfare schemes and the children who does not receive it it means that i can make it very simple in such a yes yes hello any questions guys surya kumar did you ask anything yes sir no sir clear so i got a question it seems there is a uh, there is a uh, interim in the in between okay so uh, let me make it is very simple this statement is very big so let us assume that uh, the welfare schemes reduce the malnutrition among the children so what we assume the null hypothesis there is no difference between uh, reduction in malnutrition between the children who are in welfare schemes and the children who are not in the welfare schemes so what to do how to do this so if this is the hypothesis we have a data collected from say some uh, 200 uh, school going children okay meantime uh, we are uh, so what we trying to do is we have a school going children and we check whether they are uh, in uh, welfare schemes or not okay so then we have to check the normality of that data and decide whether we can choose parametric or non parametric test if we plot the data if the data what we are having satisfy the condition of normality and the other few assumptions what we discuss then we can apply parametric test if the data is not satisfying the normality test and the other uh, assumptions what we are discussing then the non parametric test may be suitable for estimation purpose in very simple term <coughs> sorry in very simple uh, language in one line story i can tell you if the data what you are having is satisfying the condition of normality 
you can think about parametric test. If the data what you are having is not satisfying the condition of parameter, uh, parametric, that, that, that means that the data is not parametric in nature, then uh, the data is uh, non normality in nature, then think about non parametric test. So, one simple suggestion is if you have a chance of uh, choosing uh, between parametric and non parametric test, you have a position, you are in the position to apply parametric test. Please try to always do the parametric test because it is a more powerful statistical tool than the non parametric. Why? Uh, I'll tell you an example. I don't know whether I give the example or not. No. Okay. I'll tell you a small example. Suppose if you want to test uh, whether is there is any difference between the salary, uh, I can say that if there is the gender plays any role in determining the salary. Okay. So uh, uh, the sal so what you're supposed to do is you are collecting, uh, you are having a sample which includes both male and female. You are calculating the salary, then you are testing whether gender plays any role in discriminating salary or what. So in such situation. Uh, you may reject the null hypothesis because of two reasons. One may be because there may be difference in salaries. Other may be because there may be different in some other factors like how the sample is collected, the age of the respondents like that. So if that is the case, uh, the null hypothesis can be rejected in parametric test if there is a very less possibility of rejection. Okay. Yeah, very small differences between the samples is good enough in parametric test to reject the null hypothesis. So this test is more powerful than the non-parametric test. So whenever you get a chance of uh, choosing uh, the models between parametric and non-parametric, but you can always choose the parametric test. So just give me a minute. Yes. So, I think uh, this is also not new to you people. Suppose uh, we are talking about parametric and non-parametric test. If the data what we are having satisfy the condition of normality, then we can think about parametric test. Let us assume the data what we are having is not satisfying the condition of parametric condition of normality. Then uh, as we discussed, we have to go for a non-parametric test. So uh, we have three columns here. Suppose the data has with the normality condition, uh, then we can choose any one of the tests given in parametric. If the data is not satisfying, then there is always a counter part of test is available for parametric test in the non-parametric test. Okay, there is always counter measure. There is always a count. Uh, uh, there is also a similar test or available in the non-parametric test. The data is not satisfying the normality condition. For example, you have one sample test. Okay. Uh, if it is, you have one sample, only one sample. If that sample is satisfying the condition of parametric, then you can simply apply simple t test. Suppose you have one sample in which the sample is not satisfying the condition of normality, then you may think about Wilcoxon test, or also called as time test, uh, Wilcoxon test for simple sample. Okay. Suppose you have two dependent sample. What is two dependent sample? A two dependent sample is nothing but we have a sample. Guys, is it clear? Because our entire analysis is based on this idea only. This one chart I just want to make you understand because uh, whatever you are going to do, it all depends upon this part only. Is it clear, guys? Any questions? So we have one sample. Suppose we have only one group. Let us assume uh, we have a set of people, say 10 people. So uh, if you want to uh, uh, do any analysis, you have to check the normality condition of this. Let us assume we have 50 samples because there is always a problem uh, in the literature. If your sample size is more than 30, generally it meet out the normality assumption. 
but there is no any fixed law people used to say that if n is greater than 30 you are assumption uh, you have a great, uh, you have a large sample if it is less than 30 then it is smaller sample it is what generally used in all the statistical textbooks but there is no any precise law for that nobody is uh, able to give justification why it is so what will happen if it's 29 what will happen if it's 31 there is no proper answer <clears throat> so the point is let us assume we have 50 sample uh, if the, that 50 sample is following and satisfying the assumption of normality then you can apply the simple t test okay Suppose the sample what you are having is not satisfying the condition of normality, then you can think about non-parametric test, a parallel uh, test for a simple t-test for a single sample or one sample is that Wilcoxon test for one sample. Okay. Suppose you have two dependent sample test. What is two dependent sample test? A two different sample, sample test is also called a paired sample test. The idea is very simple. Suppose you have a observation, as I said, 50 numbers. You have 50 numbers. So, what you are doing is you are having, you are checking, uh, just a minute. You have one population. In that population, what you are doing is you are obtaining two set, set of samples. Then you are comparing if there is any difference between the two set of samples. For example, uh, let us assume we have uh, 100 employees. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are giving them the salary, wage rate. Let us assume the wage rate example. Suppose if you want to know if there is any difference in salary based on gender. So what you can do is in out of 100 employees, let us assume we have 50 uh, female laborers and uh, 150 male laborers. So what we used to do is we pick that 50 uh, male laborers and we pick that 50 uh, female laborers. Then our null hypothesis is going to be something like there is no any difference between the wage rate among the laborers based on gender. So this is called a part sample t test. What is part sample t test? We are applying t test. We are testing uh, uh, the validation of the hypothesis within the sample. We have a same group from the same group. We are having uh, two different uh, samples. We have one population from that population. We are obtaining two different samples and we are comparing whether is there is any difference in the sampling process of those population. So if the sample what you are having is satisfying the normality condition then you can think about pad sample t test if it is not so then we can think about wilcoxon matched pair sign test okay there is a test called as wilcoxon matched pair sign test available in non parametric test you can use make use of this when the data what you are having is not satisfying the condition of normality then we have uh, yeah, one more test called as two independent sample test. This two independent sample test is also a, a simple and interesting test where you obtained a sample from two different populations. Okay, we are obtaining sample from two different populations and comparing whether is there is any difference between uh, the obtained sample from two different populations. If that is the case, you can apply unpaired sample t tests okay if the data is satisfying the condition of normality if it is not satisfying the condition of normality then you can think about man with me u test which is available in non parametric test okay so the fourth thing is more than two independent variable sample suppose we are talking about only two independent samples suppose if you are having uh, more than two samples suppose from the population you are obtaining uh, three samples more than two then you are supposed to apply one factorial ANOVA if those samples satisfy the condition of normality otherwise fiscal values test if uh, the data what you are having is not satisfying the condition of normality okay suppose you are using uh, more than two dependent sample which means that one group one population you are having uh, three samples whereas in the fourth case two different populations then uh, or three different populations you have uh, 
different samples, right? So finally, uh, when you talk about if you are interested to study about uh, the correlation between two variables, then if it is parametric, the sample size, what you are using is parametric in nature, then you can go for PSN correlation. If it is non-parametric, then you can think about Pearman rank correlation. Any questions? Okay, sir, let me, yes. Sir? yes. So there is a factorial anova is one way. A little louder, little louder, I'm not able to hear you. So the factorial anova is one way and two way. It's factorial. called a one way factorial anova. And two way factorial anova. Two way anova. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not discussing much about ANOVA because even I'm not going to discuss about that because Madam Mahalakshmi Madam is going to talk about only ANOVA. So sir, I'm asking that uh, that one factor ANOVA contains uh, both one way and two way ANOVA, sir. Or no, no, it's only one factor ANOVA, only one way. Okay, then what is the repeated measure ANOVA, sir? That is two way ANOVA, sir. No, it is depends upon. Look at here. A repeated measure ANOVA means uh, uh, yeah, it may be two way ANOVA, but you have to apply only to the situation where we have more than two dependent variables. It all depends upon what type of nature of data you are having. If it is more than two independent sample, two independent sample means we have two different groups. You are having independent samples, then you are supposed to apply parametric test. If the data satisfying the condition of uh, normality, then you think about factorial ANOVA. Only factorial ANOVA. You can check uh, what to say. Uh, what is the formula of that? ESS, CSS, something like that. N minus one K. You can apply that. You can get it. Suppose you have two dependent samples. Okay. It all depends upon this one sample, two sample. Or depends upon only what you had designed this. I think there is there is some question. What is the question? Janavi or who is this? Just a minute. I think I let's see the question. Somebody can look the question for me. Somebody post a question. How can I see the inbox here? Not shown anything. So is that only the distribution that makes the differentiation between using the parametric and not parametric? Yes, absolutely. If in very simple terms, we can say actually uh, the basic understanding is if the data is non-normality, which means that it is normal in nature, then you can straight away go to parametric test. The data is not satisfying the condition of normality, which means that it is not in bell shaped curve, it is not symmetric, it is skewed. Then you may think about non parameter. This is the basic thing, but it is not the only thing. There are a few more assumptions out there. We are going to see that in the later part. At the very preliminary test, you can choose the normality based on the normality you can design whether it's a parametric or non parametric test. Okay, Janani? Thank you, sir. Okay. So let me have a quick discussion on what is what are the advantages of having parametric test and non-parametric test, something like that. Okay. So what are the advantages? Actually, there is a lot of advantages out there. Uh, I'm not going to show everything. I'm just documenting only the very what Amal Shaba parametric test. Okay, let me keep the questions later because let me finish this. We have a question session because you type image, I'm not able to see the questions. So what is parametric test? What is the advantage of using parametric test? The basic idea is it use normally distributed. It use all the information about uh, the population. Okay. The, when we assume that the parameter, we are going for parametric test, it assumes that uh, the thing is normally distributed. So there is no any problem with the data. Okay. It is normally distributed. But we are to, when we, uh, when we talk about non-parametric test, the problem is in most of the cases, the real time data may not be parametric in nature, maybe normality in nature, it may be non parametric. I'll tell you a small example. Suppose you are talking about uh, you, are, you have a data of something like uh, 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 air pollution. Okay, you are talking about the air pollution uh, of the global cities. Okay, you don't know how the data is computed, you, you know only the numbers, right? Maybe uh, some 56 metric ton, 75 metric ton, you don't know from where the data is obtaining, maybe uh, how the data is computing. In such cases, what will happen is you can't end up with normally distributed data. You always end up with the non-parametric data only. Your assumptions of parametric may not be satisfied there. In such situations, you can't 
apply parametric test you have to think about non parametric only in simple terms in the real world okay uh you may not have normally distributed data most of the cases in such situation you have to think about uh the non parametric test only okay another important thing is non parametric test will never think about it never uh, uh have any assumptions it never uh, describe any uh assumptions about the distribution of the sample size okay so we can call it as it is distribution free test so non parametric test is distribution free test what are the distribution it may be it may be poisson distribution it may be binomial distribution you can apply non parametric test but if you want to apply parametric test it is supposed to be only normally distributed right so one of the advantages of uh, parametric test is you can use the data as it is there is no need for any transformation suppose uh, as i said you have a data you can't use the data as it is in your non parametric test you have to either rank it you have to transform it you have to convert the data for your convenience you have to order it you have to arrange it you have to rank it then only you can apply the test because most of the non parametric test are uh, based on uh, ordering and ranks okay in such situations you need to transform the data you need to convert the data in other form to run the non parametric test but in the parametric test such things are not required so as i told uh, uh, the parametric test is having high statistical power compared to other tests because it it uh, uh, the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis is very high even though uh, the difference between uh, the samples are very limited you know the difference is very meager very small this test parametric test will reject the null hypothesis which will give you only uh, the high compact uh, high compatible and significant results okay some test will satisfy uh, the reliability of the test but in parametric test it never satisfies the reliability even though the chance of difference between the samples groups are limited it will reject the null hypothesis okay it will never accept the null hypothesis this is one of the advantage of parametric test when it talks about non parametric it is very easy to compute okay uh, no need to uh, talk about uh, uh, You, you are just simply you need to rank it you simply need to rank your observations and you can proceed with it third thing is sometimes there is no need for uh, ordering also so i can tell you an example uh, for uh, how uh, the non parametric test is uh, simple and easy to compute suppose uh, let us assume uh, you have a data something like uh, um, it's just an example okay something like 13.33 76.50 110.53 again 20.53 you have such a data it will never become uh, normality so if you want to apply if you want to make use of this kind of data what you can do is you can simply order this numbers based on uh, either ascending order or descending order you can give uh, rank 1 to the higher value or uh, uh, rank 1 to the lower value depends upon the ascending and descending order you can easily convert the data instead of as i said 13.33 you can call it a, suppose you are going with ascending order you can give it as 1 and i said suppose 76.50 you can give it 2 suppose you are using uh, 154.3 you can give it 3 you can order it okay you can rank it and you can simply apply the thing okay these are the advantages of your uh, parametric and non parametric test what are the disadvantages uh what are the advantages we are showing that is also going to be disadvantage as i said there are a lot of disadvantages i'm just documenting only a very few important uh, disadvantages of this thing see generally what happen is if you want to apply parametric test we are always having some kind of restrictive assumptions about the population parameter okay we assume that the population have normally distributed but in general it is not available it is the problem is in most of the cases uh it may not be possible so obviously we end up with the problem of not satisfying the condition of normality the normality condition may not be satisfied okay the another serious problem of uh, this normality test parametric test is it may not be 
good enough to estimate for a small sample size. It may not be good enough to test for a sample size which is meager. Uh, generally, statistically, people used to say that if it is less than 30, your parametric test may not be good enough. It may not be give you the reliable test. Another important problem with this parametric test is the outliers may affect uh, the estimated results because it's a continuous data. It will treat the outlier also as a data only. It also treat outliers as a continuous data. It never excluded from the model. So that will end up with the problem of outliers and the reliability of your statistics may be questionable. When we talk about the disadvantage of non parametric test, even though it has certain advantages, if you rank your non parametric, if you rank your data, you are going to lose certain very important information. For example, let's take this number as I said 13.3376. Uh, Let me call it a plain number 10, 20, 30, 40,000. Okay. If I order it, what can I do? I can go for 1 for 10, 2 for 20, 3 for 30, 4 for 40, and 5 for 1000. Right? Is it clear? I'm ordering it. So, even though it looks like similar, but the difference between 40 and 1000 is bigger. That is some information is there. Okay. But that information can be only measured in parametric test. But if you're simply ordering the numbers, the difference between 4 and 5, which is nothing but close to 960, has some information. We lose those informations while using non parametric test. Second thing is this test, or uh, even though it is uh, not following any uh, distribution assumption, it is not efficient as like as the parametric test. Okay. It is not that sharp as like as the parametric test. The third thing is also uh, very simple to understand the results may not be. That accurate. You can't claim that that results are very much accurate because the sample what you pick may follow a different pattern. Uh, the true pattern of your population may be different. Okay, we are not making any distribution assumptions. Your sample may follow your lipocotric or binomial distribution, whereas your sample may your population may have the uh, normal distribution. We are not having any such assumption. Then uh, the results what we are trying to obtain by make use of the sample to interpret population is not. Correct. There may be a possibility of incorrect estimates also possible. So these are some of the disadvantages of your uh, non-parametric test. So let me have a quick, quick, brief view of what we discussed here. Okay. Even though you are not able to follow this, I think this will give you a overall picture of uh, whatever discussion we had as of now. First thing is. How can we choose the parametric test or non parametric test? It may be based on probability distribution. If uh, the data what we are using follow a normal distributed nature, normally distributed curve, it is satisfying the condition of normality. Normally, if the data what you are using is normally distributed, then you can think about parametric test. Okay. If the data what you are using is skewed, it may be lipocratic or uh, uh, in some other form, it is not satisfying the condition of normality, then you can think about non parametric test first point. Okay. Second thing is you can decide whether you can use parametric and non parametric test is purely based on the nature of the data. If it is quantitative data, it's a qualitative data. Okay. It's in metrics, it's in numbers, then you can think about applying parametric test. The basic condition for applying parametric test is the data must be qualitative in nature. If the data is qualitative, what does it mean by qualitative? Suppose you are asking uh, about the gender, eye color, skin color, language is known, okay, or uh, veg or non veg, okay, geospace. Then these types of data is called as qualitative in nature, which cannot be measured with the help of metrics. Qualitative characteristics, then you are supposed to apply non parametric test. What about scale of measurement? Suppose you are using your data is nominal or ordinal. The nominal data means it's purely. The labels are given purely for labeling purpose. It's for purely indexing purpose. There is no any meaning for one or two. It's purely for labeling. Or your data have ordered one, two, three, where one is uh, greater than two or three. Then if you have such a numbers, then you are thinking about non-parametric test. Whereas the data is interval or ratio that is given in metrics. 
mathematical form then you are thinking about parametric test so when we discuss about parametric test we uh, we can also decide based on distributed statistics if you want to compare the uh, the two samples with the help of mean or standard deviation we think about parametric test okay suppose you have two groups you want to compare these two groups with the help of mean or standard deviation then you think about parametric test when it satisfies the condition of normality and other things if you want to compare two groups with the help of median okay then you can think about non parametric test so when we talk about parametric test we are supposed to use only the variables the attributes is not permitted attributes in the sense it is nothing but your uh, qualitative nature your gender your eye color your food habits uh, your skin color is all attributed nature in parametric test you can use only the variables which used to change whereas in non parametric you can use both variables as well as attributes yeah this point i already told you if you want to compare uh, two groups with the help of mean and standard deviation you can use this thing so the distributed statistics yeah if you talks about parametric test you can explain the data with the help of mean only if you talks about parametric non parametric then the description must be based on median okay about the population uh, in parametric test it is assumes that no let me finish this the comparison if you want to compare two tests based on mean and standard deviation you can use parametric test if you want to compare uh, based on percentages and uh, proportions then you may think about uh, 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 non parametric test. i'll tell you a small example suppose uh, you want to compare a performance of two groups okay from one population x and y let us assume you give a drug okay you are going to provide a drug to a population then you want to check whether the drug has any efficiency in reducing the disease level so what you are doing do is you are measuring uh, let us assume weight you are using a drug to reduce the weight you are taking the weight of the group before giving the drug okay so what happens is you have a drug you that drug is used to reduce the weight so you take the mean uh, value before giving the drug let us assume the mean value is 60 okay. yes so you are giving the drug for a month then you are taking the mean value of the population mean weight of the population now the weight is the mean value comes to say 80 then you can call that the drug is efficient or you will understand you have a drug which is useful to reduce the weight of the population so before uh, uh, before giving the drug you take the mean value of the population or sample it say that 100 is the mean weight of the population you are prescribing the drug drug after the two, two months you are again taking the mean value of the population then now the mean value is 80 then you can uh, claim that the drug is efficient how we are comparing we are comparing purely based on the mean before uh, prescription the mean value is 100 after prescription for a month the mean value is 80 so there is a change we are comparing the change between two groups with the help of mean then it is a parametric test suppose as i said uh if you are comparing the same thing with the help of percentage and population suppose uh, the same drug uh, uh the weight is 60 percentage the weight is reduced to 60 percentage to 50 percentage we are comparing in terms of percentages and proportions 10 percentage weight is coming down then it is going to be a non parametric test right when it talks about population in parametric test it is assumed that all the information about population is available we know about the standard deviation mean and all the parameters of population is known to us whereas in non parametric no such information is available so when we talks about variance in parametric test the day sir Hello, sir. I think the resource person is facing some technical issue. No, I cannot. Yes, sir. Are Thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can hear. Uh, yeah. Okay.
a minute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the important, another important assumption about parametric test is the variance of all the groups is similar, which means that, come on, which means that you, if you have uh, uh, a different group, let us assume three groups from the population, if you compute the variance of each and every group, it assumes that each and every group have the same variance. The variance are homogeneity, homogeneous in nature. Uh, that may not be the case in non-parametric test. So, uh, this is the last point is very, very important. If you are talking about the rejection of null hypothesis, how would it be rejected? Even the small difference among the sample groups is good enough for the parametric test to reject the null hypothesis of no differences. Okay, what is our null hypothesis? We have null hypothesis that there is a differences between the groups of interest, the sample uh, groups of interest. There are small differences available, exist between the two groups. This parametric test will reject the null hypothesis of no differences. So that is what this test is more powerful than the non-parametric. This may not be the case in non-parametric test also. Right? So with this, I can uh, stop here because I think this is time for questions. Let me close my PPT. Dear participants, if you have any queries, you can. You can uh, let me show you the data of the internal. No questions. Post. So one question is there. If our distribution is yes. normal, can we use chi-square test? Uh, yes. Actually, it's all, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, for that part, I have to discuss about uh, how, uh, whether the data is ordinal or normal. Sometimes, most of the cases, your data is end up with uh ordinal or nominal case if the data what you are using is ordinal or nominal then you are always supposed to use only the non-parametric test in some cases your data may be in interval and ratio case that situation is that then you can apply uh the sky test. if you want an example i will show you not now i'll take this question the idea is if the data is what you are using is actually even though the interval scale i, I don't know how many of you follow even the interval scale, the data may be ordinal. You are using, uh, for that, I have to show you what is the difference between interval scale, nominal scale, and other things. I will show you the data and, and tell you the answer. The idea is, if the data, what you are using, even though it's interval, it's follow the ordinal case, then you can think about chi-square test. But most of the cases, it won't happen. So generally, uh, if uh, data is non-parametric, then you are supposed to use chi-square only in the non-parametric test. Chi-square is a non-parametric test only. Right? How can I see the questions? Sir, uh, can you hear me, sir? Can you see any questions here? Sir? Sir, sir can you hear me, sir? Yes. So, so what's the difference between model and theory, sir? Oh, you are asking what is the difference between model and theory? Yeah, for theory, so, now I'm when a hypothesis is tested and proved, it can become a theory. In some places, the term okay. model is used. Is there any difference, sir? Uh, yes, obviously, there's a difference. See, uh, model is nothing but, uh, so for that, uh, I have to teach you how the research is designed, okay? Suppose you have a question, you have a hypothesis, okay? What you're supposed to do is, you have a hypothesis. That hypothesis is described in uh, 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 in a text form, right? So what you're supposed to do is, you have to rewrite that hypothesis into the statistical form. Suppose you are going to test relationship between income and expenditure. You are going to test the hypothesis stating that if income increases, expenditure is going to increase. This is a statement, right? You have to write this statement in the statistical form, something like y is equal to a function of x, okay? Then you have to write this statistical equation in the mathematical form, something like that, y is equal to alpha plus beta x, where the beta will measure you how much a change in x will cause a change in y. The story is not over here. Once you are designed the mathematical model, then you have to think about the econometric model. Why? Because 
your consumption is not only depends upon your expenditure sorry your income sorry your expenditure is not only depends upon your uh, income it's also depends on depends upon lot of factors like your intention climatic conditions uh, uh, you are fascinated over the things your likes and dislikes okay availability of the thing price there is lot of factors of that so while modeling these two things you can't include all the factors so you are supposed to include a component called u error term which will capture the effects of the variables which is not included in the model so we have a statistical we have a theoretical uh, uh, justification we have a statistical model then we have a mathematical model then we have an econometric model so we can estimate only the econometric model modeling is nothing but uh, converting the uh, theoretical aspects in the testable form of mathematical equation is it clear okay sir Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, apart from the normality assumption, uh, uh, some of the um, also consider the linearity and homogeneity, sir. Is it necessary, okay. sir, for the uh, parametric test to consider the normality and uh, sorry, uh, homogeneity and uh, linearity? Actually, uh, the point here is if. Uh, we are talking about only these tests, right? The linear regression is also coming in a parametric. Test. Okay. Uh, what we generally used to do is, if you are applying any regression, we assume that that regression is linear in nature. It will be linear in parameter. There are two types of regressions are available: linear in parameter and linear in uh, 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 estimates. Okay. It all depends upon how you design the thing. Homogeneity is nothing but uh, the assumptions of uh, you have. Not understand the difference between linearity and your uh, homogeneity. Linearity is something that we are assuming that uh, the wave, only the wave of the, of the coefficient. Oh, you have beta. Okay. Let us assume you are having alpha plus beta. You think that the only in which you are assuming that is to R plus beta. All the coefficients alpha beta is linear in nature. Okay. It will help you to compute the linear regression. Suppose you are assuming both the variables and uh, coefficients are non-linear. Then it is going to be alpha square or beta square and x square. If that is the case, you can't apply any linear models. So, so there are models which is available for non-linearity and linearity. It all depends upon the nature of the data. Suppose if your data are following quadratic function or a hyperbolic function, you can't fix its straight line. Linear function is nothing but one-to-one -one relationship. This changes that is also changes by that much. Okay, it's linear. And if this x variables keep on changing, y variables keep on changing. That is how we are assuming linear thing. But in non-linear, maybe a quadratic or uh, exponential or parabolic thing, if one variable is changed, other variable for that is other variable is certain point it looks like parabolic. That is not like a period test. It is homogeneity and we follow this uh homogeneity. Suppose you pick you have a sample, okay. You have a population, if you pick Two samples from the population, both the samples have the same nature. Okay, suppose if I am picking uh, uh, two groups from the same uh, class, what will happen? More or less, these people are having the same knowledge of the subject because they are coming from the same class. Suppose if I am picking a group from commerce and picking a group from Tamil, I am picking a group from physics, these will have different, they are not homogeneous in nature by knowledge because physics person have a very good knowledge in. Uh, uh, laws of physics, Tamil person may have very good knowledge in literature, commerce person may have knowledge in accounting law. We can't uh, ask them to solve a single paper. So they are heterogeneous in nature. But I pick a group from the same uh, uh, group or uh, same setup, then they may be in homogeneity. These are two different things, but I don't know how, in what context you are conducting this one. No, sir. I'm, I am I just want to know that whether there is any um, special test for the uh, lean, linearity and homogeneity to be performed. Yes. See, the linear test is nothing but if you're talking about linear assumption, then it is parametric in nature, non, non parametric. Okay. You can decide the functional form of your model. There are certain tests in the uh, test is available, not statistical test. There are some model tests available in uh, econometrics. It will tell you whether you can choose a linear form or non, non linear form. You can, you have a relationship, you have a model, you can check the model specification. Okay, whether it is linear or non-linear. If the model specification is non-linear, you can't apply this parametric test. You have to think about non-linear models. It may be completely non-parametric. Now, I can't call it as non-parametric. You can't apply a linear model to that. 
Okay, there are certain tests called as model specification tests are available. Okay, 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 sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Any more questions? Any other queries? Sir, so next session will start sharply at twelve o'clock. So, uh, can we expect the whole time because I'm I'm having a problem of uh, power here. So, yes, sir. Just can we? Sir, at what time, sir, will be available? Then, hello, sir. Sir. Hello, sir. Okay, the next session. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, at what time? Oh, we can start the minutes. second session. 10. Just 10 minutes. I need 10 minutes. Okay, break. sir. Because I do. Okay. Correct my uh, uh, this thing uh, over problems. Okay, sir. So the next session will start at twelve ten. Kindly join us. Thank you.
ஒன்னு மரத்திலே பழுத்துருக்கு அதுவும் நல்ல பழுத்துற மாதிரிதான் இருக்குடா புரிஞ்சிட்டு வா இது நான் கூப்பிடுறேன் நான் போய் பார்த்துட்டு கூட கூப்பிடுறேன் சொல்றேன் நான்
Guys, shall we start first? Are you audible? Yes, sir. Shall we start? So I have to wait. Yes, sir. You can start. So, so welcome, sir, for the second session. Thank you. So before uh, going to the second session, uh, let me clarify the doubts of what people ask about uh, this uh, interval scale, interval data, and uh, other parts, right? Actually, this session, I don't, I'm not having any uh, PPT. Uh, I just want to show you the word file. I'm going to share it. Then I can uh, tell you how to estimate these things in uh, SPSS. Depends upon uh, system connectivity and other parts. Give me a minute. I just... That's about it. Okay. Uh, somebody asked about the uh, uh, difference between uh, somebody asked the relationship. Uh, somebody asked me to explain uh, with an example for interval and ratio scale, right? That's the question. Am I right? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah, because uh, my connection is. Keep on coming down. I'm not very sure. If, uh, if I drop the connection, if I read the connection, just let me know. Okay. Yes, sir. Just a minute. See, uh, let me explain the things from the first thing itself. See, when we talk about uh, uh, nominal data, nominal data is nothing but a data which is purely based on labeling the variable. Suppose you are using one, two means that one is nothing but a pure label. Okay. It does not have any meaning. One, let us assume one is a name, two is a name. Okay. Instead of calling it as uh, male and female, we can call it as one and two. Okay. If people are, why we are giving roll numbers? Uh, because people may have the same name in the class. Okay. To avoid confusion, we give roll numbers. Like that, if you have a data, something like male, female, male, female, something like that, Instead of avoiding uh, uh, the repetitions, we call male as one and uh, we name female as two. Okay, is it clear? So this is called as nominal variable. Suppose in case of ordinal variable, in ordinal variable, we are not only giving the name, but also ordering the variable. Suppose you are I'm giving one, I'm giving two means one is higher than the two. Okay, but two is higher than the three. Three is higher than the four. Not only I'm naming the variable as one, as to suppose, uh, let me uh, explain something like, uh, uh, let me uh, have, uh, say, uh, I just want to express my feelings, okay? Suppose I'm having, uh, uh, I have to express my satisfaction, highly satisfied, satisfied, uh, normally satisfied, not satisfied, highly disappointed. So these are the choices. What I'm supposed to do is here, I'm naming highly satisfied as five, okay? Uh, satisfied. Normally satisfied as four, satisfied, uh, okay as three, like that. Okay, here I am naming a variable phi as highly satisfied. Same time, phi to four is have some difference, right? That is some kind of difference, which is not measurable. Okay, initially we are only naming the thing. There is no order. One or two doesn't matter. Even two and one are the same uh, same impact. Here, if I am plotting four, I am choosing over phi, I am choosing four. So there is some differences there. If you are using such kind of data, it is called an ordinal scale. Okay. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, interval scale, interval scale here, we are also not only naming the variable, but also the difference is known. Let us discuss about the ordinal scale. In ordinal scale, I'm, say, I'm saying that 
highly satisfied uh, satisfied okay not satisfied highly disappointed in this case uh, 4 and 5 does not have much difference we don't know the difference between 4 and 5 but whereas here in the interval scale we have the difference suppose if i'm asking you to rate uh, my experience from 1 to 5 1 2 3 4 5 means here we can understand the difference i prefer 1 means it is extraordinary 2 means maybe it may not be that good so in interval scale what we are doing is we are not only using the variable to name it we are not only using uh, labeling the variable in the numerical scale but also we are using to find the difference in the ordinal scale we are using 1 2 3 to express the non mathematical ideas such as expressions whereas here if we are talking about the points uh, one way is the first rank, two way second rank. It is not mathematical, so you can express it. In such situation, we can use nominal scale as well as where we can able to calculate the difference between the variables is known as interval scale. Suppose when it talks about uh, ratio scale, in the ratio scale, we are not only naming the variables, but also make the difference between them, but also the information where zero is possible. Okay. So I'll, uh, for example, I will ask you how many uh, uh, times you, you use your mobile in a day. Suppose you are saying 1 to 2. Here we are naming 1 for the first and we know the difference between the 2. 2 to 3. Here we are naming 2 for the second time. 2 to 2, 3 is also we know the difference between 1 and 2, 2 and 3. Like that if you are using, then it is called as uh, ratio scale. Let me make it as very simple. Nominal scale is a category variable scale. Par uh, we are using one or two for simply labeling the variable. It is quantitative variable of order. This is the first case. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to give an example for this, suppose I am asking uh, which type of smartphone you would prefer. You are preferring whether Apple or Samsung or OnePlus. Suppose I am calling Apple as one, Samsung as two, OnePlus as four, Redmi as five. Here, one means it is just a number to represent Apple. Two means it is a number to represent uh, Redmi. 3 means it is just a number represents Samsung. So there is no much difference. That's the first thing. Generally, these types of uh, ordinal scale will be used in survey questions where we are giving a, a what to say, a, a kind of uh, one to one answers, okay? Open ended questions. The researcher is supposed to pick one from those things. It's a kind of multiple uh, questions also. The other best example is male, male, female. Then your uh, political. Uh, 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 idea whether it is uh, conventional or uh, your communist or your belongs to a particular party or your capitalist like that okay it also depends upon the geospace where you're living you're coming from a village town or metro if i'm giving one it may be village two means metro three may be uh, a town something like that so if you are having data in such a way it is called as nominal scale where there is no ordering whereas in the ordinal scale the variables are measured uh, to order. One means one is superior than two. But the point is we are not understanding. We are not in the position to difference between the each variable. I will tell you a small example for this. For example, if you are calling very satisfied as one, uh, satisfied as two, neutral as three, unsatisfied as four, and very much disappointed as five. Here, one, two, three means it's not only ordering. It also express uh uh the importance of the thing but we don't know how the difference between highly satisfied and not satisfied will be measured okay we, we just simply ordered this one means one is superior over two but not the exact difference between one and two okay uh for example uh when it talks about uh interval scale uh, i can tell you an example that may be the best example you can use interval scale uh in the situation where suppose you are using uh, temperatures suppose you are using one as 80 degree so let me call it as 70 degree 50 degree or 60 degree you know that eight, 70 degree is higher than 50 degree and there is a difference between these two as 20 right suppose you are calling uh, 70 degree and 40 degree you know the difference is 30 when you are using interval scale the point is here even though zero is available it has its own value because negative values also have its own toll uh, minus 1 to 0 is you know the value minus 1 to 4 you know the value so 0 plays an important role here okay 0 is 
uh, is also you know, taken as a value because zero degree Celsius means that is no weather change. Zero degree Celsius means something. Okay, is it clear, guys? Am I with you or what? I'm keep on talking. I don't know how many of you are going to follow. Yes, sir. Uh, or you would understand uh, the question who asked uh, regarding interval scale. Just imagine uh, the temperature. Okay, you are talking about today temperature is 26. Tomorrow temperature is 30. Okay, so 26 is a numeric, but you know the difference between 26 and 24. There is a difference. Suppose you are calling zero degree Celsius means zero is not a non-value. Zero degree Celsius means it is also has some value because here in the interval scale we are also taken into the negative signs also. When we talk about uh, uh, ratio scale, I will tell you a small example. Example is better. Uh, here we are not only uh, order the variable, but also make the difference between the variables along with the information. We are also ordering the variable. We know the uh, difference between the variable along with the information. Suppose if I am asking you, uh, what is your uh, uh, current height? You may say less than five feet, five feet to six, uh, five and a half feet, five and a half feet to six feet. In this case, I call one as less than five feet, two as five feet to uh, six feet, three as five point five to six feet. Here, what I'm doing is I'm naming one. Uh, I'm just simply naming the variable. Meantime, I know the difference between one and two. Meantime, also I also having the information content. If you are having such a variable, then it is called as ratio scale. If you want to make it in a very simple way, most of the time series variable, financial variable, or end up with interval and ratio scales only. Okay, you not only name the variable but also know the difference. Suppose your income is twenty thousand this month, next month it is going to be twenty five thousand. Means if you are calling twenty thousand as one and twenty five thousand as two, you know the difference. At the same time you are valuing the number also. Okay, this is an idea. The clear guys. I'm not very sure how many of you are able to catch up this. Okay, so uh, let me talk about uh, the. Is my screen is visible, guys? No, right? No, sir, it's not visible. Just a minute. We saw, we discussed some uh, uh, different tests for uh, parametric and non-parametric. Non Let me uh, give you a small, what happened? There are some technical issues. How many of you know about SPSS? Any idea? Did you work on that? Do you know the software? Guys? Yesterday. What? So oh, I'm not able to hear your voice because it's very low. I'm, I open a lot of programs, so it's become uh, very slow. System is getting slow. Is my screen is visible, guys? Yes, sir. No, it's visible. Let me keep it as minimal because uh, the system is getting slow. See, uh, we discuss about few tests, right? Uh, when we have one sample, we are talking about a simple t test for a parametric. If it is uh, uh, not satisfying the condition of normality, we are talking about Wilcoxon test, right? It is also called a sign test. So I will tell you how to estimate this test. Let me uh, show you some kind of testing procedures for simple t test, PAT sample t test, and PAT t test. And I know I'm not going to discuss space and correlation. The same way I'm, I'm discussing Wilcoxon test and other things. For this, I will show you uh, uh, the estimation process in Word. For this, I will try to show you in SPSS. Just a minute. Is 
my screen is visible, guys? No. Right? Yes, sir, it's visible. No, actually, I want to. PPT you. is visible. No, I just want to show you other things. Just, just a minute. So just, uh, just make a note of this because if I want to share other screen, I think I want to close this. Let me see how it is possible. What? There's so many guys. Something is happening here. Loading. Oh, oh. Okay, let me close this. I will share that. Just keep remembering these names, okay? Simple t test, part t test. Okay. Uh, so, uh, how many of you know about SPSS? How many of you know about SPSS? Did you work on it? No, right? No, sir. Okay. I am from other department. I am not from management. Oh, no problem. Let me share a thing one more time. Okay, let, let me just uh, give you a view of SPSS, then I can uh, come to the things, right? So, this is a software. It is called a statistical package for social sciences. Okay, is it the screen is visible, guys? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, actually, I'll just, SPSS is a, is a kind of ocean, okay? You can do a lot of things, lots and lot of things here, uh, but I will tell you how to get the data and the very basic thing of SPSS, okay? If you open a SPSS thing, you can have two things. One is data view, another one is variable view. Are you able to see this? The left corner. One is data view, another one is variable view, okay? This data view will give you what type of data we're using. This is the ID number. Suppose you have a data of, say, some 20 observations regarding the gender, age, education, their salary, and their advertisement preferences. Uh, we are going to use this data, okay? So in SPSS, we have two things. One is data view, another one is variable view, okay? This is this software is a little expensive, but you can uh, uh, get uh, uh, the pirated version, okay? So it doesn't matter. So in SPSS, we have two things. One is data view, uh, variable view. So in data view, uh, let me show you uh, a very basic file. I already have a data. This is the problem because of uh, this package is getting very slow. This is a little old system, so it is not loading properly. So let me open a new data. If you open any new data, automatically this syntax will open. There is a syntax called output. It will be automatically open. Okay. If you open a new data, it will be the output window will be automatically open on the other side. So we have two things. One is data view, other one is variable view. First, what you have to do is you have to name your variable. Suppose if I'm going to use uh, a variable called age, let me type it as name age, okay? Then I'm going to say education, okay? So you just here, just look at here. If I type the thing, rest of the things are filled. But you have to decide what type of variable it is. Suppose I'm talking about uh, gender, look at here. You have different types of variables. You can declare your variable age as a numeric, comma, dot, scientific notion, date, dollar, custom currency, string, whatever it may be. We give string, it will take both the forms, both uh, numeric as well as characters will be taken. If you give numeric, it will take only the numeric value. If you give uh, string, it will take both numeric and characteristics. Since the age is going to be numeric, I'm giving numeric, okay? 
whatever you type here, the next moment, the declaration will come here. This width will talk about how many data observations you are going to use. Suppose you are going to use eight means, it will take eight numeric values. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to eight values it will take. Decimal points two means, it will take two decimal points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, point zero, zero. Not more than that it will take. You can reduce this width also to whatever numbers. If you think that uh, we're going to use the age, more than three is not possible, right? Nobody is going to live thousand years. There is no four digit number. You can use three digit number. What about education? Education also we're going to label it one, two or three. So better we can uh, go with say some four digits. Not even four is very high. So you can go with three digits. Gender, one or two only. We're going to, we can't use new uh, uh, characteristics in the estimation, you have to convert the characters into numbers, then only you can use it. Gender may be one or two or three, maybe one may be male, two may be female, three may be transgender. So I can use three variables. Decimal points is not required here, so I can keep it as zero, okay? Because the age, we can't call it as 0 0.01. Education also, I can call it as 0 0.01, right? Values, uh, I don't want to go this, for this, we need a separate session for SPSS. This is the basic thing. You can declare what you are supposed to do for uh, missing values, columns, how your data is supposed to be aligned. Suppose you align left or right or something. Let me keep it as one is left, another one is center to make you understand. Measure, you have to declare whether your variable is scaling variable or ordinal variable or nominal variable. We discuss about this. If you give scale, it will take ratio and interval scale. Okay. If you give uh, age means it's going to be a number, right? It is not going to be a, any ordered value or a nominal value. If you are giving ordinal for education, if you are using one, means uh, the educational qualification, what you are giving one is superior than two. If you are giving two, education value giving two is superior than three. Okay, that is what I'm giving ordinal scale. Gender, uh, gender is going to be nominal. Why? Because I'm using only one or two. One is not uh, superior than two, two is not superior than one. Or even understand, for this you have to understand the scaling measurements. Let me come back to this norm label. I typed everything here. Look at the data view. It says education, gender, everything is given. I have to give, uh, I can give only eight values here, not more than that. So for example, I can give age of the, look at here, I can't able to type. Okay, I think they make a modification. Initially, we can't type more than eight points. If you look at the thing, you can't give space here also. See, I can't give space here. It won't take it up. Look at here, variable contains illegal character. But I want the variable must be shown fully in the results. Then I can I can type age of the respondent here. This label will be displayed in the results. Age of the respondent. Look at here, it will take everything. Education of the respondent. Gender of the respondent. Do you have any session on SPSS? Guys? Do we or do you or you have any session on SPSS? Yesterday we have sir. had a session, sir. So you know all the things, right? If you know, I don't want to waste my time. Correlation. Sir. Correlation. Hello. Somebody can respond. Right? Sir, yesterday Mahalashmi ma'am. Taking, uh, no, you know all these things, right? You know all these things, right? No, sir. She was discussing about like correlation and other things, little bit advanced level, sir. For beginners, I think uh, this would be very useful, sir, if we continue. Okay. This is how we have to feed the data here, okay? Because I don't know, without feeding the data, how can you discuss all those things? Once you feed the data, this is going to be your, your variable view. If you click variable view, you can see how many variables you are having. If you click data view, you can see the data. Suppose I'm saying uh, 25... 34, 56, 78, 87, 34, 2. Oh, it's not working. Loading very slow. Okay, already typed. Now only it's loading here. 23. Education. Uh, let me call it as if one is PhD. 2 is uh, PG and uh, 3 is undergraduation, uh, 5 is illiterate, okay? 
and four may be only schooling. This is the variable. Gender may be one is male, two is female. This is your variable. Look at here. This variable is left aligned. This variable is right aligned. This variable is center aligned. Why? Because I am giving in such a way. I have to give it center aligned. So all the variables become centrally aligned now. Is it clear? So this variable is nothing but what is the nature of this variable? This variable is scaling variable. It may be ratio or interval. This is ordinal means we are ordering it. Education one, if I am giving one means one is superior than two. PH is higher than this thing. Okay. So this is how you have to declare your variables. So let me assume uh, we have a variable, variable set. So suppose if you want to do any analysis here, let us assume we have a sample here. What you can do is there are two important parts here for your analysis. One is transformation, another one is analysis. Let us assume you know the transformation part. Let me tell you how to do analysis. You might have discussed about correlation and regression yesterday, right? So if you want to do any analysis, if it's a non-parametric test, you have to go here, non-parametric test, okay? If you want to do uh, any parametric test, you can do here. Means, uh, I, this is a time for you to remember your PPT. I show you simple t-test, right? Two sample dependent tests, two sample independent t-tests, all tests will be available here. One sample t-test, independent sample t-test, pair sample t-test. If whatever test you want to estimate, you can click this and you can do the analysis. Or even understand, you have a data, what you're supposed to do, if the data is stationary, sorry, stationary is the other word, if the data is satisfying the condition of normality, you know that the data is normal, then you can go for uh, uh, parametric test. What are the parametric tests are available? You can go for one sample mean test, one sample t test, independent sample t test, pair sample, pair sample t test, and one way ANOVA. We know the rest of the models. I show you the slides, right? So how to do this test? For that only, I'm going to share this material. Are you able to see my screen? No. Is it clear? Are you seeing a... No, it's only... Yes, a, it is no, you are seeing a species, right? I just want to share one more screen. Chat. Okay, so how to do this one way sample tree test? Let me make it a little quicker. What is the purpose of one way sample test? The one way sample test, which is nothing but your uh, parametric test, will tell you to check whether uh, the null hypothesis is satisfied or not. What is the procedure of one way sample test? is? you have a certain value in your mind. For example, uh, let us assume a person, a, a bulk producer, electrical bulk producer, or uh, a generator producer. Okay, otherwise, let's make this example. It may be very easy for you to follow. Let us assume a laptop manufacturer produce, uh, a, a, a manufacturer who produce laptop claims that the battery of his laptop will sustain for two hours. Okay, that is his claim. The person who produces a laptop, let us assume uh, HP or Lenovo, they claim that the battery backup for the laptop is two hours. Okay, so, but as a researcher, you want to check whether really that battery will sustain for two hours. What you're doing is, you pick some 20, 50 laptops, you check uh, the sustainability of the battery, and you want to uh, check whether the, dat the battery is sustained for two hours or what. So what you're supposed to do is, you have to, create a null hypothesis stating that the battery will not last for two hours. Then you have to check it. What is the mean uh, claim made by the producer? He say two hours, right? You pick some 50 laptops. You uh, recorded how much hours of battery backup each and laptop is having. Then you are going to check whether the claim of the producer is right or wrong. So that is the idea here in one sample t-test. Okay. These are the very basic things. Uh, one sample t-test compares the mean of the sample known value to the known value of the population. What does population mean? 
this is nothing but the population mean is nothing but the claim by the producer he say that two hours backup that is the population mean so what a sample mean you are going to pick some 20 laptops you are going to check uh, this battery backup and you are going to compare these two things right so what is the different analyze for this year there is no significant difference between sample mean and population mean which means that uh, the uh, your battery backup of 20 uh, laptops is sustained for two hours so how to do that first thing is you have to go to analysis okay this part you have to go to analysis then you can see compare means one sample t test right i already pick you something i will show you that one sample t test means it will ask what actually, actually we don't have groups here that is what i'm not able to show this is the process the same process i'm showing here so what you are supposed to do is you have to go to analysis compare means one sample two test you can get two windows so here i am having the variables average monthly bill okay uh uh yeah i'm having uh the average monthly bill the, the producers claims that look, look at this the monthly uh minutes average monthly minutes is 200 that is what the population mean the producers claim that 200 hours he can uh, his battery can survive so what i'm doing is this variable is average monthly minutes this is nothing but the value of all the 20 observations and just click it this is the result okay how can we uh, accept and reject the analysis hypothesis it is based on this value if the computer t value is higher than the table value we reject the null of the computer t value is less than the table value we can accept the null what is the mean value the mean value of all this 20 observation is 162 but what is the claim by the producer it is 200 so what will happen which means that we have to suppose to reject the null which means that your laptop is not lasting for 20 hours sorry your laptop is not working for 2 hours okay according to the the 20 laptops what we check will not working for 2 hours it is less than that so there is a significant difference between two means population mean and sample mean this is how we have to interpret okay this is for one sample test how can we check independent sample t test this is what i show you in parametric test what is independent sample t test is we have two groups for the same let us assume the same example uh linova and hp what we do is we pick the battery backup of linova we pick the battery backup of uh, uh, hp and we are comparing the difference between these two whether is there is any significant difference between these two or if you are interested to study such kind of analysis you are supposed to check independent sample t test okay uh look at the third point independent sample t test assume that two samples are independent of each other each sample are independent from each other okay it's both of them coming from a different population okay so what you are supposed to do is the same procedure you have to go here analysis comparing means look at here now you have to select independent sample t test initially you are selecting one sample t test here you have to select independent sample t test i don't have any solid data for this that is what i am not able to show you i'm just rushing up for any questions i will show you then you have to declare what is the grouping variable which variable you have to classify those data i am not having uh, so my grouping variable is gender here i want to check whether uh, what is my uh, objective here look at here so i i just going to check whether any gender differences in the laptop here i'm suppose you have 50 observations i can call if the laptop is belong to lenovo i can call it as 1 if the laptop is belong to hp i'll call it as 2 okay so i'm going to classify in this example what we are going to say is whether any differentiations is happening income with respect to gender whether the male is earning higher than the female that is what this data is all about in the laptop example if i'm calling 1 then it is means uh, lenovo if i'm calling 2 it is going to be hp so i am classifying the battery hours with respect to linova as well as hp once i do that i can get these results okay so uh, what is the mean value of female here it is 1.60 what is the mean value of female income it is 1.63 so there is a difference between these two what is our null hypothesis the null hypothesis stating that 
the mean of two groups are significant, not significantly different, which means that there is no difference between these two groups. We have to accept or reject based on this level of significance, uh, the standard error. So if you look at this thing, we can find that the mean value of uh, female is 1.60, the female value is 1.63. So obviously that is going to be uh, a difference, even though look at, the, uh, there are certain indicators, parameters, you have to understand while interpreting the results. For these parameters can be uh, teach, uh, taught you when you are talking about inferences statuses. We can make uh, conclusions based on three factors, standard errors and uh, level of significance. So look at the standard errors. By looking at the standard errors and p-values, we can conclude that there is a uh, uh, there is no much uh, uh, difference between these two things. It's uh, what is the statistical value? This we have to conclude based on this. If this value lies between uh, 0 0.005 to 0 0.010 or 0 0.002 to 0.10, we can reject the null. If, let me make it very clear. If this significant two statistics equal variance is not assumed is greater than 0 0.10 you can uh you can accept the null if it is uh, look at this value if the this value is 5.81 is greater than 0 0.05 you can accept the null if this value is less than this value we can reject the null so this 5.81 is uh, this 5.81 what is the p value yeah, you just take this two value. It is greater than 0 0.05. So we have to accept the null hypothesis of no significant difference between two values. Let me make it very clear. We have to accept or reject null based on the p value, this value. If this value is greater than 0 0.05, you can accept the null. Okay. If this value is less than the 0 0.05, you have to reject the null. This value is 0. Uh, 0.58 is greater than 0 0.05. So we are accepting the null of no differences. So what is part T test? See, you have to understand the part T test. What is mean by pairing? I'll tell you a small example. Uh, part test is nothing but a test which will applicable to the samples which is of time from the same group okay let me tell you suppose uh, there are 40 people in our commerce department okay i pick a group of sample say 10 people then again i pick another group of sample say 10 people so here the population is 40 i have one sample which is 10 again i pick the sample uh, which is called a sample two again i have two samples so if I apply t-test, I, I want to check if there is any difference between this sample, which is obtained from the same population, then it is called as pad test. Is it clear, guys? I have a population. I pick two different samples. I'm going to check if there is any differences is available between these two samples. I'm picking 10 people from the commerce department. Again, I pick uh, another 10 people from the commerce department. I'm checking if there is any difference in their scores. Okay, if I'm doing such analysis, it's called as pad t test. The condition for this thing is we have to uh, obtain sample from the same group. Okay, is it clear? So how to do that? The same thing with other modification. Everything is available here. Go to analysis. Compare means pad sample test. So when you are supposed to use one time one sample tree test, you know the population mean. You want to check whether the population mean is correct or not. In that case, you have to use one sample tree test. Independent sample tree test is you having uh, two different groups. You want to compare uh, whether uh, the samples obtained from different populations have any differences if you are going to do so then you can use independent sample t test if you want to check if there is any difference exist within the sample which is collected from the same population then you can apply pad simple pad sample t test 
forget about the estimation process just understand when you are supposed to apply which test i will repeat it again even if you understand this that is fine suppose you know the population mean you want to check whether the population mean is differ from the sample mean then you can apply one sample t test where you know the population mean the second test independent sample test you can apply to the situation where the samples are obtained from two different groups okay two different population for example i pick a sample from commerce department i pick the sample from tamil department tamil department is a different population commerce department is a different population if i am comparing the scores of these two people then i have to apply independent sample t test the third case part sample t test i pick a i pick a group from uh, commerce department which is called the sample 1 i pick the another group from commerce department which is called a sample 2 if i compare uh, is there is any difference in the score between these two groups then it is called as part sample t test is it clear so the method of estimation all depends upon your objective and mean right is it clear guys any questions as of now guys students okay so discussion part i think uh, don't help just leave that part this, this is the test we are supposed to use so as i told you for each and every parametric test there is a counter part of non parametric test is available right that is what i told you if there is a parametric test you have a counter parametric test what are those things suppose if you are having one sample t test too many windows it took some time suppose you are having a uh parametric tools like if you are if you want to estimate independent sample test okay if the sample is satisfying the condition of normality you can go for independent uh sample test suppose if the variable is not satisfying this condition then what you are supposed to do is you have to estimate actually this is this is there is a spelling error it is called as man bentley u, u test or you have to see the screen in the parametric tool if you are going to check whether the sample obtained from two different sam, uh, two different population is having any difference or what okay first thing is you have to check the normality condition of each population if the normality condition is not satisfied you are not supposed to apply the independent sample t test because it is parametric in nature so you have to think about non parametric test right or even understand there are two populations like let us go for our own example tamil department and commerce department i pick some students 10 samples from tamil department 10 samples from commerce department i am just going to check if there is any difference in the scores okay before testing this i have to check the normality conditions of both the departments if i check the normality condition of both the population there is no normality normality is not satisfied if that is the case i can't use any parametric tool i can't use independent sample test so in that situation i have to think about non parametric test what is the counterpart of independent sample t test it is nothing but man man mentally's u test is it clear so instead of applying independent sample t test i have to think about man mentally's u test so let me uh, i'm going to discuss only these two parts uh, not crucial values and fitment because uh, it is coming under anova those who will teach you anova they will uh, cover that part i'm not going to touch that so suppose you are going to check uh with uh, one simple test as like uh, you know the population mean okay you want to check whether the population mean is correct or wrong in that situation if you are uh, testing the normality of the variable and found that there is no normality then what what you can do if the if the variable is satisfying the condition of normality then you can apply simple t test but now the variable is not satisfying the condition of normality then what is the other uh, parallel test is available in non parametric test you have to use wilcoxon test let me repeat it again you know the population mean okay 
you want to check whether the population mean is uh, is uh, having any difference with the sample mean okay you pick a sample okay before applying the test you check the uh, normality properties of the population then you understand that the normality property is not satisfied it is not normal if that is the case you can't apply any parametric test if the normality condition is satisfied then you can simply apply simple t test but the problem is the data is not normal it is not satisfying the condition then what do you then what are you supposed to do you have to think about the parallel the counterpart non parametric test which is available in the non parametric models what is the counter test available for simple t test in non parametric model it is wilcoxon test for one sample okay is it clear suppose you are using uh, two dependent sample method where that is nothing but part sample method you have a group let me tell you the same example commerce department i pick two groups i just want to check whether there is any difference in the scoring methods before applying uh, parametric test i have to check the non uh, normality condition the normality condition satisfied i can go for paired sample t test if the non parametric if the normality condition is not satisfied then i have supposed to think about the other model of the non parametric test which is counterpart of parametric test which is nothing but wilcoxon matched pair sign test wilcoxon matched pair sign test okay so let us discuss about wilcoxon test and pair sign test how it's working on so first let me discuss about uh, the science test okay let me show, stop this any questions on this what is the counterpart of chi square test actually chi square test is purely on non parametric okay even though if some conditions are satisfied normality and uh, ordinal and normal values sometimes you may use chi square in this thing also this is a very typical question it depends upon the nature there is no any counterpart for chi square test okay you can use apply the chi square test as it is in, in the rare of the rarest case it will apply for parametric test most probably chi square is non parametric for this okay mohammed did i answer the question yes sir yes sir uh, that's my uh, doubt uh, since long time uh, if we can use uh, the uh, non uh, chi square test when we are uh, when we are, our population is our distribution is normal following normal yeah even even though your distribution is uh, normal uh, uh, that is what it may be because of four reasons you may assume without checking anything you may assume your data may be normal but you have uh, linear uh, actually that is that's what i said it's a very typical situation even though you 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 have to if you want to check this thing you have to clearly check whether the data is uh normal or not otherwise unless until people will assume they will go for it finally i can share your slide a small slide is there it's uh depends upon the time i can share you that will tell you how to use uh chi square that is what i'm not touching that part it is a little complicated uh you can simply assume that you're not supposed to but to, for the sake of understanding i'm saying most probably chi square test will apply only for non non uh, non parametric test only okay there are few questions okay sir okay what is this uh, uh, sir this is bala sharia sir i have one doubt sir yes in the independent sample t test there is a two significant value sir so can you explain it sir so oh, you in the output this one in the independent sample t test there is a two significant value yeah just a minute i'll see the result okay sir okay actually uh, the problem with the spss is it will give you a lot of informations okay if you are going for some sophisticated packages like yes uh, evs and all it won't give this much information uh, i don't know whether you remember this part of our independent t test it also provide one more test levens test for equity of variances what we have to take even though it will give there are two parameters are there equal variance assumed equal variance is not assumed so uh, actually here we are our null hypothesis is we are assuming that both the variables does not have any relationship right that is what our assumption is all about right what is the assumption okay. we are assuming that no relationship so we have to take only equal variance not assumed 
we have to take only this significant value 5.81 if i am right okay then uh, oh. uh, accepting and rejecting null is ba purely based on the p value normally uh, it's called as uh, uh, committing type one error it lies between 0 0.002 to 0 0.10 as a researcher generally what people used to do is they will stick on with 0 0.05 5 percent of level of significance if your significant value is greater than 0 0.05 you can accept the null okay if your uh, significant value is less than 0 0.05 you can reject the null this is one parameter this is one thing meantime you can understand this the same value by looking at the standard errors if the high standard errors then obviously you are supposed to accept the null okay is it clear uh, yes sir so we should take the equal variance not assumed not because our uh, assumption is like that we are assuming like that that is the variance is not equal okay okay right okay. what is our null hypothesis we are assuming that there is no difference between these two things so equal okay. uh, variance are not equal assume. so we should check that uh, p value and we should proceed with that the problem is this uh, package will give you like that if you estimate the same result in state i will give in a different way okay don't uh, try to uh, interpret results based on the packages understand the logic then based on that you can interpret in strata we may have a different uh, interpretations okay this much of results we won't get so we have to interpret those values in a different way okay, okay. One, this is what don't rely on packages computer is a mad machine whatever Sorry, you I was know. a bit confused because there is no say, two significant values so yeah this is what your information i'm saying see okay. what you have to do is you have to understand the logics it is a simply a mad machine whatever number you give it will split now some numbers right we don't know what number it is. Simply we can interpret. But only point is, if you want to be a good researcher, you want to understand the models, you want to understand the tools, how it is functioning. That is what I'm showing you. What is the difference between these two things? How these things are happening? Okay. We have to discuss. Uh, actually, we have to compute the value of p stat for the two two sample types of our own. That is a formula for t x minus mu divided by standard error, standard deviation. You have to compute the mean of the population which is given, and you have to compute the mean of the sample then you have to compute the standard deviations then you have to apply it then only you can understand all those things but machine will give you the number without knowing how the background is functioning we simply interpret the result that is not the fair way okay okay yeah, nowadays it's not uh, we are become so lazy right if you have some 400 observations which took a lot of time so machines will help you but still at the same time you have to equip yourself to understand the results okay, okay. any questions thank you Okay, so uh, I will uh, actually. I'm planning to show you a lot of things. I don't know uh, how much time you are having, whether you are in the position to take it up or not. Okay, uh, let me show you a small thing. Maybe for my satisfaction, at least, I can uh, just a minute. It's become so until so... 1 30, you can handle the session. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, but the problem is my my. System become very slow because of I'm opening uh, the SPSS. It itself consume a lot of RAM. At the same time, I'm connecting through uh, video calls. So just a minute. It's loading. Give me a minute. I'll share you an SPSS file and tell you how to estimate at least one non parametric test. Any questions? Guys? No questions. See, uh, you can, uh, you may not have questions in three situations. One is you understand everything. Second thing is you may not understand everything. Third thing is you thought that you will understand everything. The first two part doesn't matter. You can learn, but the third part is very dangerous. Don't be in the third part. Okay. Don't assume anything. If you don't have, if you don't understand anything, just make it sure you try to catch it up. It's just a minute. It's loading. It's very slow. Uh, sir, I have another question, sir. Yes, please. Uh, so you have said that uh, T value should be compared with uh, some value, the T value. Yes, you are talking about one sample t test, right? 
Oh yes, sir. In that uh, you said that uh, there is a t value. Uh, from that also we can interpret the results. Sir. So how yes. to interpret from the t value? That is what. See, suppose you are using t values. Suppose you are using thirty observations in your sample. Okay. Then there is a table, t value table. Okay. Table values will be given. It is already published. It is based on some Monte Carlo simulations. Those things are available. So once you compute with the help of the formula, you can get the number. If that number is greater than that computed value, as usual, you can accept or reject the value. What is the purpose of simple, say, uh, one sample t-test? The population mean is known. You are going to check whether uh, the sample has the same mean. So what you are doing? You are computing the t-value for the sample uh, t-test and compare those two things with the help of t-standard test. If the computed value is greater than the table value, uh, the computed value. Is the table uh, value will not be known, sir. No, no, it's known. It's published. That is what for t-values. Generally, what we should do is if we greater than 1.96, we can accept or reject. Okay, Oh, okay, okay, okay. Greater than 1.96. That's the value, sir. That is a com. It, that is not a common thing. It's a generally okay. used to like that, but depends upon the sampling, different tech test, it will keep on changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but generally we will take it as 1.96. Generally, accepting or rejecting null is based on 1.96. That is five percent level of significance for this common okay. test. There are certain specific tests for that. They will give the different t values for that. It, you have to reject or accept the null based on those specific values only, not blindly based on uh, simple t-test, right? Okay, sir. So for for the independent sample t-test, it's 1.96. No, uh, that's what I'm saying. Accepting, if you can reject the null at 5% level of significance, if the computer okay. value is greater than 1.96. Okay, okay. That's the standard at 5%. 5% okay. level of significance. If you, are, okay. if, if you want to go for 10% level of significance, then uh, the number may be different. Okay? Oh, okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, now I will tell you a very interesting test. Okay, let me show you. Uh, is my SPSS file is visible, right? Now I'm going to talk about a test called as uh, uh, Wilcoxon test. This is a test uh, for, uh, uh, it is a parallel test for uh, part sample t test. Suppose you want to. Uh, you have a sample, you have a sample which is obtained from uh, a group, a population. If there is a population, you have obtained two samples and you are going to compare if there is any difference between these two samples. So before proceeding further, you know the procedure, right? You have to check the normality. If the series is, if the sample is normal, then you can go for par sample t test. If it is not normal, you are not in the position to, you are not supposed to apply parametric test. You have to think about non parametric test. The non parametric test for uh, such a two dependent sample is Wilcoxon matched pair sign test. I'm going to tell you this model. What's the question? Just a minute, somebody is asking some question. One point nine six one sample t test and zero point zero five. No, no, no. See, uh, both the numbers are same. One point nine six and zero point zero zero point zero five is nothing but the probability value. It is nothing but the chance of committing type one error. Do you know what is type one error and type two error? All of you, just respond because I'm not able to see anyone's face because my PPT is wrong. Do you know what is the type order and type two error? Okay, anyhow, let me explain that in a very simple way. Suppose the type order is an error, you are committing, you are rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. Okay. Type two error is the error you are committing when the when, when you are accepting the null hypothesis when it is correct. Or you would understand. Type one error is the error, you are rejecting the null when it is correct. Okay. Type 2 error is error, you are accepting the null, it is wrong. So, uh, what is the probability value is that? You, this is purely based on observations, right? So, what it is saying is that 0 0.05 means out of 100 times, the chance of committing type 1 error, which means that chance of accepting the wrong hypothesis is only 5 percentage. Is it clear? Guys, let me repeat it again. We are checking the difference between two variables. We have Observation that there is no difference between two groups, two samples. This is our null hypothesis. Okay. What is 0 0.05 is that it is a probability value of committing type 1 error. What is type 1 error? 
if i am accepting this hypothesis out of 100 times 95 times i am accepting only the current hypothesis the chance of accepting the wrong hypothesis is only 5% no researcher can claim that their research is 100% correct okay there may be the chance of accepting or rejecting the correct hypothesis by certain amount that is nothing but p value what is 0.05 0.05 is nothing but out of 100 times only 5% of the times you may commit the error of type one okay that is what the probability value one 1.96 is that accepting or rejecting null okay if 0.05 means automatically it will follows if uh, your p value follows means this at 1.96 is nothing but the calculated table value of your t statistics okay if uh, it may not be it may not go in contra if you have 0.05 obviously your value will be greater than 1.96 okay it never go in opposite direction right any more questions okay let me make it little faster so as i said uh, uh, you are having a uh, samples two samples obtained on the same population which is uh, non which is not satisfying the condition of normality so you are not in the position to apply parametric test so you have to think about non parametric test for a, a non parametric test available for such uh, type of sample is nothing but pill coxen matched pair sign test it is also called as pair sign test that is what we are going to discuss now right so uh, let me are you able to see this excel file you are, are able to see this right spss file we have an id we have a gender age group let me see what are the, those variables i am having a uh, gender look at here i am calling uh, zero as female one as male okay this is what called as values i can declare the value why if suppose if I, the, my value is female instead of typing it as female i can use it as zero if it is male i can call it as one okay this is the first case look at the age i am grouping the age if my age lies between 25 to 39 i call it as one okay if my age lies between 40 to 54 then it is called as two if my age lies between 54 and above i can call it as three okay instead of using 1 2 3 4 my age i am i am grouping my age look at this variable this is nominal variable 1 2 3 means there is no superiority here okay look at the education middle school high school and all so i am just keeping the measure the salary look at the salary salary is nothing but purely a matrix form okay so we have to use it in a scale so now i am asking whether uh, uh, uh okay let me explain the situation here what we are going to see is we are having three advertisements okay uh so these people are giving ratings to three advertisements one is a family car one is a youngest car another one is an non uh, friendly car which one is attractive for this group we are going to check whether uh, the rating given to these three cars is depends upon any gender bias or you will understand this sample is collected the rating of three cars first car is uh, family car second car is youngest car third one is enrollment friendly car they are collecting this sample among a group of people which is a mixture of male and female and they are going to check whether the ratings the car received is depends upon any gender bias is it clear or you will understand the question or you will understand the problem guys right? if you are not able to understand the problem there is no point here i will repeat it again we have here uh, we have collected the data which gives you the rating of the cars we have three cars rating of the three cars car 1 car 2 and car 3 car 1 is a family car car 2 is a youngest car third one is a enrollment friendly car i obtained this data from spss site only it's a proved data okay so what this car company is as a researcher what you want to know is whether the ratings given to car 1 or car 2 or car 3 is influenced by any gender okay you want to check whether male giving uh, whether male is giving uh, uh, what ratings to family car uh, what rating to engas car and what ratings to enrollment friendly car the same will applicable for female also this is the point this is your objective okay so i designed my data in such a way 
So when I check the normality properties of this data, it shows that it is not normal. It is uh, not satisfying the condition of non-normality. So I can't apply simple uh, T statistics for this or fat statistics for this. I have to go for uh, I have to go for non-parametric test, something called as Wilcoxon sign rank test. Okay. Let me explain how this Wilcoxon sign test is operating. So look, look at the data view. See what we are supposed to do is I will tell you how this Wilcoxon test is applicable. Uh, first thing is I want you to remember this Wilcoxon test will apply for only for two groups, right? Not three things. We have three cars here A1, A2, and A3. So we can't apply for this. Let us assume only for A1 and A2. So what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to take the rank given to A1 and A2. Okay. That's a testing procedure. What you are supposed to do is you have to uh, you have to uh, take the difference between these groups. You have to take the difference between rank given to car 1 and rank given to car 2. Then you can get the differences. It may be in positive sign and it may be negative sign. These are the technical procedures. Okay. Then once you get the rank, then you have to go for absolute difference. You can you are supposed to take the absolute difference. Means without any sign, you have to take it. Then you have to rank it. Once you rank it, then you can uh, convert the rank into sign. Okay. So I will show you how to do that. That's a procedure. I don't know whether it's possible here or not. Okay. So we are going to apply Wilcoxon test for this data. How to do that? Just go to analysis. Uh, go to non-parametric test. What type of test we are going to use? We are going to use two we are going to use two related sample tests. Why related sample tests? Both the samples are coming from the same population. Go to analysis. Go to analysis, non-parametric test, legacy dialogue. You can go for related samples. Why it is asking this? This is the first time. So okay, it's asked for it. Let's give it a run. So you have to choose the field. What test is you have to choose? You have to compare this two. Let me see the result. Coming up. Actually, we can compute those things. I don't want. Just a minute, there is some problem. If you can suit the sample test, so go to analysis, uh, non parametric test, make a sample test. Look at the results. We are comparing uh, what is the null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis states that actually there is a lot of procedures are behind it. Okay. Uh, suppose you want to compute the mean of the variable, what you used to do? You have the formula x minus x bar divided by n, right? Like that, there is a lot of procedures out there, but unfortunately, I'm not able to present all those things. What is the null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis is that there is no difference between uh, 
see the median difference between rating family car and commercial car there is no difference but reject the null hypothesis means it means that there is a serious difference between uh, the family car and the rating of the cars right suppose you want to check uh, the same thing for the uh, advertisement uh, car 2 and car 3 just go to analysis non parametric test rated sample test instead of family car you can keep it here then you can keep it in the environment car then run it look at here if you look at this the null hypothesis uh, the level of significance is 1.12 uh, so it, which is nothing but the greater than uh, 0.05 so you have to accept the null which means that the median value between the youngster car and commercial ratings car are having no differences people giving the same preferences okay this is how you have to choose i think uh, i make you a lot of trouble so i don't want to trouble you much i can stop here let, let us discuss something maybe a questions kind of thing any questions see uh, let me give let me take some just three minutes or five minutes i can explain you the crux of our uh, three hours lecture it's a very basic a kind of one line cinema story first thing is you have a data okay so you have to choose a test to prove what is the purpose of data why you are having data the idea the idea of the purpose of data is to prove or disprove something okay you have an hypothesis you have a research question you have to check whether the research question have any validation or not so you can write it in hypothesis form and you have to check the hypothesis okay how to do that for checking the hypothesis you have different tests are available okay what are the different types of tests it is non parametric and parametric test so there are some types of parametric tests are available there are some kinds of non parametric tests are available which test to choose it depends upon uh, normality condition and set of assumptions what is the normality condition if your uh, population parameter is following the, the population parameter following the normality assumption which means that if the normality assumption is satisfied then you can think about parametric test if the normality condition is not satisfied then you may think about non parametric test okay there are uh, tests available for different types of sample if you are having only one sample then you can go for simple t test if you are having two sample obtained from the same population then you think about paired sample t test if you are having a uh, two different samples from two different populations then you can think about unpaired t uh, t samples suppose you are having more than two uh, independent sample you can think about one way anova if you are having more than two dependent sample then you think about another kind of anova suppose you want to check the correlation between the variables you can think about uh, spearman uh, pearson correlation these tests are available in parametric test if you can apply these tests only if the data what you are having satisfy the condition of normality let us assume the data what you are having is not satisfying the condition of normality then what's the other option obviously you are pushed to use only non parametric test okay so as i said earlier all the parametric test has its own counterpart in the non parametric test what is the counterpart of uh, simple t test it is nothing but uh, uh, wilcox and test for median what is the counterpart test for uh, uh, two sample uh, dependent test it is nothing but wilcox and runs test what is the sample test for uh, two sample independent test it's man wentley u test okay what is the counterpart for uh, uh pearson correlation it is spearman rank correlation okay you have to apply those things and you have to make the conclusions so what decide whether you can apply parametric and non parametric test is all depends upon the normality and the conditions of some assumptions in between you have to understand what is interval what is uh, nominal what is ordinal on other scales how to choose a model this is what the crux of your entire lecture today any questions dear participants now the session is open to questions if you have any queries kindly feel free to ask i think all the queries are solved so uh, i request one of the participant to share the experience of the session
Okay, sir, it was a very informative session. Sir explained each and every point in detail and all the doubts were uh, cleared with lots of patience. So thank you so much, sir. So on behalf of uh, Department of Commerce and course directors, I would like to thank Balaji, sir, for accepting our invitation and sharing your valuable time and thoughts with us. Thank you, sir. And dear participants, kindly fill the feedback form which is posted in the chat box. And the next session will start sharply at 2.30. Kindly join. Thank you. And have a nice day. Thank you all. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to call contact me anytime. I'm available in the office only because it's a very short time. Uh, even uh, I'm not able to actually, at least we can cover only parametric tests. Uh, since we are in the online mode, there is a lot of technical issues and all. So, anyhow, if, even though if you're not able to catch up anything, feel free to call me anytime or you can come to my office and knock my door at any time. It's always open for us. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir.
Hello. Hello participants, we will start within five minutes.
dear participants are you able to hear me There are fifty six participants. Just check the present to respond. Dear participants, are you able to hear me? Can I get some reply? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Is there any disturbance in the voice? No. Yes. There is some disturbance? No, ma'am. Uh, welcome back to day seven. So uh, yesterday we discussed about the correlation in the session, which is handled by Dr. S. Mahalakshmi Mack, who is assistant professor from Department of Commerce, Central University of Tamil Nadu, and she'll be continuing today on simple and multiple regression. And if time permits, uh, ma'am will be discussing on ANOVA. The main focus of today's will be simple and multiple regression. And I request now ma'am to continue. And sorry for the delay due to some technical reason, it was delayed. We are uh, sorry for that. Thank you. Share the slide. Participant, good afternoon. Uh, sorry for the delay. Really, there is some technical uh, issues from our side. Uh, yeah. Shall we uh, start the session? Any any clarifications or doubts regarding yesterday's session? Uh, participants, uh, uh, please, a few of you, please do respond. No, madam. Any, any doubts? Yeah, shall I proceed? Yeah, ma'am. So yeah, the slide, the slide is visible for you, right? Is it moving? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Right. Okay. So uh, yesterday we uh, we discussed about uh, uh, correlation analysis, and actually uh, one important thing which I have also mentioned that see in case of correlation analysis, you you know the uh, strength of the relationship between two variables or in, uh, sometimes you can use more than two variables in case if it is a partial correlation in case of multiple correlation simultaneously you can you can actually uh, find out the uh, relationship between more than two variables but actually in correlation analysis you know only the uh, strength of the direction of the relationship as well as the strength of the relationship whether it is high or low Suppose if, if the correlation coefficient is zero, then you can actually conclude that there is no relationship between the variables under study. If it is either near to minus one or plus one, if it is close to plus one or minus one, and of course I have just showed you the significance value also. So in your output, you get significance value. You can test the significance of the correlation coefficient. So uh, if it is not significant, then you don't have any correlation. So it is between minus one to plus one. So if it is near to minus one, then you have a very strong negative correlation. So if it is a plus one, you have very strong positive correlation. But you in correlation analysis, you cannot able to find out which particular variable is causing the other variable. So I just uh, gave you a few examples yesterday that sometimes uh, there may be a bidirectional causality between the variables. And, and uh, Okay. Fine. Uh, just a minute, the participants, please. Please stay online. Yes, it's fine. And just stop. Fine. Thank you. So now. Yes, ma'am. And once I'll keep operating. Right? And, uh, oh, oh, oh. 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 Oh
Okay. Uh, sorry for all the uh, just events which have crossed through, so now we have fixed it. Yes. Um, just drop it, I'll just drop it. Just a moment, please. Please stay online for two minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, okay. So in what most of the cases, actually, uh, generally we do uh, would like to find the relationship between two variables and you would like to find the direction of the relationship. And also sometimes if you want to know the determinants of a particular variable, which are the uh, major determinants which is influencing yeah. that particular variable, then yeah. you can use this regression analysis. And sometimes you mm -hmm. do uh, would like to find the effect of one variable on another variable and causation. So oh, then part part part. kind of bidirectional uh, relationship between cause effect relationship between the variables. But uh, apart from that, sometimes you do use uh, a certain you need certain techniques for forecasting your variables. And in this case, your correlation analysis may not help you in actually finding out any of this it will actually help you in identifying the direction of the relationship but you cannot find out the determinants uh, whether a particular variable is a determinant of the other variable whether x is the major determinant of y or not and sometimes you do not know to what extent the change in the x variable is influencing the change in the y variable that also you may not find out with correlation and similarly you do not know whether y is causing x and x is causing y so that is also not possible and forecasting is also not possible with correlation analysis so you have a, a better technique for uh, finding out all these things the answer is your regression analysis and in most of the cases whether it is uh, uh, primary data research or secondary data research or uh, uh, whatever maybe whether you may be from social science background or maybe from economics or even uh, um, science students also sometimes they need regression analysis because in most of the cases we would like to find we would find out the relationship between few variables and also we would like to find out the direction of relationship and the effect of a particular variable on the other variable and we would, we would like to know the determinants of those variables as well sometimes you do use this for forecasting in case of economics and not only in, in case of economics weather forecasting and many other many other methods are there but still these are the projection these are the techniques which generally you do use for projection as well as for modeling as well okay and uh, of course in regression analysis there are few steps uh, generally you need to uh, actually follow first you have to state the hypothesis you have to determine the level of significance the level of significance you have to determine it is based on your research objectives and based on the amount of type one error the level of type one error which you are going to allow and you have to specify the model uh, suppose if I'm very fast, uh, uh, participants, please do uh, in, uh, stop me in between if you if you are unable to uh, follow. And you have to obtain the data, you have to estimate the parameters and test the hypothesis and finally predict and why, what is the reason for this kind of prediction. So, of course, you can take some policy decisions. So, most of the economists, they do use the basic regression. It's not basic regression analysis. The one you, you I think most of the economic students, you know that there is a discipline uh, uh, which is very much related to economics, which is econometrics. So, the entire discipline actually starts with this regression analysis and most of the techniques, the uh, high fi techniques which you are just using in your econometric analysis, the basis is actually regression analysis. So, that I'll just take little elaborately uh, this session and uh, in case if you do not want uh, uh, all those uh, what is that intricacies and the calcula calculation part we are not going to do that but i'll just tell you what are the uh, where parameters which you are going to actually use and you have to interpret it so why i'm just using uh, before uh, showing your analysis why i'm trying to explain all these things is that of course any software you can use and you can run the analysis but the understanding the concepts and understanding uh, what are the parameters which you are using in the model is very, very important when you actually interpret the results. So you will get the same, even it is not necessary that you have to have uh, SPSS. Even with Excel, you can do uh, any kind of analysis. And uh, even Gritter will also give you this uh, almost the same uh, beta value and alpha value and the significance or whatever T, t value you do get. 
Apart from that, you have many other softwares which actually run, but the main uh, issue is that uh, when and where and how you have to apply this particular model in which situation. First one is that I'll just give you some example. The same uh, data actually I have given in your Excel sheet as well. We will run, run that immediately after. Uh, completion of this particular theoretical session. Okay. And see, in case of regression, your variables must be the continuous variable. So you can use the variables which is at interval level or at ratio level. So even um, in the particular data which I have given to you, so we have uh, uh, interval level data. So we, we have actually quantified the level of stress. We have quantified the, uh, are you able to, uh, have you got the uh, revised uh, data sheet? You've got it, right? Participants, you got the revised data. Yesterday you said that uh, there was some. Yeah, yeah, it it was shared in Google and Telegram. Yeah. I just shared, uh, shared the revised data sheet with the uh, coordinators. Have you got it? Yes, madam. Sorry, please. One of you, please rest. Shared in Google Drive. Yes, we got it. Am I audible? Yeah, we got it, madam. You are audible, and we shared the uh, file with the participants through Google Drive. Uh -huh. Okay, shall I continue? Am I audible? I doubt whether. Uh, yes, madam, you are audible. You could able to hear. We can hear you. Please, please do respond. Okay, I, I hope that uh, I hope that you got the revised uh, uh, data. Uh, Gagana, are you online? Gagana? Hello, ma'am. Okay, then I'll. Diana, are you online? Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you, madam. We can Hello? hear you. Oh, you have muted it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. So, in this particular case, actually, uh, I have actually uh, given this particular data also. I have given two or three sheets and in the final last sheet, you will be having the data related to advertisement and uh, uh, sales and we will uh, we will run. So in this particular example, I just showed you some steps. So here, what you need to do is you have to actually state the hypothesis. So based on your understanding, based on uh, some information or maybe based on your intuition also, sometimes you can actually make your own hypothesis because if there is no previous uh, information or if, uh, if it is very new, then uh, out of your own experience, you can actually frame the hypothesis, just an assumption which you are making. So especially in this particular example, and one thing I just told you that the variables needs to be either continuous, uh, continuous variable, it can be either interval level data or it can be ratio level data. So in the example, what, what I have given, so you can use the level of stress and also uh, the overall popping up strategies or you can use the problems which is related to uh, work and the personal problems and the coping up strategies. So everything you can, all, all these three indexes which you can use in your uh, analysis, in your model you can use. So before that, I'll just use one more uh, example here for simple regression. So in case if you want to find the effect of one particular variable, on other variable. So you will be, you need to identify a particular dependent variable and you have to identify one variable as a independent variable. So in this particular example, I have actually given sales and advertisement. So here I just considered sales as a dependent variable and advertisement as an independent variable. So no way, uh, it's other way around. Okay, so in case if I increase my, I increase the advertisement expenditure, obviously the company's sales may increase. So this is, this is actually the, uh, example here and if you want to find out the relationship between these two variables which is x and y then probably you can find out the relationship between these two variables using a simple regression technique.
Any doubts? Okay. Yes. Segment. Sorry? Because segment we What is it? Oh, stack memory. Okay. So, here you can find out a linear. You can find out a linear trend. Sorry? Somebody's saying something? Any doubts? Sorry? Okay. So, uh, shall I continue? Yes, madam. Any issues? Yes, ma'am. Ah, fine. Okay. Thank you. So, I have some technical problem here. That is why. So, in case in between, if you are unable to uh, hear anything, please immediately uh, uh, let me know. Uh, so, you can find a linear trend between these two variables. Fine. Uh, of course. Uh, so, I just I am just stating the hypothesis here. So, here my H naught, which is my null hypothesis, I have stated that the advertisement has no effect on sales, and the alternate hypothesis, advertisement has effect on sales. So, how I test this particular hypothesis? If I want to test this hypothesis, then I need to test whether the beta, of course, you will be calculating beta and alpha. So, beta is the slope. I'll just tell you what is beta and what is alpha and how it has to be calculated. So, in the hypothesis, you need to test whether beta is equal to 0 and beta is not equal to 0. Beta is none other than the slope, okay, the slope of your uh, regression line, basically, okay. So, here, of course, this is, though, though you are just using the sample data, for measuring the effect of one variable and other variable. In this particular case, what you have to do is you have to use a capital B here. Why? Because we are just going to generalize it for the population. See, advertisement and sales data only I'm just using. A particular company's data, maybe for a period of 10 years or maybe for a period of uh, few months, 15 months data if I'm using in order to predict the sales for the next few months. So if that is the case, my intention is not only to measure whether there is in any effect of advertisement expenditure on sales only during the period of the first uh, 15 months. So my intention is not that. My intention is no. My intention is to actually generalize whether sales has an sorry whether advertisement has an effect on sales. So in order to so that in order to generalize. What you have to do is you have to frame the hypothesis. So the generalization which you are actually making that is for the population. So in general, I have to conclude that if the company increases advertisement expenditure, the sales should also increase. Only then I can suggest the company to increase advertisement expenditure in order to increase the sales in future. So that is that should be the objective. So generalization should be the objective, especially in case of most of the uh, uh, research problems. Okay. So now you have to set the level of significance. Of course, you know, uh, yesterday you said that you know what is type 1 and type 2 error. So your level of significance is nothing but how to what extent you're just going to allow the type 1 error. If your alpha is 5 percentage, then you are you are tolerating 5 percent of your type 1 error. Then specify the model. So you have to specify this particular model. So uh, the regression equation, this is a simple regression equation, which is y is equal to alpha plus beta x. So here, I'm just considering sales as the dependent variable. So uh, it can be based on my experience or it can be based on the previous research work, uh, based on um, many other research studies, based on the review of literature. I have just considered sales as a dependent variable in this case. And advertisement expenditure as the independent variable because I know very well that advertisement expenditure will have some kind of influence on sales. It may not be the other way around. Suppose if I have some doubts, then you have to run a two, uh, two set of regression, which is uh, your uh, X on Y as well as on Y on X. You have to consider uh, first Y as the dependent variable. And again, you have to actually replace this X and Y. X as the dependent variable and Y as the independent variable. Okay, so it, it can be X on Y and Y on X in case if you could not differentiate which one is dependent and which one is independent variable. Otherwise, you have one more uh, for advanced technique to find out the causation, which is Granger's causality test. So if we, if we have time, I'll just explain that as well. Okay, so here, of course, you know Y is the dependent variable, which is sales as per our example, and X is the independent variable, which is advertisement expenditure. And you have alpha and beta. 
uh, you have this alpha and beta. Uh, you, you can see the uh, cursor moving here, right? Okay, so this is your alpha. So what is this alpha? This alpha is none other than the alpha and beta are the coefficients of your regression model. And what is alpha? Alpha is just the constant. Beta is nothing but the slope of your regression line. So which actually measures what is the effect of change in X variable towards the change in the Y variable. So it is the marginal effect of advertisement on sales. Suppose if, uh, if the value of beta is 0 0.5, for example, uh, after calculating, if you get the value of beta is 0 0.5. So how do I interpret? So if there is a one unit change in my advertisement expenditure, then there will be a 0.5 unit change in the Y variable. Suppose if beta is two, if beta is 2, then you have to interpret that if there is a 1 unit change in the advertisement expenditure, then sales will change to the extent of 2 units. So here, just, here I am just mentioning it as units because I do not know whether uh, the actual data is in similar units. Sometimes you do have GDP, you do have an index. It can be a uh, real effective exchange rate or it can be index of industrial production, anything. So I have to actually measure in terms of units. Suppose if you want to measure it in terms of uh, percentage, you have to convert the actual data into its log form. So in Excel, you have a function uh, which is called this natural log. So is equal to ln and in brackets, you have to give the data so you can transform the entire data into its log form. And instead of your actual y, so you have to use this log y and log x and you have to run the regression. So finally, whatever uh, results you are getting, so you can interpret your beta in terms of percentage. Suppose if it is 0.5, then you can interpret uh, beta as if there is a 1% increase in your advertisement expenditure, then sales increases to the extent of 0.5 percentage. Suppose if your beta is 2, which means that if there is a 1% increase in your advertisement expenditure, then your sales increases to the extent of 2 percentage. So what is the extent of change in your Y with respect to 1% or 1 unit change in your X variable? So that will be captured by your beta. Then what is this alpha? So keeping all other things constant, see, even if there is no change in the advertisement expenditure or uh, if you have some other variable also, there is no change in the company's policy uh, and nothing, no change in the price, etc., price of substitutes and price of complementary products and anything. If there is no change, will sales change or not? Even if there is no change in any other variables, but still there may be some change in the sales. So keeping all other things constant, if there is a uh, change in sales by itself, so it will be captured by the alpha. Okay, so, so that it's considered as constant. Okay, and uh, yeah, of course. So in this particular equation, you have one more term, which is E. So which is called as the error term. So error term doesn't mean that it's a mistake. It is just an unexplained term. So here I have two variables, one is sales and advertisement expenditure. I have not included any other variable in this particular model. Uh, uh, can I conclude that only advertisement expenditure uh, will influence sales? Certainly not. So there may be many other variables, especially the price of the product, the price of the particular commodity which I'm going to sell will have an influence on the future sales. And apart from that, it is not only the price of this product, the price of the substitutes, the price of the complementary products, uh, many other things, the tax, government tax rate, and then the per capita income, even your COVID effect, it's, it's just a black swan situation. So we, we never had such kind of situation previously. It's a very new uh, situation which we have encountered now in this particular, uh, in, during our lifetime especially. So of course, this, uh, this pandemic also has affected sales but i have used only advertisement expenditure in this model so why i have used advertisement expenditure in, in this particular model i must know whether advertisement expenditure is useful or not because the company is spending too much of money on advertisement expenditure so uh, if the company keeps on uh, keep on spending advertisement expenditure that much that, that must have a real effect on sales otherwise it's a sheer waste of time it's, it's an additional cost for the company the company can cut down the cost of advertisement so that is the decision made which the company has to take so for that we are actually considering advertisement expenditure but i have not included any other variable i'm just looking at only the advertisement expenditure but the influence of the remaining variables or the unknown variables will be captured in your error term so this error term is not a mistake it is just an unexplained term okay so whatever whatever changes in y 
has not been explained by x will be captured in your error term okay so constant is none other than keeping all other remaining variables constant if there is a change in the y variable by itself then it will be captured by your alpha and the beta it is called as the slope of your regression line so this beta will explain what is the extent of change in y variable with respect to one unit change in the x variable and this error term is none other than it's an unexplained uh, term unexplained variance basically so the change in the uh, y variable which is not explained by this model will be captured especially in the error term uh, it can be consumer demand or packaging or it can be price anything any, anything maybe okay so uh, i just don't want to explain all this so this is just a uh, the equation simultaneous equation which you can use to solve your alpha and beta so you do get your if you simultaneously solve this uh, equation you will get the value of alpha and beta. So after getting the alpha value of alpha and beta, what you need to do is you have to actually calculate the y hat. Y hat is none other than it is the estimate. Now I got alpha and beta. I, I know the beta value, but I do not know whether my beta value is significant or not. And not only that, I do not know to what extent, to what extent the change in the uh, y variable is actually explained by this model. I do not know the expl explanatory power of this particular model. For that, I have to calculate the coefficient of determination, which is the R square. Okay, so in order to calculate the R square, I must know the difference between the actual data and the estimated data. So this y hat is none other than the estimated data. So how do I calculate this estimated data? So by solving these two equations, I can get the alpha value and beta value. So by substituting this alpha value, beta value, and the whatever the actual x value which is there in the uh, data sheet, if you substitute it, you will get the y hat, which is none other than it is an estimate. So y is the y is your actual data, and y hat is the estimate. So you will be actually estimating estimating the data actually which you have. Uh, I'll just tell you one thing. Suppose in this particular case of sales, you have 20 months data. Okay. And using this equation, you have calculated alpha and beta and you know you have the x values. Using By substituting this x values, you will get a y hat, which is the estimate of y from month 1 to month 15. Again. Uh, then uh, somebody may think that, uh, of course, I may be a fool of calculating, uh, the estimating the y if I have the actual data. Y should estimate if I have the actual data. I have actual y, I have actual x, using the x and y, now I have calculated alpha and beta. Now, you are by uh, interpreting the beta value, I can actually find out what is the extent of change in y with respect to the change in x. But still, y I need to go for, again, estimating y for the same period where I have, for which I have actual y. It is because you need to find out the difference between the actuals and the estimated data. Uh, uh, could you follow uh, participants? If you have any doubts with this y hat, you please ask me. I'll just stop here. Is it is it clear or a little confusing for you? I think many of you know it, right? Is this alpha and beta values of the actual one or is it of this is, this is using the actual one, actual data, using actual y and x variable, you are calculating the constant and the slope, alpha and beta. After calculating the alpha and beta, again, what you need to do is you have to estimate the y hat. So uh, your spaces will do everything. Okay. So again, you have to estimate why you are in order to estimate only you are just calculating this alpha and beta using the actual data. Okay. So after estimating, what you uh, just one minute, please stay online. I'll just show you how to do it. Uh, are you able to see this board clearly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. This is my y variable and this is my x variable. So y is 2, 4, 6, 10, 8. Okay. And my x is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So after solving this equation, uh, I do get the alpha value of is equal to my alpha is equal to 1. And then it may not be 1.5. 
and beta is equal to uh, or say for example sorry in this case assume that the alpha is 10 i've not actually calculated it's just an assumption i'm just making beta is equal to 1 okay so now what i have to do is after this i have to estimate the y hat okay so for this you have to cal for calculating your alpha and beta you have to calculate uh, sigma y and sigma x x square etc so all that you can do it so here after that what i said alpha is 10 and beta is equal to 1 so here you have to estimate this y hat by substituting this alpha in the equation so it is uh, y is equal to y hat is equal to alpha plus beta x okay so now alpha is 10 plus beta is 1 into 1 so i will get a y hat value so this will be my first y hat will be some something around 11 here uh next oh i'm sorry yes 10 yes so similarly alpha is 10 plus again uh beta is 1 and uh you have to substitute 2 here similarly in this case you have to substitute all these x values and you will be getting the y hat Okay, now this is my actual y hat value. Now I have to find out the difference between the y and y hat. Suppose if my alpha value is this much, actually you will not get this much. You can you can calculate you, it will be much lesser than this. Okay. See the amount of difference between my actual. Actual is 2, but the estimated value is 11. So you have to calculate the difference between actual and the estimate for each and every year. Suppose if this is uh, month 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, similarly. Suppose if you have 100 data points, if you have 100 days data or 100 uh, sorry, uh, 10 months data or 10 years data, you have to calculate the actual y I do have. Similarly, you have to calculate the estimated y as well. While you are calculating this, is, you will find out the difference between actual and estimates. So, in case if the deviation is too much, that is called as your error term. So, your E is equal to that error term is equal to the difference between your actual y and the estimated y. If the error term is too much, I'm sorry, if the error term is too much, I have to square it then. If the error square is too much or if the error term itself is too much, if there is deviation between your actual y and estimated y, then obviously you cannot use only advertisement expenditure for predicting your future sales. Why I'm going to use, why I need this alpha and beta for predicting it in, in, in the future case. Uh, similarly, even in case of primary data also, I can give you the example. Uh, we were telling about the attitude of uh, Mr. X, A, uh, Mr. Y and Z, right? Mr. A, B, C. So in that particular case, suppose if I want to, if A is the dependent variable, the attitude of A is dependent on the attitude of B, then what I can have to do is, uh, I can actually predict. So, so all these days, he, his attitude was like, like this. In future, what would be his attitude? If you want to predict it for future period, then you can manipulate. So here, what I do is, in case if I in, increase the advertisement expenditure by another 10 percentage, what would be the future sales? That also you can do it. Suppose you are using this alpha and beta. If you want to predict the future sales for the sixth month and seventh month, you do not know the actual why, but you know how much expenditure you can make suppose if you uh, increase the x value by another one unit of units if, if your increase advertisement expenditure to the extent of 10 lakhs and next year if you want to increase this to 12 lakhs then you can forecast actually i don't have the data i don't have the future data i have data up to five months so i don't have data for six month and seventh month okay suppose if i want to predict it now i know how much i can spend that I can plan. In case if advertisement expenditure has very high influence on sales, then what I can do is I can actually increase my adver advertisement expenditure in order to increase my sales. So for that, I must know whether that beta, whether this particular coefficients can be used or not, whether these coefficients are significant in predicting my future sales or not, whether the change in the y variable has been explained properly by my x variables or not all those things i can actually identify identify by by calculating the y hat which is the estimates so otherwise there is no point in calculating the estimated value of the data which you already have 
okay so this is just to compare the actual data and the predicting data uh, actual data and the predicted data to know whether your coefficients to how far your coefficients are uh, perfect enough in predicting your future sales see in this particular case i have shown you two lines one is the dot uh, you have a straight line right so this is your regression line this this regression line is none other than it is your y hat the straight line is your y hat if you plot after getting the y hat value if you plot the data you do get a straight line of this case after that you have to actually plot the actual data the actual data has been given in the blue line you just see how much is the difference between the actuals and the so it is very close in this particular data the difference between the actual and the predicted data predicted data is a straight line actual data is, is slightly it's not a straight line it's in the the blue dotted ones okay so the difference is little lesser in this particular case okay if the difference is lesser then you can actually actually you cannot conclude but you can understand that you can use this particular model for forecasting your sales for a future period uh, is it clear madam yes ma'am uh, oh, yes. but is there any uh, percentage that the uh, variable has to be predicted for considering i'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you that okay. is your r square you have to your r square you have to calculate okay so yeah so all that i'll just leave it so the variation see here there are too much of variation okay so in the, this is the same table but if you draw a normal distribution in this particular case so actually you have to consider the straight line your y hat as your zero at the point in which normal distribution and you have to if you draw a normal distribution of this size and these are the actual data this all these dots are the actual data you know to what extent the actual data is deviated from the predicted one so uh, you can find out the standard deviation and you can find out the variation so in this case what you have to do is you have to calculate the coefficient of determination okay so for calculating the coefficient of determination uh you can use the uh, details which you have calculated using your y hat okay so it's y minus y hat which is your this is your explained variation so y minus y bar is none other than to what extent the actual y values are deviated from its mean okay so y minus y hat is to what extent the actual y is deviated from the predicted y okay so in this case this y minus y hat is the explained variation the model which has actually explained this variation this y minus y bar is the total variation so actually the one minus uh, these two oh, sorry this is the i'm um, sorry which is not explained and the one minus the whole thing is your coefficient of determination so your r square actually tries to uh, explain what is the what is the extent of actually change in y has been explained by your model suppose if the r square say in this particular case r square is 0.95 if you run a regression analysis for the data which i have given you uh, that is in the fourth sheet you will get the value of r square as 0.95 so r square will range between 0 and 1 okay because you are you are just squaring the deviations between your actuals and the predicted value similarly you have to find out the deviation between your actuals and the mean value of the actual y okay so that is the total total variation which is actually explained by the model so and you have to calculate the explained variance and unexplained variance as well and by applying all the things in this particular formula you do get the r square value so if the r square value is 0.95 it means that nearly 95 percent of the variation in the changes in the y variable has been explained by the x variable here the x variable is advertisement so nearly 95 percent of change in the sales has been explained by uh, the change in the advertisement advertisement expenses so in this case suppose 0 0.95 is, is, a, is a very high r square okay so you don't need any other variable suppose if it is 0 0.5 but sometimes you do uh, your beta value may be significant so r square will not tell whether your beta is significant or not r square will tell the coefficient of determination to what extent your y variable is explained by the model okay so if it is only 50 percentage then is it enough uh, to go for prediction if advertisement expenditure explains the changes in the sales to the extent of 50 percentage with that can you take a decision can you take a decision it may not be possible 
okay it may not be possible so what you have to do is you have to include few more variables also suppose if you uh, uh, if you want to actually improve the model if you want to improve the model from 50 percentage which is 0.50 to 0 0.90 90 percent if you want the explanation then you have to add you should not have only advertisement expenditure you need to actually add price of that particular variable and then price of the sub substitutes price of the complementary products and x so your simple regression will not answer so you have to go for multiple regression okay so you have to include more x if you have one y variable and one x variable and if you apply that in the regression model it is called as your simple regression model if you have one y variable and if you have multiple x's if you have x1 x2 x3 n number of x's you can add then you you have to apply a multiple regression model so is it clear madam r square yes 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 fine so now of course even your r square value will not tell you whether your beta is significant or not so in order to test whether your beta is significant sometimes you will have very high r square but the beta value in case of simple regression if the r square is very high you, your beta will also be significant but in case of multiple regression sometimes your r square may be very high but beta may not be significant that may be because of the multicollinearity problem uh, in your model i'll just explain that later while discussing the multiple regression model now after getting uh, the coefficient of determination that is your r square you know that your r square is very high and you know uh, of course uh, the explanatory power of your model the variation uh, in x is uh, is explained by your model to the extent of 95 percentage now you must know whether i can generalize it or not i have to test my beta okay so whether the beta is equal to zero or it is not equal to zero. So here beta measures the significant change in the uh, sales with respect to the change, one unit change in your advertisement expenditure. It, it is nothing but in economics generally we do call it as a marginal effect, a marginal change or a marginal cost and many for everything we do use the marginal uh, term. Okay, so the marginal effect of advertisement on change whether change in the advertisement has any significance on the change in the sales whether it has any significant influence on change in sales so in this case you can actually apply a t statistics to test the hypothesis i just don't want to go into all these calculations i'll just show it uh, but uh, when you do a problem then only you will understand but still uh, for you it is not required i think most of you 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 may not uh, do it manually so first you have to calculate the total standard error of the model after calculating the total standard error of the model, using the total standard error, you have to calculate the standard error for each beta. In case of simple regression model, you will have only one beta. Whereas in case of multiple regression model, you will be having each beta for each variable. Okay, each coefficient for each variable. And you have to substitute in the uh, formula which you are using for calculating the t-statistics, which is beta by your standard error of beta and finally if the calculated t statistics is actually greater than the critical uh, t statistics then you can reject your null hypothesis and you can conclude that advertisement has a significant effect on the changes in sales okay and moreover if the beta is positive you can change that so you can conclude that uh, uh, advertisement expenditure has a, a positive influence on your sales uh, whereas in case of your SPSS output or in uh, any other software output, generally in sometimes few softwares do give critical value, but many of the softwares they don't give critical value, they do give the probability value. Okay, so if the probability value is the probability value of your T statistics is less than 0 0.05. So if you consider the level of significance as 5 percentage, then you can reject your null hypothesis. Or if you set your level of significance as 1 percentage, then if the probability value is actually less than 0 0.01, then you can reject the null hypothesis. Is it clear? Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, fine. Sometimes uh, you do get a p-value like this. You just, uh, I've just explained all this. P-value 5.402191E minus 24, which means that if it is minus 24, uh, before this 5, you have to have 24 zeros. Okay, it is 0, 0.000, so it's highly significant. You can reject your null hypothesis. Sometimes it will be plus 24. If it is plus 24, after this uh, uh, last number, you, you do have uh, nearly 24 zeros. Okay, so you have to be very careful with that while interpreting your p-values. Okay, 
then I'll just skip all this. So, the, so this is the rejection and acceptance region. Um, good. Okay, fine. So after finding out your alpha, we see here I have substituted. This is old data which I have used. Uh, we have just uh, used the quarterly data. And up to 2019, uh, the data has been given. And then after that, for four quarters, the next four quarters, they have just predicted using all this uh, advertisement expenditure. So this is the future advertisement expenditure. If the future advertisement expenditure is nearly 36,000, 37,000, 38,000, 39,000, what would be the future sales? So it has to be substituted. Your alpha alpha in this particular case is 2,724. Beta is 0.24. And so instead of this X, if you substitute first 36,000, the result, your uh, predicted Y, predicted sales for the first quarter is nearly 11,390. For the second quarter, instead of this uh, X, you have to substitute 37,000. For the third quarter, you have to substitute 38,000 instead of X. And then for the fourth quarter, it is 39,000. So you can get the predicted sales. See, in this case, you can see there is an improvement in the company's sales if you actually increase the advertisement expenditure. Okay, suppose if the company wants to increase their sales, uh, it is not necessary that they have to actually change their price because advertisement, uh, the, <coughs> the role of advertisement is much higher according to this example because we have used only advertisement expenditure as your X variable in even then you are getting an R square of something around 0.95. So it is enough if you change your, if you manipulate your advertisement expenditure, then obviously with that you can increase your sales without, without actually reducing the price of the particular product. So this is how uh, regression technique can be used for policy making. Similarly, uh, uh, even uh, GDP or exports or many other uh, things, uh, the government generally they do estimate. If you visit RBA website, uh, you do have actual GDP and they do give some estimates as well for future. How they are projecting the growth, country's growth rate, everything. So it's all based on this particular uh, basic regression. Of course, you have some uh, hybrid and uh, many other uh, uh, models which you can incorporate. They will, they do consider, but still, this is the basic model for which you can actually predict the future GDP based on the past information. You can predict the past uh, future GDP, future exports, exchange rate, your currency, currency value, etc. Whatever it is. So here it depends upon what are the variables which you are going to in include. So you have to include certain meaningful variables for predicting your Y variable. Otherwise, sometimes what happens, uh, they will not use any other variable. Even in case of um, predicting your stock prices, it is enough uh, if you use the past stock prices. So in that case, your X variable is not any other variable. It is just the lag of your Y variable. Okay, the uh, previous days, uh, uh, stock price will actually predict the current stock price because the previous it, it's assumed that the previous date stock price actually captures almost all the market information. So it, it is enough to have the previous day stock price to predict the future stock price. Uh, generally, people who are working on finance, uh, they will you can go for actually some of the auto regression techniques for uh, predicting because you, it's not necessary that you have to have many other many other. Uh, variables in your model. It is enough if you have the lag of your Y variables for predicting the future sales or future, uh, sorry, future stock prices or whatever it is. Even in case of any of the macroeconomic, even uh, suppose uh, if you use primary data also, I just told you, right, this trust, the same example I just give you. So here you have uh, how many variables, level of stress, work related problems, family related problems. And then see, actually the data, the research actually she has done it is just a, uh, 10 years back, a student has done uh, uh, the, a, a simple study on stress. Uh, so she was just a postgraduate student. The actual, day, actual information was the level of stress and the combined uh, uh, causes of stress and then the coping up strategies. But the extra two variables which I, that I have actually, uh, uh, it's a hypothetical data. I have given that data. That is a uh, work related problems as well as the family related problems because uh, that that would be interesting for you, especially while, while doing this kind of analysis and show the and see the results. OK, so here, uh, suppose uh, I'll tell you that uh, suppose if you have my uh, if you're taking one variable stress and coping up strategies. So if you if you know that the coping up strategy is having a negative influence on stress, then what you can do is Suppose if your intention is in future, if, if you are the manager, if you are the HR manager of a particular company, if your intention uh, 
uh, is to reduce the level of stress of your employees. Then what do you have to do? Then how to manipulate? If you manipulate the coping up strategies, you can actually start yoga class in your office, or you can start meditation class in your office, or you can you can actually conduct some kind of uh, sports activity or any get together. Or uh, you, we do have a happiness center here in our institute. They do conduct some programs as well. So all this are reduce the level of stress. Suppose in future, suppose if you want to predict uh, uh, whether the level of stress can be reduced by uh, increasing the coping up. Uh, strategies are indexed, so you can manipulate that. See uh, what you can do is, so you can actually uh, suppose if you increase the number of activities, then you have to actually see what would happen to the coping up index. So once after predicting that, you can use the coping up index in order to predict to what extent the level of stress will get reduced. So that is possible, but a little difficult. <coughs> lot of limitations are there, but still uh, I don't say that it is not possible. Even it is possible in case of primary data, even in case of uh, attitude also uh, you can see uh, sometimes uh, in, in, in some of uh, in, in our families or uh, between friends also, uh, you know that you cannot influence the uh, if, uh, Three of your friends, you you can you know that you cannot influence uh, Mr. A, but you know very well that you can influence Mr. B. But Mr. B can very well influence Mr. A. So what do you do generally is that if you very well know that uh, if the that if you consider you have to you have to actually run a regression by uh, considering Mr. A's attitude, the index of A is attitude as dependent variable and B's attitude as independent variable, and if the uh, beta value is uh, significant, then what you can do is you know very well that you can influence Mr. B. So by my by influencing the attitude of B to what extent the attitude of A changes, that also you can able to predict. Suppose if you want A to act in a, a in a particular fashion, uh, you directly cannot do it, but through B uh, you can do it. So uh, all that is possible uh, by modeling uh, as such a model. Okay, so uh, practically I don't say that nothing is impossible. It is possible with this particular model. And so I told you that this is simple regression model. If you have uh, one dependent variable and one independent variable, suppose if your R square value is very very less, if it is 0.2, then of course uh, even if it is 0.2, uh, beta may be significant, which means that the advertisement expenditure may influence sales, but at a very limited extent, but using this advertisement expenses alone, you cannot predict your future sales. So in order to improve the coefficient of determination, in order to improve the R square, or in order to improve the explanatory power of your model, you have to add few variables. So in that case, you cannot actually go for simple regression model. So you need to actually go for multiple regression model. In case of multiple regression model, you can add n number of variables, but only one condition is that actually the number of variables should not be more than the number of observations. Suppose if you have only 10 years data, which means if you have only 10 data point, then your variable should not be 12. Okay, so it, it may lead to other uh, issues. So you have to see to that you have adequate number of observations in order to include uh, extra variables. Clear. So that, that is one important thing. And apart from that, uh, in case of multiple regression, you will be having many other issues as well. So all that you need to check. Even in this particular model, see this alpha is constant, this beta. So why is the function of not only advertisement expenditure, it can be the function of price of the product, it can be the function of price of substitutes, complementary products, and so on. Many things, corporate tax rate, etc., the per capita income many, many other things um, and a, a, a new check technological change also can affect the sales of your product. So if I actually rewrite this uh, in a linear equation form, uh, this just y is your dependent variable and alpha is a constant and x1 is your first independent variable and x2 is the next independent variable. So in this example, x1 can be advertisement expenses, x2 can be price of the product, x3 can be the price of the uh, substitutes and X4 can be the price of complementary products and X5 can be corporate tax uh, rate and then uh, the next variable can be the average real wages or the per capita income of the uh, consumers, etc. Anything, overall inflation rate, everything you can include, whichever variable you find that it is meaningful 
for predicting the sales of the company, all those variables you can include in this particular model, but you need to be very, very careful while including the model. I'll just tell you what is it. And in spite of including all the variables which you know, but still you have this error term, right? E. So certain things may not be explained by all the variables. Even then, you are 100%, this model may not be perfect. So the 100% change in the Y cannot be explained by this model. Still, some something will be missing. So you do not know that. Okay, you do not know what is missing. But still, uh, if your R square is more than point, nine which is nine zero you can actually use that particular or sometimes if, if it is more than even 8.5 also you can go for prediction but in that particular case suppose if you uh if you uh, predict that the future sales would be thirty thousand, uh okay that is your prediction now you have a standard uh, standard uh what is that uh, a standard error also so using the standard error suppose if your standard error is uh you are calculating the standard error is thousand okay so you have thirty thousand plus or minus thousand Okay, so it can be 29,000 or it can be 30,000. So you need to find out the range also. Okay, so that is also possible in this case. Uh, not only in this case, even in case of simple regression also, it is possible, but you have to see to that your model is a perfect model. So these are the, uh, again, I'm just showing the um, equation for simultaneous equation for solving your beta. So you will be having uh, how many beta? Suppose if you have two variables, you will be having two betas, beta one and beta two. So you, this is nothing but the slope of, so beta 1 explains, suppose if you have advertisement expenditure and price, beta 1 explains what extent the change in the uh, x variable, the one unit change in the x variable influences the y variable. Suppose if this beta is 0 0.5, okay, which means that if there is a one unit change in advertisement expenditure, then sales increases to the extent of 0.5 unit. Suppose if this variable is your price, if this is minus, one, if this is minus one, it means that there is a negative influence of price on sales. If you increase price to the extent of one unit, then sales declines to the extent of one unit, keeping all other things constant, okay? Uh, even in this case also, this 0.5 I just told you, right? Keeping all other things constant, assume that there is no change in price or any other variable. If advertisement expenditure increases to the extent of 0.5 uh, one unit then sales increases to the extent of 0.5 units suppose if this beta 2 is minus 1 which means that keeping all other things constant if there is a one unit increase in price then sales declines to the extent of one unit if your beta 2 is minus 1 so there is a negative influence okay uh, yeah so you have to test the hypothesis whether your beta 1 is equal to 0 or not equal to 0. Beta 2 is equal to 0 or not equal to 0. Sometimes you do get negative beta. I just told you that. Uh, similarly, you have to calculate the total standard error. You have to calculate standard error for each beta in your multiple regression. And you have to calculate T statistics for your beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, beta 5, etc. Okay. And you must know whether it is significant or not. But sometimes what happens is that, this is very important, sometimes uh, your T statistics may not be significant, but what happens is that your R square will be very high. Uh, but if you want to know whether your model is significant or not, this T statistics will tell you whether the individual beta of your X1, the individual beta of your X2, X3 and X4, whether these are significant individually or not. Okay, significantly influence sales individually or not. But whether the regression as a whole, is it significant or not, that what you have to do is you have to actually uh, calculate the F statistics. Okay, so uh, F statistics probably you would have uh, discussed in the morning while discussing about your not, uh, in your non-parametric test as well. So, so you have to use the regression sum of squares and the error sum of squares and you have to calculate this F statistics then this is the hypothesis you just uh, uh, it's not I, I think at this moment uh, we cannot go in detail with, with this particular formula but still you just see the hypothesis the hypothesis says that either beta 1 is equal to beta 2 is equal to beta 3 all is equal to 0 so here hypothesis uh, alternate hypothesis says at least if one beta is significant then similarly you can reject the null hypothesis okay uh, so, if the F statistics is significant, then you can reject the null hypothesis stating that all your betas is equal to zero. 
at least one, if one beta is not equal to zero, then you can say that, of course, this model will work. It's a perfect model. Then there are certain assumptions which you need to test when you apply a multiple regression model. I don't know whether I can discuss all the assumptions, but still, uh, since we are using the primary data and most of you are from social science background and you will be using the primary data, uh, I'll just explain this multicollinearity uh, problem alone, and then uh, I'll just tell you what are the other issues. Okay, so first one, first assumption is that there should not be any kind of multicollinearity, which means that how many X's in our examples we have considered? We have uh, advertisement expenditure, price of the product, price of your uh, substitutes, price of complementary products, and many etc. Suppose if you have uh, five to six independent variables in order to find out the influence of all these independent variables on your dependent variable. Then uh, sometimes what happens uh, individually, the T statistics of the beta, each beta may not be significant, but and F statistics also sometimes it may not be significant, but the R square will be 0.98. By looking at the R square, you should not conclude that, of course, your model is a perfect model. Sometimes this may be because of the multicollinearity problem exists in your model. So this multicollinearity problem is none other than uh, sometimes your R square will be inflated because of the relationship between your independent variables. See, actually the condition is that your independent variables x1, x2, x3, x4 must be independent of each other, which means that x2 should not influence x1. And similarly, X3 should not influence X1 and X2 and it's the other way also. Okay, X4. So the independent variables should not have any correlation between themselves. It should be independent of each other. Otherwise, what happens if two variables, two independent variables or three independent variables in your model, if they have some uh, correlation between themselves, they will actually influence the Y variable individually as well as the joint effect of these variables will actually inflate the R square. So which means that it is uh, sometimes, uh, of course, uh, you, you may predict that using the uh, coefficients, you may predict that the sales may be uh, uh, 30 lakhs for next year. Okay, so that is the inflated information which has been given by you. So you, you think that your model is a perfect model, but uh, maybe uh, it may be an overestimation. Suppose if the actual sales is only 10 lakhs, what happened? You will produce, you cannot sell. So you may end up at a loss. So you have to actually, for prediction, sometimes it will work, but still, uh, sometimes it, it may end up at a problem also. So you have to, act, especially in case of uh, predicting these macroeconomic variables and many other variables, you have to be very careful about this. When you actually um, use the secondary data, even in case of primary data also, you have to be very careful that you are independent variables should should be independent of each other. They should not be dependent on each other. If it is dependent on each other, then you do face a kind of multicollinearity problem. And of course, the uh, heterosedasticity is none other than almost the variances of uh, your error term. So this heterosedasticity, autocorrelation, endogeneity, residuals, everything, your parameters must be linear, which is your alpha, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. It must be linear. It should not be nonlinear in its nature. And uh, unit root, uh, I'll just explain. But heterostaticity, autocorrelation, endogeneity, residuals, uh, normality of residuals, everything has to be checked. After running the analysis, you will get the error term. Error term is not none other than it is a difference between your actuals and the estimates. That is a y minus y hat. And uh, in Grittle or even sometimes in, in SPSS also, you can save the residuals. Okay, there is a save option. Uh, residuals you can save. After that, you have to test whether the residual, the error is normally distributed or not. So you, you, in, in, in most of the econometric techniques, most of the models uh, can also be uh, actually uh, developed using this error term. Okay, so the residuals should not. The residuals is nothing but the error term. That is the difference between the actuals and the estimates. So it should no, it should be normally distributed. And apart from that, this particular error term should not have any correlation with any of the independent variables. Okay, that is endogeneity. And apart from that, this error term, you will get error term for each and every observation. Okay, each and every data, uh, every year or every month or every observation. In case of cross-sectional data, you will be having 100. If you have 100 observations, uh, you if you calculate y minus y hat, 
Similarly, error term also you will get for the same period or the same number of observations. So, uh, especially autocorrelation generally we do consider when we use time series data. If you use yearly data or uh, if you use monthly data, but uh, generally in cross sectional data we just don't. Uh, uh, consider this autocorrelation, but heteroselasticity is a problem. So, which means that, see, uh, the error term of the current term, current year, or the current period, or the current month should not be influenced by the error term of the previous time period. Okay, so it can be the first order autocorrelation. If it is first order autocorrelation, which means that uh, the preceding month, the preceding time period, or it can be second order, third, third order, maybe the Last week's stock price may have an influence on today's stock price and uh, most of the stock prices, uh, of course, the effect will be there for uh, some point of time. So all that you have to uh, consider and the stationarity is none other than uh, the variables you have to this. All this I just told you that you have to check with your residuals, heteroselasticity, autocorrelation, endogeneity and normality of your residuals. But unit root is none other than it, it actually you have to test the variables before uh, doing your analysis, but all this you can check this heteroselasticity, autocorrelation, endogeneity, and normality of residuals or your multicollinearity. You can check after running the analysis. Okay, but the stationarity you can check even before running the analysis. You have to check whether the variables, the time series variables, especially it is stationary or not, which means that uh, uh, the Variable should not vary. The mean and uh, the variance of variable should not vary. The variance should not vary over time. Okay, and uh, yeah, of course, here we will just discuss. And if it vary, varies over time, then it will be a problem. Okay, then you cannot use it. You have to transform the entire data. So we let us not go in detail into all that. So we may not find time. I'll just uh, yeah. So how to, I'll just tell you how to check this multicollinearity problem alone. So multicollinearity problem can be tested in different ways, but, uh, but I'll just tell you, you can run an axillary regression. Uh, one thing is that if you have insignificant T ratios, but if you have very high R square, you can conclude that, of course, there is a multicollinearity problem. You have to solve that problem. Otherwise, you can run a partial correlation between almost all your independent variables and if, if the R, R value is very high, you can conclude that there is a multicollinearity problem. So this is a kind of deducting a multicollinearity problem. Otherwise, you can run an axillary regression, which means that uh, you, you, should, uh, you should actually run the regression between your independent variables, leaving your dependent variable. Now, if you have x1, x2, x3, x4, now in this case, you just leave your y. You have to actually consider first x1 as your dependent variable and x2 x3, x4 as your independent variable, run the regression, get the R square. And similarly, next x2 will be your dependent variable, x3, x4 and x1 will be your independent variable. So similarly, you have to run axillary regressions and apply all the uh, values and in, if the F statistics, if it is significant, then you can conclude that there is a multicollinearity problem. Otherwise, in your SPSS, you do get this result, this variance inflation factor and the tolerance level. You can calculate the variance inflation factor using the R square value and similarly the tolerance is none other than it's the uh, inverse of your variance inflation factor. So in this case, if the width value is one, then you can conclude that there is no collinearity. If the variance inflation factor is near to infinity, it's, if it is very high, if it is not close to one, then you can say, you can conclude that there is an existence of collinearity problem in your model okay and then if the tolerance level is if it's near to one even then there is no collinearity which means that the width and the tolerance level must be very close to one if it is very close to one then you don't worry about your model you can go ahead with your model otherwise what you can do is in case if you have multicollinearity problem you have to remove certain variables in your model or else what you can do is you can run a factor analysis Yesterday I was telling you, right, you can run a factor analysis, you just save the factor scores and name those factors. Now consider the, those factors as your independent variables instead of the actual factors. Okay, so that is another solution uh, for correcting this multicollinearity problem. So the remedial measure for multicollinearity problem is you just drop the data or you have to pull the data. You can go for transformation, any kind of transformation. Instead of having the actual data, you can take the first differences. First difference, even for stationarity also, if it is not stationary, uh, 
uh, then what you can do is you can actually find out the first difference. First difference is none other than the current data minus the previous data. Generally, you do calculate returns, right? Stock returns we do calculate. So it is the current data minus the previous data. So in case of most of the primary data, like our stress uh, variables, so we have no other uh, option other than dropping a variable. Okay, so if you have multiple linearity problem, you have you don't have any other option. Uh, you just drop the less important variable. Okay, and you can have otherwise what you have to do is you have to run two or three models uh, considering each and every variable separately as an independent data. So that is another. Uh, apart from that, you can run a factor analysis. You can name those factors as a uh, new variable, and you can use that in your model. So these are all some of the remedial measures which we have and heteroscedasticity and all i'm just uh, just quickly skipping it uh, since you already it is four i'll just tell you what is causality cause effect relationship so i just told you that sometimes even in case of primary data research uh, certain variables may have a cause effect relationship x can also cause y and y can also cause x in that case generally we do run a granger's uh, causality test. Uh, mostly uh, people who are working with the time series data, uh, they can actually apply this kind of causality test. I, yesterday I just gave you one example that uh, exports and exchange rate. Okay, so in, in most of the cases exports may cause exchange rate. In turn, exchange rate will also cause exports. So if you want to find out which is causing the other one uh, to a greater extent, then you can actually find out using this uh, test of causality. In case if you have two variables, you can go for Granger's causality test. Otherwise, if you have multiple variables, you can go for vector autoregression model or vector error correction model. So these are all some of the models I'll just show you. So here, see, uh, this is y and x. So in the first equation, we are considering y as the dependent variable. In the second equation, you are considering x as the dependent variable. So in both the case, you are considering the lag of your y and the lag of your x as the independent variables. See, generally, uh, I think few of you might be uh, doing research and uh, using secondary data. Some of the economic students and management and uh, students, you'll, it will be useful for you. And even uh, even social science students also, uh, if you use any kind of secondary data, especially uh, with respect to uh, the per capita income of the um, respondents and many many things if you want to predict you can use this particular model so here actually uh, if you want i can skip this also uh, if, if you find if it is useful i'll just continue otherwise i'll just skip and then we can go for analysis shall i continue or we'll stop here please continue yes continue ma'am okay fine so if you could not if, if it is not useful for you please let me know so i should not uh, <laughs> say something which is not of your interest as well. See here, I'll just tell you this, these two examples. I'll just tell you uh, this why you can consider this as your exports. X you can consider this as your exchange rate. Okay, so in this case, why your exports uh, may be influenced by your exchange rate at the same time. The lag of exports, the previous uh, day's price, or you can consider this a stock index also. So your Nifty is a stock index and the company stock prices. So in both the case, there will be some influence. So the stock company stock price and a, will be influenced by the index price. And similarly, what happens is that it will be influenced by its own price. So any company enforces stock price and Nifty index we can take. So Infosys stock price is influenced by Nifty. Similarly, Nifty can also be influenced by this particular company's stock. So here, this T minus one is nothing but the lag of the uh, particular variable. That is the past information. See how exchange is influencing exports and exports is influencing exchange rate. So it is the past information which will actually influence the other variable. Uh, I can give you a perfect example. I'll just uh, investments, investment and GDP. Will today's investment influence uh, if this particular quarter's investment influence this particular GDP or the previous quarter's investment influence this particular GDP? This year's GDP. Suppose if you have quarterly data, sorry. Suppose if this is your investment, foreign investment, and if this is your GDP. So quarter one, two, three, four. This is a quarterly data. Assume that this is a quarterly data. 
uh, it, it can be in terms of billions of billions, but I'll just give a, a simple number. Suppose if this is 20, 25, 30, and then 35. So this may be uh, maybe uh, 100, and this is 115, 122, and then 133. So consider in terms of billions of trillions. Okay. See, uh, okay, fine. So in this case, you just tell whether this particular quarter's FDR will get uh, GDP of this quarter. Certainly, it may not immediate. You may not find the immediate influence. So the previous quarter's FDI information, so investment actually, whatever you have received in the previous quarter, after receiving it, then it will be invested, and then only the process will start and it will go into production. Whatever it is. So the last. We have GDP lost in uh, FDI only will influence this quarter's GDP. So in this particular case, so what I do is suppose if I consider GDP as my dependent variable, then I do consider the FDI T minus one, which is so this particular GDP will not be influenced by this particular investment. It may be influenced by the previous quarter's investment. Similarly, investors. Uh, how investors they will actually uh, invest based on the information which they got. Okay, so suppose if this year's GDP or this quarter's GDP is better, then the investors who are actually uh, seeking for growth, who are who are actually seeking for uh, better returns, what they do is they will actually consider the previous GDP only. This year, if the GDP is good, immediately will they can they invest? Definitely not. A lot of procedures are there. It will take at least three months. So last year, so this 25, which is the foreign investment, it is actually influenced by the last quarter's GDP, not by this quarter's GDP. So what I do is here, if I consider this GDP, this GDP as my Y variable, then what is my X variable? My X variable is the past FDA information. Okay, so if I do not have information for this quarter, I can leave it. First quarter, I can leave it. Now, for 115, the actual X variable is not 25, it is 20. Then, I for, for, for the next quarter, I, I should not consider the third quarter's information. I have to consider the previous quarter information, which is 25. And for this particular quarter, it, it should be 30. Okay, so this is nothing but this XT minus 1, which is the lag, the previous year information, which I am going to use in order to calculate the coefficients and also to, also to forecast the future GDP. Similarly, if you consider FD as a dependent variable, then for 25, you have to, the simultaneous uh, uh, X variable will be 100. So like that, you need to actually consider the previous lag. So it's not necessary that you have to calculate only one lag. You can go for two lags, three lags, sometimes even in case of daily prices of stock, which you are using for your research, you can go even up to 15 or 20 lags also. So it depends. So there is a particular uh, a test to check the best lag as well. Okay, so this is just for your information. Um, here, I'll just tell you how to interpret it. So here, this is y and this is x. Here, the lag of y and the lag of x are the independent variables in both the models. In this particular first equation, if alpha is significant, if alpha is significant, which means that this is the coefficient of the other variable. Okay, so if this is significant, then you can actually conclude that x is causing x is causing y, which means that if alpha is not equal to zero, then you can conclude that there is an unidirectional causality from x to y. So in this particular equation, which should be significant, this is just the lag of the same variable. So you need not bother about that. So this is the other variable. Okay, so if this particular delta, if it is significant, then you can say that y is causing x. So there is a unidirectional causality from y to x. Suppose if this alpha and if this delta, if both are significant, if both are not equal to zero, then x is also causing y, y is also causing x. There is a bidirectional causality. If in the both the case, if you cannot reject the null hypothesis, then you can conclude that it's independent x and y. Both are not causing each other. So that is how you have to actually uh, conclude. And then I just uh, skip all this. Okay, I'll just stop here. Uh, and if time is there, we will discuss uh, F test also. Uh, please open. Uh,
SPSS, first we will run the analysis in SPSS and then I'll show you how to do the analysis in Gretel. If you have any doubts, please raise your doubts so far. Yes, any any issues or doubts or if you need any class. can we check them? Sorry? Casualty, where can we check that using? Causality test. In Gretel, you have an option. You can, I'll show you how to check causality in Gretel. Uh, uh, let me first open this SPSS, my God, I'm sorry, not open it. Please open the SPSS window and uh, in just input the data. Import the data, especially the sales and advertisement data is there, right? You just import and we will see how the results are coming and then we will uh, use the primary data and then I will just uh, show the analysis and secondary data analysis I'll just show in uh, Gretel. Ma'am, can I ask you one more doubt, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Ma'am, you are saying that a uh, Granger casualty test can be taken in Grittel. Uh, mm -hmm. Then can I know, uh, is it possible to test in e-views, ma'am? Then what is the difference yes. between uh, e e-views yes, 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 yes. yes. Whether we'll get e the same answer? Sorry? Whether we'll get the same answer? Answer will be the same, yes. yes. Yes, you will get the same everything, but uh, sometimes the result... Uh, uh, table will be a little different. Uh, whatever output you're getting in Grittle, the uh, format is entirely different. Sometimes you do get uh, p value. Actually, for uh, causality, you do get uh, p values in Grittle, but I don't know whether in eViews you will get. Okay, so uh, mostly the answer will be the same. Even if you run it in Grittle or SPSS or uh, in eViews or in Stata or even in, in R, anything, you will get the same results. The results will not change. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Oh. One more question, yes. ma'am. Yes, uh, please. What is the minimum R square value, ma'am, for the prediction? Uh, what will be the minimum see, R for prediction, generally for prediction, uh, high R square is less uh, variance, especially, and high R square. Generally, if it is uh, if it is a secondary data, uh, if it is above point nine, you can go for prediction. Uh, but still, um, you you have to, if you want to improve, you can improve your models. And really most of the researchers, what they do is, first they will start with one variable and they will keep on add many variables. And you have to see how your R square is improving, provided uh, you have to check all the assumptions as well. So uh, your model has to uh, satisfy almost all the assumptions. For prediction, generally, if it is more than 9, 0.95, it is always better. Only then you will, uh, your prediction will be perfect. Otherwise, uh, uh, the, in future, there may be a problem. Uh, otherwise, what you have to do is, uh, there are, uh, you have to actually calculate the uh, beta for certain periods. Suppose if you have data uh, for a period of 10 years, suppose if you have monthly data for a period of 10 years, then you need to consider a format of sample as in-sample and out-sample, okay? So you should not actually consider uh, the last uh, 20 uh, observations, okay? You don't consider the last 20 observations and you just, uh, uh, you calculate alpha and beta and you just predict because you know the actual value of the last 10 observation. But after predicting, you just compare whether your prediction is perfect or not. So in that way also you can actually check whether your model is a perfect model. Generally, if it is above 0 0.95, it's always better. And for the cross-sectional uh, data also? Cross-sectional or... data, it is not a problem. Cross-sectional data, okay, you okay. have to check whether your beta is significant. Cross-sectional data, anyway, you can go for prediction, right? In most of the cases, uh, you don't go for prediction. Your objective like we will maybe to find out whether a particular variable is influencing or not and so among true. two or three variables which is the which is influence which is the most influencing variable is it uh, yes ma'am ah that is possible that is possible if that is the case even with very less r square also you can only thing is you have to check whether your beta is significant or not if your beta is significant then you can conclude that that variable is significantly influencing but actually uh, see uh, the in the R square may be very less, which means that the explanatory power of the model is very less, but still the variable is influencing to some extent. Okay, so uh, that is not a problem in case of primary data. Even, right. even if, it, if it is 0.4 or 0.5 also, sometimes beta will be very significant. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Any, anything else? Okay. Uh, please... Uh, would you see this SPSS window?
Is the video visible now? Is it visible? Okay. Yes, uh, just click file. Uh, open data. Sorry, open uh, import data. Import data and then Excel. Click Excel and then my data is in desktop. So it's the final data which I have sent to you. And uh, it's a last sheet, I think, that sales and advertisement data you can open. You just check it is in which sheet. I think, uh, yeah, sales data. Sales data. And then click OK. Just click OK. OK, fine. Shall I proceed? Okay, shall I proceed the analysis? You just click analyze and then click regression and it is actually a linear regression. Click linear and in this case, let us consider sales as the dependent variable here and advertisement as the independent variable. Okay, so here I'm not going to check multicollinearity or anything. If you want to plot, you can plot. Uh, you want can go for a if you want you can plot the data and you can check as well okay sometimes you do get options probability it is fine and so here you have a save options right okay so you just click the save option and see uh you can save actually the y hat okay your predicted values your y hat you can save residuals this is your error term I'll just click both and just show you. Okay, I'll just click. If you want, you can click. I just click both. You will get your predicted Y and your residuals as well in your data sheet. And you suppose uh, for future analysis, if you want to use this residuals and your Y hat, you can use it if you if you really need it. Okay, I'll just give continue and then click OK. Just click OK. Click OK. Ah, fine. So, yeah. So this is, have you all got the results? You've got the results, right? Okay, fine. So now you just uh, see the uh, results and see the data sheet. If you see the data sheet, you will get two more variables. This is your y hat and this is your error term. Okay, this is your residual value. This is your y hat. Uh, for some other models, they do use residual as the uh, dependent variable. Okay, uh, many, many other econometric models, they do use residuals for modeling. So as of now, we don't need this data. I'll just uh, explain the results. See here, you just see, this is a multiple R. Yesterday, we have discussed about the same um, uh, options we have used for calculating, the, uh, for finding out the multiple correlation. So this is the multiple correlation coefficient R. So this is your R square. So in case of simple regression, it's enough if you go for this R square. This R square, adjusted R square is actually adjusted towards uh, the effect of the other variables, but still you do have this multicollinearity effect. In case of multiple regression, you have to actually consider adjusted R square instead of R square in order to uh, actually, uh, um, your R square will have the inflated value. So in order to adjust that, uh, you will get this adjusted R square. So if it is simple regression, then you have to consider the R square value. It is 0.95. I think in the uh, PPT also I have showed the same. It's 0.95, which means that nearly 95% of changes in the sales has been explained by the particular model, which I have used. Okay, so if I use advertisement expenditure alone as the independent variable, then nearly 95% of the variation in sales has, uh, can be explained by this and uh, very less chance of other variables to actually explain. And this ANOVA, you just see, this is the ANOVA statistics. Okay, so here actually it is not required because I am just uh, running a simple regression model. This is just a simple regression model. It is not a multiple regression model. So uh, if T is significant, then obviously uh, F will also be significant. Okay. So it is not necessary to actually interpret this ANOVA, especially for simple regression model. It is enough if you uh, actually interpret the coefficient. So here you just see uh, this constant is alpha. 
Okay, you just check the alpha value. You can check the alpha value in the uh, PPT. I think I'll send you uh, the same the same values which we got. It is two thousand seven twenty five. So this is your alpha value and this is your beta value, which is point two four one. Okay, so this B is nothing but the unstandardized beta, which we actually uh, got it by calculating. Uh, this alpha and beta by applying any any many formulas are there uh, whatever formula which I have showed that not, nothing but this extension of the least squares model okay ordinary least squares model and now this is the standard error of this beta the standard error is also very less and this is the standardized coefficient you just see see you said that uh, especially for primary data sometimes uh, uh, you do not want the unstandardized beta because you you are not going to use that beta for prediction okay. So your objective may be to know which particular variable is actually influencing uh, the dependent variable the most. So if that, if that is the case, if you want to compare between your independent variables, then you have to go for standardized coefficients of beta, which is this is an unstandardized beta, actual beta, which you have to use in case if you go for prediction. Suppose if your objective is not prediction, just to know um, among the independent variables, which is the most influencing variable, then you, you can actually, uh, you have to check the standardized coefficient. And this is the T statistics, calculated T statistics. And this is the significant value of your T statistics, which beta basically. Okay, so this is less than 0 0.00. 0 0.01 okay so actually it is 0, 0, 0, 0.001 and sometimes you do get 0, 0, 0 as well so which means that if we consider the significant level as five percentage then we can reject an null hypothesis if the probability value is less than 0 0.05 so it is much lesser so very well you can reject the null hypothesis you can conclude that advertisement expenditure is significantly influence the changes in the sales and you can very well use this advertisement expenditure alone for predicting your future sales okay so these are all the residual statistics this is the statistics of your error term okay so this is none other than the descriptors of your error term so the minimum and maximum value and the standard residual and the predicted value everything has been given here so first what you need to interpret is that your r square value Okay, so that is the coefficient of determination. So, what explain, what extent, uh, your the, your the combination of your independent variables is actually, uh, explaining, explaining the changes in the y variable. What is the extent of explanation which has been given by the model? That actually you can find out by considering this r square value and F statistics in case if it is a multiple regression, it is meaningful in interpreting the F statistics. Otherwise, it's enough if you interpret only the T statistics. Okay. In case of simple regression, if T is significant, F will also be significant. Sometimes in case of multiple regression, F may be significant, but certain T values may not be significant. Is it clear? Simple regression output students, sorry, <laughs> participants. Okay. So we will run a multiple regression analysis. Uh, okay. Now, you just open the other data sheet. Uh, you just close this one and uh, you can keep this if you want. Just file, import data, Excel, and uh, yeah, final data. I'm just opening. Then I'm not going to use the sales and advertisement. Since I have just used this, for example, I've just showed you. Uh, next one is you just, you don't use the data one. Data one is, uh, yeah, data, oh no, data one you just consider. Data one, data one, okay. Yeah, yes. So now in this particular case, I have few categorical variables also here. I cannot use, see in regression analysis, you cannot use categorical uh, variables as your independent variables. It is not possible as such, but you can use this categorical variable as a dummy variable. Uh, there is a term called dummy variable regression in case if you want to include any of the categorical variable as dummy variable, then as such you cannot use. So here, see for example, marital status. Uh, marital status, we just coded it as one and two, uh, married and single. Okay, uh, you, if you want, you can give one more option also, married, single, divorcee. Uh, then in, in this case, we have given only two options, married and uh, sing, single and married. Okay, so here I have used the code of one and two, but in case if it is a dummy variable regression, if I consider this as a dummy variable in my regression model, I can use the dummy variable as one of the independent variable. It can be X3 or X4. I can use along with the other variables also. But instead of this one and two, I have to code it only as zero and one. 
if I have two options, suppose in this case, education, how can I have this dummy variable for this particular? Suppose it, how many options are there for this? Uh, the question I write. So, sorry, for example, if we have four options, then I have to include three dummy variables as three dummies, especially for this particular variable education. Okay, I, if I start dummy variable, then I don't know where I will end up. Uh, save. If, if I consider education as a dummy variable, then I, I should have D1, D2, and D3. Okay, so option 1, 2, 3, 4. I may be having four options in this criteria, but I need to have this options. If suppose if I have four options, then the dummy variable dummies I'm going to use is only three dummies. It should be three. Suppose if you use four, then obviously it, it, it will become a near singular matrix. You will get all become zero sometimes. So here. For the first option, suppose if if they choose if a particular candidate, if the particular uh, respondent has chosen the first option, then I will give one here, this zero, zero. So this is the first option, second option, and third option. Fourth option I will not have because if I give three zero, suppose if the next up sorry, tick uh, second one, then I have to give zero for the first option, second option it should be one, third option. Again, zero. Suppose if they give third option, then I have to give zero for the first option, first dummy, second one also zero, and again. So this means that suppose if I have zero, zero in the first two columns and in the third, if I have one, which means that the participant has actually, the uh, uh, respondent has actually uh, opted for the third option. So he comes under the third category. Suppose if he, if he actually uh, take fourth option, then it will be zero zero zero. If we have all zeros in these dummies, dummy D1, D2, and D3, which means that it is option four which has been selected. So like that, you have to have dummy. Suppose if you have four option, five options in a variable, you will have how many dummies? You will have four dummies. And in your regression model, you have to use all these three columns. Okay, D1, D2, and D3, just for one variable, which is your uh, educational qualification. So, uh, and interpreting this also, it's not that easy. Of course, you need to uh, have some more reading, especially on interpreting dummy. Suppose if it is a two option, then it will be easy. If it is two option, then it is zero on one, you will be having only one column because you have two options. So, two minus one, you will get only one dummy. That is possible. In case, if you want to use uh, categorical variables in uh, in your regression model, then you cannot use it as such as 1 and 2 or 1, 2, 3 or 4. You cannot use this as one particular variable. You will be having different dummies as well for particular variable. So uh, instead what you can do is, uh, instead of this, if you have categorical variable and if you want to find the influence of this categorical independent variable on your dependent variable, instead you can go and try ANOVA. Okay, but though it is a difference test, but indirectly, we can actually find out the influence of your categorical independent variable on your dependent variable. If time permits, I'll just show that also. You are at least your one way on over. Okay. So here, uh, here we are not going to use any of the categorical variables. We are just going to use only the uh, continuous variable. Okay. So just go to analyze. I will run a multiple regression analysis in this case. Analyze and same regression. Click linear. And independent variable is the level of stress. Okay, just click level of stress and uh, just <coughs> consider this as the dependent variable. And uh, the overall stress I'm just leaving, I'll just consider only the problems at workplace, uh, personal problems and coping up strategies. And you just click uh, the arrow uh, in front of this independent option. Just click independent. Okay, so I'm just considering three variables as the independent variable. One is the problem at workplace and the personal problems and the coping up strategies. Okay, and now uh, first, first we will see, we'll check the results and then we will go for multi, we can, you can check multicollinearity here itself. Okay, just click okay. Now, you just see this is a multiple same for simple regression also you have the same option for multiple regression also you have to use the same option in your SPSS or in case of simple regression in your X uh, variable you will be having only one variable whereas in case of multiple regression 
you can have any number of variables. That's not an issue. Okay, but uh, there is one condition that your number of variables should be less than your number of observations, or um, actually your number of observations must be uh, much greater than your number of variables. Okay, so here you just see this particular model. How much is the R square? The R square is only 0.5. Okay, which means that uh, um, problems at workplace, personal problems, and coping up strategies explain only 52% of the variation in the level of stress of the respondents. Okay, but still, but still I can actually, uh, if, I, if my objective is to find out whether the uh, problems at workplace and the personal issues and the coping up strategies, whether they have any influence on my level of stress, uh, so anything may be, uh, may cause, it's not only personal problems, it's not only work related problems and it, uh, actually, uh, cause stress. Sometimes, uh, even some unknown people may also irritate you, and because of that, your stress level may uh, increase. Or maybe you may be thinking of something as uh, else that may also increase your level of stress. It is not necessary that your person. Sometimes, uh, people they don't have any problem at workplace. They may not have any problem uh, in their uh, family also. Personal problems also they may not have any. Problem. But still their level of stress may be uh, quite high. It is because of some other psychological issues. Okay, so in this particular case, actually the level of stress of the participants, uh, the changes in the level of stress is actually explained to the extent of 52% with respect to the work-related problems, personal problems and coping up strategies. Okay, and now you just check the ANOVA. So ANOVA uh, is very important here. It has a relevance uh, in case of multiple regression model. You just check that. F statistics, it is significant, which means that jointly, almost all these variables, jointly this particular model is actually significant in determining your level of stress, in influencing your level of stress. The model is significant. Your F statistics is significant. So the probability value is less than 0 0.05. So you can reject the null hypothesis, which is H1, sorry, uh, null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to beta 2, all your betas is equal to 0. So that you can reject. And you can you can find out whether any of the beta is significant or not. That is using your T statistics. Now ANOVA shows your model significance in your regression output. And here you just see the uh, beta values. Uh, your constant is uh, alpha is 38 and problems at workplace it is 0.8. And but you, in case of your coping up strategies, it is negative. Here in this particular case, uh, my objective is not prediction, but I want to know the, which particular variable is uh, most influencing variable here? So, okay, so among work related problems and personal problems. Among work related problem and personal problem, see, you just see the compare the standardized beta of, uh, could you able to see the cursor moving? Uh, participants? Yes. Okay, see, this value is the beta, the standardized beta of uh, problems at workplaces. 0.376, whereas in this particular case, personal problems, it is 0.209. So comparatively, the work-related problems uh, is actually uh, influencing much higher than the personal problems. That is your level of stress has been influenced uh, more by the work-related problems. Uh, but however, there is a negative uh, beta in case of this coping up strategy, which means that if the respondents, if the uh, employees, if they actually uh, try some of the coping up strategies, then it is actually has, has the capability of reducing the level of stress and it's significant. You just see all the variables are significant at 5% level. In, in all the cases, you just check the significance value. Uh, it is less than 0 0.05 in case of personal problem. So in case of work related problems, as well as in case of coping up strategies. So all are significantly influencing individually also keeping all other things constant. See, keeping personal problems, coping up strategies, everything constant and work related problems is actually influencing your level of stress. Similarly, keeping all other things constant, personal problems also influencing your stress and even your coping up strategies is also influencing stress. All these variables are individually also influencing at the same time the model is also significant. And which are the two variables which is positively influencing stress? So the personal problems and work related problems is actually aggravating your level of stress. But the coping up strategies uh, which the uh, respondents they are actually uh, trying those coping up strategies is uh, uh, capable of 
negatively influence the level of stress, which means that it is actually trying to reduce the level of stress. Um, so this is a, a very interesting finding as well. And this is how you have to interpret your multiple regression model. Now, fine. So we have more than one variable in this particular model. And the R square is quite high, though, of course, the T is also significant. But still, I want to know whether there is any relationship between these three variables. Of course, uh, there may not be any relationship, but still, I want to know. I can do that using this if and uh, which means that I want to find out whether there is any presence of multicollinearity or not. Just click analyze. Again, once again, I'll just run the same regression. Click linear. So even dependent is level of stress, independent is all this. Here there is one option which is statistics. Okay, just click the statistics. Here after clicking this, you have this Durban Watson and then you have this collinearity diagnostics. You just click this collinearity diagnostics. Here I'm not going to use Durban Watson. It is for checking autocorrelation. The first order autocorrelation can be checked using Durban Watson. So generally autocorrelation we do check for time series data, not for cross-sectional data. So it is meaningless for checking autocorrelation uh, in case of cross-sectional data. So I'll just check only multicollinear, the presence of multicollinearity in the model. So just click collinearity diagnostics and continue. Just click OK. You will get the same output again, but you just see now you are getting extra two columns here. One is tolerance value and other one is WIF, which is variance inflation factor. See, both the values are somewhat which is close to one. It's 0.7 and 0.12, everything, both collinearity statistics and WIF, both are actually close to one, if it is close to one, then you can conclude that there is no multicollinearity problem in this model. So perfectly, you can have the three variables in the model. You need not eliminate any variable. Suppose if tolerance and if, uh, if it is, if this is less than 0.3 and if this is more than three, then uh, some, see, uh, actually there is a formula to calculate it. Uh, to get the perfect uh, benchmark, but still uh, overall generally what they do consider is if it is, uh, if, if in case if it is this tolerance level is less than 0.3 and if this width is more than 3, then you can consider there is a multicollinearity problem. Some people they do consider 7 as a 0.7 and 7 as the benchmark and some they do consider 0.1 and 10 as the benchmark. That's too extreme. So it's better if if it is 0.5 and 5. If, if tolerance is less than 0.5, and if it's more than uh, five, then you can conclude that there is a problem of multicollinearity and you have to check which particular variable is having high level of collinearity. That you can check with this collinearity diagnostics. You can check whether uh, whether any of, see here it is not there. Sometimes what happens is that uh, work related uh, problem may have a very high collinearity with personal problem. So you can check by using these numbers. It may be very high, which may be much higher than uh, these numbers and in that case you have to remove that particular variable suppose if personal problem has uh, a correlation with uh, work related problem and coping up strategies then you need to actually remove that particular variable so in that case the WIF and tolerance level will be much much higher for a particular variable you have to remove that variable and you have to rerun the model but whereas in this particular case this model is a perfect model you can keep all the three variables and you can go ahead with your uh, analysis and interpretation any doubts? Fine. Sure. Madam. Yes. So my independent variable is personality. So it has got uh, five subscales. Mm, yes. So if I'm going to do regression between mm. uh, personality and work-life balance total scores, okay. so there are five dimensions in independent variable. Is it considered Fine. as a simple linear regression or multiple linear regression? It's so only... multiple linear regression you have to go for. Okay. You want to you want to consider those five dimensions as your independent variables, right? Yes. You want to and then you have to go for multiple regression model. Otherwise, what you can do is if it is a single scale, if it is a single scale, or uh, you can actually run a confirmatory factor analysis, and uh, if you get 
all the dimensions also in your factor analysis, then you can consider the factor scores as your independent variables in case of running your multiple regression analysis. Otherwise, you can go for a structural equation model. I think tomorrow you have a session on structural equation modeling also. So that model will actually uh, give you a lot of scope, especially for checking uh, uh, different kinds of attributes. And moreover, in this particular regression, you have one uh, limitation. You have you can have only one dependent variable. Yes. Whereas in case of structural equation modeling, uh, if you have uh, more than one dependent variable, it is possible. You, uh, dependent you can variable have only dependent one. and independent variable, multiple dependent and independent variables you can have. And one more question, madam. You were talking about in multiple regression, number of uh, observations should be more, you said. Can you yes. just explain that, madam? Sorry? Can you just explain that? What do you mean by See, it? Number of observations, nothing but number of data points. Suppose uh, if you collect data for a period of 10 years. 10 years yearly data. Okay. Uh, uh, so you will have only in the in the row, uh, you will have only 10 rows. That is number of observations. Number of samples, madam, for a number of samples, yes. In case oh. of cross-sectional data, you, you have collected uh, data from 10 people. So you have only uh, 10 data points, 10 observations, 10 uh, rows you, you will be having. Okay. But if you if you have 10 variables which means that uh, if you have x1 x2 x3 then uh, you cannot run the number of observations generally it must be at least 10 times more than that of your number of variables only then your model will be perfect model suppose if you have 10 variables at least you need to collect data from 100 respondents now when you talk about variables you're talking about only independent variable or all uh, dependent variables all together independent you will be having only in this case you will be having only one dependent and dependent independent variable so all put together if you have 10 variables then obviously it, it's always better to go for uh, more number of uh, responses okay got it. anything else Okay, so we will uh, run the analysis in Gretel as well. I think some of you, you said that you are just using secondary data as well. So I'll just uh, quickly show you. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, I'll just uh, uh, ANOVA without explaining the uh, formula and other things. Shall I explain ANOVA in which context it has to be? Because with this data, we can run ANOVA. Okay, madam. Okay, see, analysis of variance. Uh, uh, actually, in the morning, you have discussed about uh, t test, is it? T test, uh, independent sample, t all parametric tests you have discussed in the morning, is it? Yeah, T test we discussed. A T test you have discussed. Which T test you have discussed? Could you uh, tell? Uh, dependent sample or independent sample? Both. Paired and unpaired, both with it. Paired, paired and unpaired. Okay, so this uh, independent sample T test, unpaired. So in which context you have used? In which context you have used independent sample t test? In which situation you can use this independent sample t test? Suppose uh, if you, so this is this is all just a univariate uh, analysis. So you will be having one variable. If you want to check whether that particular the characteristics of a particular variable differs with respect to two set of samples. If you classify your entire sample into two based on some criteria. And if you want to test whether the characteristics of a particular variable differs with respect to two set of samples. See, in this example, I can tell you uh, level of stress. If you want to find out whether there is any difference in the level of stress between male respondents and female respondents, then you can very well apply independent sample t-test. Okay, so unpaired t-test you can apply. And if the uh, t-test is significant, then you can conclude that there is a significant difference between the level of stress of male and female respondents. Uh, this is just a different test, but you can actually interpret in a different way also, which means that here you are just grouping the entire uh, observations into two based on the gender. But here I can say that gender can also be considered as a variable here. You are considering gender as also a variable, but by dividing the groups, you are just finding whether there is, there is a difference or not. But still, if there is a significant difference, you can also conclude that gender is influencing their level of stress. If you use gender uh, as a dummy variable uh, in the regression model, certainly in case if in your t-test, if it is significant, then obviously if you use gender as a dummy variable in your regression model, certainly that particular variable also will give you a significant result, which means that gender is influencing your level of stress, influencing the uh, participant's level of stress. So that is how you can conclude. So in case if you have two groups, then you can apply 
t test suppose if you have more than two groups then it is not possible that you can apply a t test if you have if you want to actually classify the entire respondents into more than two groups then you can actually apply the f test uh, in order to find whether there is any difference uh, in the level of stress of the uh, respondents based on their educational status maybe based on the designation if you actually classify them into different groups then it is possible actually by uh, applying this analysis of variance analysis of variance is nothing but it's an extension of your uh, f test which was developed by fisher okay so uh, in this particular case actually uh, f test uses uh, whereas in case of t test uh, you will be finding the uh, differences with respect to the mean of that particular variable whereas in case of f test you do consider the variances but actually our objective is not uh, considering the variances it is uh, it is just that what extends to uh, uh, every particular variable's mean is actually different from that of the other variables. So the actual intention is not uh, 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 to test the significant difference of the sample variance, but it is a sample mean only. But using the F test, uh, actually we are uh, using this analysis of variance also in order to find out whether there is any difference in the characteristics of a particular variable with respect to different groups. Suppose, assume that if you want to see in this particular example, I have given few variables, but actually I have not, uh, uh, if you could label it, I have sent a questionnaire also. So I think in the morning, uh, um, the resource person has explained you how to label it. You can label it and if you, uh, if it is one, I, th I think in the questionnaire, what has been given in, ca in case of designation? Uh, designation, how many classifications are there? One minute, I'll just check. I'll just open the questionnaire and check. Yeah, so in the questionnaire, this is just a uh, very simple question. Huh? Uh, designation, how many options the student has given? Actually, she has given the option as process associate, team leader, supervisor, and project manager. Nearly four options are there. Uh, sometimes what happens is that sometimes you do get five. That's a mistake. Okay. Uh, in designation, see, you have a value five here. So it's actually a mistake. So that has to be converted into four. Sometimes while entering the data, uh, generally students, they do uh, uh, commit certain mistakes. So uh, if it is five, then it's a mistake. So instead of five, some five uh, values are there. So this is, a, this is a problem with data entry. Okay. So all fives, you just convert it as four. All the fives can, because she has given only four options here. This can be converted into four. Okay, five is there. Okay. Okay, so this is just a mistake. Yeah. Okay, so here designation, how many options she has given? She has given four options. This is project associate, team leader, uh, supervisor, and project manager. Suppose if I, um, depending upon the designation, depending upon uh, the nature of your work, the respondents work, they, their level of stress will also be quite higher. When they move to higher positions, of, sometimes the level of stress may increase, sometimes the level of stress may, may decrease as well. So it depends upon person to person. So here, of course, in this case, if, if you want to test whether there is any difference in the level of stress with respect to the designation, then you cannot apply an unpaired t-test. We cannot apply independent sample t-test because uh, it, it allows only uh, two groups, whereas in case if you have more than two groups, then you can go for one way analysis of variance. I'll just show you how to run the analysis. Uh, just to go to the, I'm sorry. Fine. So now just go to analyze. Analyze. Uh, compare means. Just click compare means even you would have used the same option for your uh, paired sample t-test and independent sample. Here you have one way ANOVA. You just click one way ANOVA and then your uh, dependent list is only one. You will be having only one dependent variable. So let me consider the level of stress. And then the independent list, the factor, uh, this is the response variable and this is my uh, factor which is the independent, categorical independent variable. Uh, in case if I have a categorical independent variable, then I can run one way ANOVA not to test the influence of this categorical independent variable on my dependent variable. This other one, actually, it's a different test, but still, uh, I can actually uh, interpret it in a different way. So now, 
I'll just consider experience here because exp uh, sorry designation exp designation designation has more than two groups here. I'm sorry, not here. I just click designations and click factor. Okay, now uh, this level of stress is the dependent variable and designation is the factor which I'm just considering to test whether there is any significant level in the level of stress of the respondents based on the designation. Just click OK. See here uh, you have this ANOVA and this point estimation the interval is of course uh, it's not required. See this ANOVA, uh, you just check this is a one way ANOVA. So you will be having uh, sum of squares of between groups and within the groups and uh, the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom you do get the mean square and their value is none other than uh, your uh, uh, larger variance by the smaller variance here. So that is 82 by 9.29 divided by 74, you will get F statistics here. And it is not significant. See, in this particular uh, result, you just check the significance value. It is 0 0.34, which is more than 0 0.05. So what I can conclude is that I can reject, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference uh, in the level of stress between the respondents with respect to their designation. So designation, so in, indirectly what I can conclude, so though it's a different stress, in the null hypothesis I have to write that there is no difference in the level of stress between the respondents with respect to their designation. So I cannot reject it. There is no difference in the level of stress based on their designation. So I can also conclude that there is no influence Okay, so because designation is not having any influence on their level of stress. So it doesn't matter whether they are a, a project manager or team manager or the supervisor or the project associate, that designation doesn't matter. Okay, irrespective of that, they have stress. Okay, so because of the designation, there is no change in the level of stress. In that way also, I can conclude. So uh, in, uh, in some cases, you cannot uh, use the categorical variables uh, as your independent variables in the regression model. Uh, if there is a problem in using that as a dummy variable in your regression model, instead uh, a simple analysis which you can do is the analysis of uh, variance. You can use this in order to interpret the influence of your categorical variables on your uh, continuous on any of your continuous variable. Uh, but actually, while stating the hypothesis, you just don't mention the word as influence because sometimes it may be misunderstood. So you just uh, while stating the hypothesis, just mention. There is no difference, especially in the level of a particular way, uh, in the level of stress uh, based on the designation. Okay, so this is how you mean to say, uh, without yes. doing regression, yeah. based on ANOVA, you are concluding that the yes. designation yes. doesn't influence the stress. Doesn't influence, the designation doesn't influence the level of stress. But actually, I, I have to, in, uh, it's a different test basically. Actually, I have to conclude that there is no difference in the level of stress with respect to the designation. So indirectly, I can conclude that designation is not influencing my level of stress. So in case, if you use this designation as a dummy variable in regression, even in that case also, you, you will not get any kind of influence. Okay. Yeah, same results only it's going to come in more regression also. More or less, more or less you will get the same results, even if you run regression. See, if the, so I just told you right, you can try gender. You can try gender. Suppose in case of your independent sample t-test, I'll try, I'll try gender also. See, analyze, just compare means, and then uh, independent sample t-test. So this is level of stress. And then the grouping variable, I'll just consider gender as a grouping variable. Define groups, it's one and two continue, and then click OK. Uh, of course, the uh, T test, the T value, oh, one minute. Ah, significance, the T, T value, and this is the significance value. Okay, two sided. Suppose if I consider the uh, two tail test, so this is point, point 0.406 in this particular case so which is insignificant which is greater than 0 0.05 similarly what you can do is see if you actually run the regression oh, sorry i for that i have to code it so you can try actually so for gender uh, you can convert all the ones into uh, zeros or uh, you can keep ones as ones twos into zeros you convert all the twos into zeros and you up, you include that particular variable in the regression model and see whether uh, whether it is uh, significant or not, certainly uh, I do say that that it, it may not be significant. Okay. 
so that is that is another thing and uh, suppose if you want to know the interaction between two categorical variables on your continuous variable then you can go for two way anova uh, suppose uh, uh, say for example uh, i think in in the in the ppt i have given the example i'll just tell you the same example so you have some salesman in your company and you're just grouping those salesmen into different groups four groups and at the same time you want to know uh, whether the different uh, salesmen in different groups, whether their uh, level of sales uh, different is different or the same. At the same time, you want to know whether uh, the sales is different in different seasons. So in this case, what you can do is, uh, I'll just show you that example one minute. Just stop here, stop this and I'll show you the PPT. Ah, this two way. So see here, I have just given an example. So you have different. I just given this as a simple problem for generally we do give it for the PG students. Uh, so here I am just considering A as one particular group of salesmen, B another C D. Okay. So in this particular case, so you can actually find out whether the sales of the salesman significant, the performance of the salesman differ significantly or not. Okay, based on their groups and similarly whether. The power, whether the sales is different during different season and com, uh, of course you, you want if you want you can see the combined effect also whether the salesman uh, performance is uh, same or different in different seasons as well so based on the groups as well as based on the seasons sometimes uh, you want to find out whether it is different or significant sometimes two independent variables together it may have an interaction with the dependent variable okay so we'll just uh, try that also. Just show you. Right. Just a moment. Yeah. Could you see the SPSS window now? Yes. So uh, you just go to analyze. Yeah. Yes, just analyze and uh, actually in case of two way ANOVA, you don't have any option here. You just click, it's a linear model. Uh, just click general linear model, click univariate. And here, what you have to do is you have to click the dependent variable in the dependent variable option. And instead of one particular variable, you can click, suppose if I want to uh, know whether Marital status and uh, gender, not gender is two variable, right? So, of course, uh, if you have more than two variables, you can check. So, maybe experience and designation or uh, age. Let us consider age and uh, experience, whether age and experience is influencing your level of stress or not, which means that whether the level of stress uh, differs with respect to both age and experience or not. Okay. So in this case, instead of one, you can, you are just giving two factors, two uh, categorical variables, which means similarly in case of your regression analysis, if you have more than one uh, independent variable, then you do get a uh, combined effect as well as the individual effect. Similarly, even in this particular case also, you do get an individual effect as well as the combined effect. You just see uh, this particular result. Uh, so here, in this particular case, age, of course, this zero, the significance value is 0 0.403 and experience is 0 0.223 and the age and this is, see, this is the influence of age on level of stress, the influence on experience on level of stress, this is the influence of age and experience combined together. It's a combined influence of age and experience on the level of stress. So it can be interpreted in a different way also. So uh, the level of stress of the respondents uh, is actually not different with respect to different age groups. At the okay, so in that way you are not you can state your null hypothesis, but you can reject a null hypothesis because in case the significance value is less than 0 0.05, which means that the level of stress of different respondents differ with respect to different age groups because it is significant. You are rejecting the null hypothesis and finally you are concluding that. 
age is having the age is having some kind of influence towards the level of stress but you just see experience whereas in case of experience it is 0.223 okay so which is insignificant so you cannot reject the null hypothesis what is the null hypothesis here here the null hypothesis is that uh, uh, your level of stress does not uh, uh, change with respect to it's it's not different with respect to the people who are having different years of experience so in this case uh, you can actually conclude that experience has no influence on your level of stress but the age and experience combined together there is a combined effect but actually if you consider the level of significance as 5 percentage then you have to you you cannot reject the null hypothesis so there is no combined effect of age and experience on the level of stress but if you uh, set your level of significance as 10 percentage you can reject your null hypothesis and you can conclude that the combined effect is having an influence on the level of experience so this is how uh, this is a two way analysis of variance which you can do is see how you can do is analyze and uh, general linear model univariate and you have to consider one as a dependent variable and two categorical variables as the fixed factors which you are using in order to uh, calculate the two way yes uh, is it okay shall i proceed I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's, it's about five. Shall I proceed or uh, should I stop here? Shall we conclude? I'll just show you uh, how to run the analysis in Gritel and then I conclude. And, and I'll show you how to run uh, this analysis of covariance also. So same, it's uh, analysis and then uh, uh, same, the general linear model, univariate, and here you have a covariate. See, in case, if you have if you have one continuous variable if you have a continuous dependent variable and if you have a categorical independent variable and apart from that like partial correlation if you want to have a continuous a continuous control variable then you can run analysis of covariate so let me consider a continuous covariate as a coping strategy okay so i am just considering this coping strategy as a control variable Okay, so I just don't want uh, uh, to have the effect of the coping strategies to pull down the level of stress. So I'm just controlling the coping strategies and want to find out whether age is having any kind of influence on the level of stress. So then I just want to see that. So in this particular case, after controlling the effect of coping up strategies, if I see that age is not having any influence on the level of stress. So this is with respect to one way analysis of variance. Similarly, you can have two way analysis of variance also in case if you have two uh, same gen, uh, general linear model univariate if you have one more uh, variable see uh, analysis of covariance this analysis this analysis of covariance analysis of covariance is nothing but it's a blunted model of your uh, anova and regression okay so you just remember the condition if you have a continuous dependent variable and if you if you want to find out the influence of a categorical independent variable on the continuous dependent variable controlling the effect of a continuous covariate covariate must be a continuous variable it should not be a categorical variable in that case you can actually use the analysis of uh, covariance okay so if you have one independent categorical variable then it is one way analysis of covariance if you have two suppose if i have this and gender if i have two categorical uh, independent variables and i can have one uh, covariate then i can conclude this as a two way analysis of covariance of course it will show that analysis of variance only but still i am just including the covariate option in the analysis of variance option so i do uh, get this and i uh, just find out of course there is no significance in case of even after controlling uh, the covariate which is coping up strategies age is not having any influence on so in this case it is 0.881 age is not having any influence on the level of stress similarly the combined effect of age gender is all uh, yeah gender is also not having any influence and the combined effect of age and uh, gender is also not having any influence on age and gender i'll just uh, uh, with this i'll just uh, stop this one and uh, i'll show you uh, how to run the analysis in gretel uh, quickly in another five minutes and we'll just wind it up
Oh, um, I'm so, one minute. I think sometimes in Grital your data may not be uh, opening. So this is a new Excel sheet. I think uh, you just save it in uh, Excel 2003 or uh, something of that kind, and you can then only you can import it. I think uh, just just stay for two minutes. I'll just save it. Just file save as your Excel file itself. You just save it. Uh, The old Excel format. I don't know. Uh, mine is an old Grital version. So if you have new Grital version, I I think it will work. Otherwise, uh, you just save it in Excel 97 2003 and use that particular uh, uh, file for uploading it in Grital. Okay, fine. So is this Grital? Okay, just open Grital. I'll just share Grital file to you. So, do you see the file opening? Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. So now just click file, click file, open data, and here you have an import option. Just import, click import again. You will get a drop down menu. You click Excel in that. Open, just uh, open the command is file open uh, then import in the next drop down menu and then you click excel click excel and you have to give the option so my excel sheet is in the desktop uh, final data and then i'll just open this and the sheet uh, i have given a secondary data sheet okay so you just click secondary data and uh, click okay just click okay and of course, sometimes uh, uh, instead of 1 and 19, you can give the uh, year 2006, 7, 8 in case if it is a time series data. Uh, actually, the number of data points are very less in when uh, you just, it will ask for cross section. Then again, click S, open data. You will get this window, just click S, you just click time series data. If it is a time series data, click time series data. If it is a cross sectional data, you just click. Otherwise, sometimes you will get panel data. It may be a combination of time series and panel data. So while arranging in an Excel sheet, you have to arrange it in, in such a way. You have to give the panel coding also. See, for example, if you have 20 years data for 10 companies. So first uh, 20 years data of the first company you have to give, then 20 years data of the second company you have to give. In a separate column, for the first company, you have to code all one. For the 20 years, you have to give the code as one. Then uh, for the second company, you have to give Code two for all the 20 years. So similarly, you have to give the panel code. Um, so uh, then forward, uh, just click annual. This is just an annual data. Click annual. And then again, click forward. Uh, here, if, if you want, you can give from 2010 to 20 or whatever it is. Just click forward and apply. Apply. Okay, so here I have given it wrongly, I think. Oh my God, I have given from 2010. You just give it from 2000. Uh, should I show it again? Should I show it again or shall I proceed? Participants? Is it okay? Have we got the data? I think ma'am, you can proceed ma'am. I think I can proceed, right? Okay, fine. So. After importing, so you will get like this. If, if you open, you will get GDP. So actually the year I have, uh, by mistake, I have just clicked 2010, you just click 2000. Uh, otherwise it's not necessary. You can click one, two, three also, no problem. Okay, so that doesn't matter. So here what I do is, uh, if, I, if you want to run regression, the command is that, just click model. Click model. Okay, then just click ordinary least squares. Click model, click ordinary least squares. And here you will be having uh, option for dependent variable and independent variable. So I'll just consider this first variable as my dependent variable, INV, which is investment as the dependent variable and the other variables as independent variables. Maybe I'll just take only two variables, GDP and exchange rate as my uh, independent variable. Okay. So here, if you want, you can give lags also. 
so you can give lakhs for gdp you can give lakh for real effective exchanges which means that which means that suppose if i thousand data of investment then uh, the corresponding data of gdp will not be 2001 it will be of 2000 okay so for 2001 investment i'm i'll just consider 2000 gdp so if you want to use a lag data suppose if you do not want it's not an issue so it, it's up to you it's up to the researcher to determine uh, to finalize it so i'm not going to give that you just click okay here you just click okay and the same data you can use and run regression in spss or even in excel also you just see the coefficients and the t test value t value everything will be the same okay so this is nothing but this coefficient is a beta value the first column the coefficient is a beta value this is your standard error t statistics and p value you are getting so in this particular case gdp is significantly influencing the investment overall investment okay so which is 3.30 e minus 08 which means that before this 3 you must have my uh, eight zeros which is 0.0000 Okay, here real effective exchange rate is not influencing investments, but GDP is influencing investment. So you will have your R square. The R square value is very high, which is point A. It's not that high, especially it's a secondary data. Certainly, we do expect it is more than point um, nine, but it is point eight seven. Nothing bad. Okay, so you can improve the model by including few more variables as well. Now, see if you want to test. any of the conditions you can test it just here in the output window you have test and uh, you can check for the normality of residuals heterosedasticity and autocorrelation also collinearity you can check see you will get the collinearity statistics as well okay so here the collinearity value in case of gdp is 1.1 and real effective exchange rate is 1.26 you get only the wif value here but actually there is no collinearity in this case because see here the range has been given okay uh, uh, if it is the value the collinearity values which is greater than 10 then it indicates that there is an existence of multi collinearity between these two variables in this case it is close to 1 in both the case it is close to 1 so there is no collinearity problem okay so this is for checking multi collinearity and even in the test you will get many more options See heterosedasticity. I'll just use White's test for, or uh, BP test for any any test for heterosedasticity. I'll just use White's test for heterosedasticity. Okay. I'll just close this. Even here, you will get the heterosedasticity test. So you just see uh, the null hypothesis says that heterosedasticity is not present. Okay. See the condition is that. there should not be heterosedasticity in case if you reject the null hypothesis it means that there is heterosedasticity problem okay so uh, the equality of uh, the variance assumption has been violated so it should not be violated so here see the p value is 0.10 which is not significant if it is not significant then you cannot reject the null hypothesis of heterosedasticity not present that is what i want actually if i want a perfect model there should not be any heterosedasticity so whatever test i am running for heterosedasticity that should be insignificant that is what which i require in order to proceed with the model so this is perfect there is no heterosedasticity problem because the p value of the heterosedasticity test which i um, actually showed here is insignificant which is greater than this is the probability value which is greater than 0.05 okay so i cannot reject the null hypothesis so i can conclude that there is no heterosedasticity which is present in this particular model fine now if you want to test autocorrelation you can test autocorrelation just click test you can test autocorrelation if you want you can go for first order autocorrelation or second order or third order you can check so i'll just check only first order autocorrelation in this case Okay, I'll just close this box here. After the uh, below the results, you will get the autocorrelation results. So I have a very high autocorrelation because the null hypothesis says that there is no autocorrelation, but the test statistics of this autocorrelation test shows it is highly significant. So I have to reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation, which means that there is autocorrelation which is present in the model. So I cannot use the model as such. So how to rectify this so i can rectify this by including the lag of the dependent variable as one of the independent variable in my model 
Okay, so that uh, there is no scope for here for discussion, but still that's, that is one remedy which you can do. Then you can check for the normality of residuals also, whether the residuals, residuals are normally distributed. Yes, of course, it is normally distributed. So you just check the residual test. Again, below that you will get the residual test. So it is insignificant. So the null hypothesis of this residual test states that error is normally distributed. See, in case of heterostatasticity, autocorrelation, and this normality test, actually your objective is not to reject the null hypothesis because in all the tests, your null hypothesis says that there is no heterostatasticity, there is no autocorrelation, and error is normally distributed. In almost all these three tests, what you have to do is you have to see whether whether it is insignificant, whether the test statistics is insignificant. If it is insignificant, then you are safe. There is no problem in uh, actually transforming your variables. Otherwise, if it is significant, if these three tests, heterostatasticity, autocorrelation, and normality tests, if it is significant, then you have a problem. Okay, so it is other way around, especially in case of this residual test. Uh, so I'll just stop here. Somebody asked for uh, this uh, causality test, right? And uh, I'll just show you causality test. You just go to model, uh, click time series. In time series, uh, you have this vector auto regression, right? You just click this vector auto regression. And if you have two variables, then it is similar to Gran Granger's causality test. If you have more than two variables, then you cannot use this Granger's causality test. You, you have to go for this vector auto. It, it will become a vector. Okay. So I have only two variables here. So I can consider this as I don't, I don't know which one is influencing the other variable. So I have to consider both as a dependent variable, which is my endogenous variable. And in this particular case, uh, yeah, lag, I'm just giving first lag because I am just considering investment is influenced by the lag of investment and the lag of GDP. Similarly, GDP is influenced by the lag of GDP and the lag of investment. So I'm just giving first lag. Just click OK. If you want to include a constant, actually, in Granus causality, we just don't include the constant. Just click OK. OK, see, see the results. The first equation consider, considers investment as a dependent variable, whereas you have second equation, the second equation considers GDP as a dependent variable. See, in the first variable where you consider investment as a dependent variable, you have to check whether GDP is significant or not. But at 5% level, it is not significant, but at 10% level, it is significant. So there is a slight uh, influence of GDP on your investment. Okay. But in this particular case, you just check whether GDP is influenced by investment. So it is totally insignificant. So there is, there is no... So suppose if you consider 5% as a level of significant, then both are independent. There's no causal effect between both. Otherwise, if you consider 10% as your level of significance, then you can say that there is a unidirectional causality from GDP to investment. So GDP has the power of attracting investment, but in, uh, GDP is not actually influenced by investment. So this is how you have to uh, control. So with this, I stop. I think it, it's too heavy for you. <laughs> Sorry. So any questions? Uh, please, otherwise we'll just wind up. It's too. Big. I'm so sorry for it. Yeah, I thank sorry, you. I much. couldn't finish that yesterday. It's, uh, it's all combined together because you need a separate session for correlation and regression. It's all correlation, regression, and ANOVA covariance. Everything we put together. So. so useful, madam. Yes. I have just one question. Yes, please. You are talking about assumption for regression. You were talking yes. about a continuous uh, scale or interval. Yes. But while giving the example, you gave the example of categorical independent variable of uh, gender and designation. That Are is it... for ANOVA. That is for ANOVA. Not for uh, regression, madam. Uh, regression. Regression that can be used, but not in the actual simple or multiple regression. That is a separate regression you have to run, which is called, if you include this categorical variable, you can include it in dummy form only. So it's we are not violating regression. the assumption then. Sorry? Then we will not be violating the assumption. See, actually, of course, in the model assumptions, generally you do check in residuals only, not in the variables. 
not in the variable see actually the assumption is not it, it see in in case of simple and multiple regression you have to actually consider only the continuous variable suppose if you want to include any categorical variable in the model see this regression model is very very flexible uh, there are many model any hybrid model this dummy variable regression is one type of regression similarly you have another type of regression which is general generalized linear regression model you do have and weighted linear regression model you do have and you have uh, uh, gauss model arch model n number of models are there but in simple and uh, multiple regression models generally we don't include categorical variables suppose if you include it then it is a dummy variable regression you can run thank yes. you madam yes anything else ma'am can you once again uh, explain the ancova ma'am just the definition sorry sorry ancova ma'am ancova just the definition ancova uh, analysis of covariance see uh, in partial correlation i just told you that uh, if you want to find out the relationship between uh, two variables controlling the effect of some other variable if you want to take away the effect of some other i just told, give you this uh, three friends example right so you want to know the influence of the attitude of mr b on mr a by controlling the attitude of mr c so taking away the effect if there is no influence of Mr. C, then to what extent Mr. B is influencing, capable of influencing Mr. A? Suppose if that is your objective, then you go for a partial uh, correlation. But in case if you have, in, in that case, all the variables must be a continuous variable. Suppose if you have in this in a situation, if you have a continuous variable, a continuous dependent variable, and if you have a categorical independent variable, and a covariate at the control if the control variable is a continuous variable in that situation you can run the analysis of covariance thank you ma'am thank you so much yes anything else ma'am can i ask you one thing just yes. now i have started to learn econometrics can you give some suggestions to learn how to to make it see, easier uh, to, to start with the uh, damodar gujarati is the best book uh, yeah damodar gujarati yeah, you can actually uh, proceed with Woolrich. Even I am not an expert in econometrics. I have just applied few basic econometric techniques for my research. So, uh, uh, of course, a uh, lot of lot many econometricians are there. Uh, you can attend. See, actually, a few institutes they do conduct very good econometric sessions. Um, I think uh, I am uh, coding code. They do generally conduct a uh, few econometric sessions. And a few sessions were very useful. I, when I was doing my research in University of Madras, I have attended nearly um, two programs there. And Madras School of Economics also they do conduct uh, econometrics program. Uh, they invite generally Professor Jaya Krishna Kumar from University of Geneva. Extremely uh, good. Her sessions were extremely good. Really, um, she's very very knowledgeable and expert intellect. Uh, I do say that. So those sessions will be very useful. But uh, before attending her sessions, actually, first uh, you must know the basics of econometrics. Otherwise, uh, it will be above your heads. So uh, you please uh, start with the uh, Gujarati. That will give you a lot of insights. And uh, one more book that is uh, examples of uh, econometrics, same by Gujarati. And uh, you have Ulrich uh, uh, Chris Brooks is the best book, actually econometrics by Chris Brooks. Uh, even that you can uh, refer. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a, a doubt in your basic paper. So, yes. if I time permits, uh, I will contact you personally. Yes, to get you can contact me personally. And that, uh, this is not the forum for uh, discussing. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. If participants have any further queries, you can ask or else we could come to. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your time today. Time. Thank you all for patient listening. Let's uh, be sorry. And ma'am, from the part of participants, I am very sure that they have benefited from this session. You have enriched with your knowledge. And thank you for providing your time. On behalf of course director and course director, I want to thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And participants, please uh, fill the feedback form given in the chat box. And also uh, for tomorrow's session, for tomorrow's daughter modeling session, um, a prerequisite readings have been uploaded in the Google Drive. Earlier it was also sent through email. You are requested to go through that article before attending tomorrow's session. Sarah has requested you to read those things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. See you. Bye.